Audiobook title, Matt, 038, 000-91, by Matt Chu 07 Part 03. This work belongs to author, Matt Chu 07. Source, Wattpad.com. The Spartans heard what sounded like someone humming and turned to discover that another machine had approached them from behind. Where the other newcomers were cylindrical in design, with angular, wing-like cowlings, this construct was rounded, almost spherical. It had a single, glowing blue eye, a wraparound housing, and a cheerfully business-like manner. Greetings I am the monitor of installation 04. I am 343 Guilty Spark. Someone has released the flood. My function is to prevent it from leaving this installation. I require your assistance. Come this way. The voice sounded artificial. This 343 Guilty Spark was some kind of artificial construct, the Spartans realized. From above the little machine, Matt could see Fohammer's pelican moving into position. Monitor. Crystal inquired. What's a monitor? Hold on, the chief replied, trying to sound friendly. The flood. Those things down there are called flood. Of course. 343 Guilty Spark replied a note of confusion in its synthesized voice. What an odd question. We have no time for this, reclaimers. Reclaimer. Matt wondered. He was about to ask what the little machine meant by that, but his words never came. Rings of pulsating gold light traveled the length of his body. He felt lightheaded and saw an explosion of white light. Author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen. Have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 47 The Library Author's note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again, I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 47 The Library Location Unknown Location on Halo D635948 Spartanii Blue Team Mission Clock Matt felt himself rush back together like a puzzle with a million pieces, wondered what had happened, and where he was. He felt disoriented, nauseated, and angry. A quick look around was sufficient to ascertain that the machine named 343 Guilty Spark had somehow transported the Spartans from the swamp into the bowels of a dark, brooding structure. Matt saw the machine hovering high above, glowing a thin, ghostly blue. The Spartans raised their assault weapons, and each fired half a clip into it. The bullets were dead on but had no effect other than to elicit a bemused response. That was unnecessary, reclaimers. I suggest that you conserve your ammunition for the effort ahead. No less angry, but with little choice but to accept the situation, the chief looked around. So where are we? The installation was specifically built to study and contain the flood, the machine answered patiently. Their survival as a race was dependent on it. I am grateful to see that some of them survived to reproduce. Survived. Reproduce. What the hell are you talking about? Matt demanded. We must collect the index, Spark said, leaving the Spartans' questions unanswered. And time is of the essence. Please follow me. The blue light zipped away at that point, forcing the Spartans to follow or be left behind. Matt checked both his weapons as they walked. Speaking of you, who the hell are you? Crystal inquired, and what's your function? I am 343 Guilty Spark, the machine said, pedantically. I am the monitor, or more precisely, a self-repairing artificial intelligence charged with maintaining and operating this facility. But you are the reclaimers, so you know that already. Matt didn't know anything of the kind, but it seemed wise to play along, so he did. Yes, well, refresh our memory. How long has it been since you were left in charge? Exactly 101,217 local years, the monitor replied cheerfully, many of which were quite boring. But not anymore he, he, he. The Spartans were taken aback by the sudden giggle from the small machine. Matt knew that the AIs humans used could, over time, develop personalities politely described as quirky. 343 Guilty Spark had been here for tens of thousands of years. It was quite possible that the little AI was insane. The monitor chattered on, nattering about affecting repairs to Substation 9 and other non-sequiturs. His dialogue was interrupted as a variety of flood forms bounced, waddled, and leaped out of the surrounding darkness. Suddenly the Spartans were fighting for their lives again, moving back and forth to stretch the enemy out, blasting anything that moved. That was when they first identified a new flood form. They were large misshapen things that would explode when fired upon, spewing up to a dozen infection forms in every direction thereby multiplying the number of targets that the shooter had to track and kill. 
Finally, like water turned off at a tap, the assault came to an end, and the Spartans had a chance to reload their weapons. The monitor hovered nearby, all the while humming to himself, and occasionally giggling. There's no time to dawdle we have work to do. What kind of work? The chief inquired as he stuffed the final shell into the shotgun and the Spartans hurried to follow. This is the library, the machine explained, hovering so the human could catch up. The energy field above us contains the index. We must get up there. Matt was about to ask, index? What index? When a combat form lurched out of an alcove and opened fire. Matt fired in return, saw the creature fall, and saw it jump back up again. The next burst took the flood's left leg off. That should slow you down, he said as he turned to deal with a new horde of shambling, leaping hostiles. A steady stream of brass arced away from Matt's assault weapon as he and the chief worked the mob over. Matt felt something strike him from behind and spun around to discover that the onal-egged combat form had limped back into the fight. The Spartan blew the creature's head off this time, sidestepped to evade a charging carrier form, and shot the bulbous monster in the back. There was an explosion of green mist mixed with balloon-like infection forms and pieces of wet flesh. The next ten seconds were spent popping pods. After that, the monitor took off again and the non-com had little choice but to follow. They soon arrived in front of a huge metal door. Built to contain the flood perhaps. Maybe, but far from effective, since the slimy bastard seemed to be leaking out of every nook and cranny. The monitor hovered over the two humans' head. The security doors are locked automatically. I will go access the override to open them. I am a genius, the monitor said matter-of-factly. He, he, he. A pain in the ass is more like it, the master chief said to no one in particular as a red dot appeared on his motion sensor, quickly joined by a half dozen more. Then, as part of what would become a familiar pattern, combat forms leaped 15 meters through the air, only to shrivel as the 7.62 millimeter slugs tore them apart. Carrier forms waddled up like old friends came apart like wet cardboard and spewed pods in every direction. Infection forms danced on delicate legs, dodging this way and that, each hoping to claim the human as its very own. But the Spartans had other ideas. They killed the last of them just as the double doors started to part, and followed the monitor though. Please follow closely. 343 Guilty Spark admonished. This portal is the first of ten. Matt replied as they followed the AI past a row of huge blue screens. More doors. I can hardly wait. 343 Guilty Spark appeared immune to sarcasm as it babbled about the first-class research facilities that surrounded them, and blithely led its human companions into still another ambush. And so it went, as the Spartans worked their way through flood-infested galleries, subfloor maintenance tunnels, and more galleries, before rounding a corner to confront yet another group of monstrosities. The Spartans had helped this time, as a dozen of the hunter-killer machines they'd seen in the swamp appeared in the air above the scene, and attacked the flood forms congregated below. These sentinels will assist you, reclaimers, the monitor trilled. Lasers hissed and sizzled as the hovering machines struck their opponents down, and having done so, moved in to sterilize what remained. The Spartans watched in fascination as the machines took care of the heavy lifting. The Spartans lent a helping hand when that seemed appropriate, and started to gag when the air that came through their filters grew thick with the stench of cooked flesh. As the Spartans fought their way through the facility, the monitor, who floated above it all, offered commentary. These sentinels will supplement your combat systems, but I suggest you upgrade to at least a class 12 combat skin. Your current models only scan as a class 2, which is unsuited for this kind of work. If there's a battle suit six times as powerful as Mjolnir armor, Matt thought, I'll be first in line to try it on. Matt jumped to avoid an attack from one of the flood combat forms, pressed the shotgun muzzle into its back, and blew a foot-wide hole through the creature. Finally, after the hard-working sentinels had reduced the flood to little more than a lumpy paste, the Spartans made their way through the carnage and out onto a circular platform. It was enormous, easily large enough to handle a scorpion, and in reasonably good repair. Machinery hummed, bands of white light pulsated down from somewhere above, and the lift carried the human upward. Maybe things would be better up above, maybe the flood hadn't reached that level yet, he thought. Matt didn't hold out much hope, however. So far, nothing else had gone right on this mission. The lift jerked to a halt. The Spartans made their way through a narrow passageway into the gallery beyond. The flood attacked immediately, but with no threat at their back, the two Spartans were free to retreat into the corridor from which they had just come, which forced the mob of monstrosities to come at him through the same narrow channel. 
Before long, the bodies of the fallen flood began to accumulate. Matt paused, waiting for another wave of attackers, then shoved aside a pile of the dead and moved into the next section of the complex. They gave under his feet, made gurgling sounds, and vented foul-smelling gas. Matt was grateful when his boots were back on solid ground again. The sentinels reappeared shortly thereafter and led the Spartans past a row of huge blue screens. So, where were you bastards a few minutes ago? The chief inquired. But if the machines heard him, they made no reply as they glided, circled, and bobbed through the hallway ahead. Flood activity has caused a failure in a drone control system. I must reset the backup units, 343 Guilty Spark said. Please continue on. I will rejoin you when I have completed my task. The monitor had left him on his own before, and each absence coincided with a fresh wave of flood attackers. Hold on, Matt protested, let's discuss this, but it was too late. 343 Guilty Spark had already darted through an aperture in the wall and disappeared down some kind of travel conduit. Sure enough, no sooner had the monitor left than a lumpy-looking carrier form waddled out into the light, spotted its prey, and hurried to greet it. The Spartans shot the flood form, but let the Sentinels clean up the resulting mess, while they conserved their ammo. A fresh onslaught of flood came out of the woodwork, and the Spartans adopted a more cautious strategy they allowed the sentry machines to mop them up. At first, the defense machines mowed through a wave of the pod-like infection forms with little difficulty. Then more of the hostiles appeared, then more, then still more. Soon, the Spartans were forced to fall back. Matt crushed one of the pods with his foot, smashed another out of the air with the butt of his assault rifle, and killed a dozen more with a trio of quick AR bursts. The monitor drifted back into the chamber, spun as if surveying the carnage and made an odd, metallic clicking that sounded very much like a cluck of disapproval. The sentinels can use their weapons to manage the flood for a short time, reclaimers. Speed is of the essence. Then let's go, the master chief growled. The monitor made no reply but scooted ahead. The small construct led the Spartan deeper into the library's gloomy halls. They passed through a number of large open gates prior to arriving in front of one that was closed. Matt paused for a moment, expecting that 343 Guilty Spark might open it for them, but the monitor had disappeared. Again. The hell with it, Matt thought. The little machine was rapidly draining his reserves of patience. Determined to move ahead with or without the services of their on-again, off-again guide. The Spartans retraced their steps to the point where a steeply sloping ramp emerged from below, followed it downward, and soon found himself in a maintenance corridor packed with flood. But the narrow confines of the passageway again made it that much easier to kill the parasitic life forms. And five minutes later the human walked up a ramp on the other side of the metal door to find that the monitor was there, humming to himself. Oh, hello I'm a genius. Right. And I'm a vice admiral, Matt said dryly. The monitor darted ahead leading them across a circular depression to another enormous door. Machinery whirred, and the Spartans were forced to pause as the doors started to part. Then Matt heard a clank, followed by a groan, as the movement stopped. Please wait here, Spark said, and promptly vanished. Just as Matt pulled a fresh clip and rammed it home, dozens of red dots appeared on his threat indicator. He stood with his back to the door as what looked like a platoon of flood forms prepared to rush him. Rather than simply open up on them, and risk the possibility that they might roll them under, the chief threw a grenade into their midst, and half their opponents went up in a single blast. It took a few minutes plus a few hundred rounds of ammo to put the rest of them down, but the Spartans managed to do so. That was when the machinery restarted, the doors opened, and the monitor reappeared, humming to itself. I am a genius. They moved through the new chamber, a high, vaulted gallery, dimly lit with pools of gold-yellow light. For the first time since Spark had dragged them here, Matt had a moment of respite. Ever since entering the library, the Spartans' heads had been on a swivel. Wave after wave of hostile creatures had attacked them from all sides. Matt popped a stim pack, downed a nutrient supplement, and gathered up his weapon. Time to move out. As they proceeded deeper into the library, they found a corpse, a human one. The two Spartans stooped to examine the body. It wasn't pretty. The Marine's body was so mangled that even the flood couldn't make use of him. He lay at the center of a large blood stain wreathed by spent brass. Ah, 343 Guilty Spark said, peering down over the Spartan's shoulders. The other reclaimer. His combat skin proved even less suitable than yours. Matt looked up over his shoulder. What do you mean? Is this a test, reclaimer? The monitor seemed genuinely puzzled. I found him wandering through a structure on the other side of the ring, 
and brought him to the same point where you started. The Spartans looked down at the body and marveled at the fact that anyone could make it that far. Even with his physical augmentation and the advantages of his armor, Matt was reaching the end of his endurance. Matt checked, found the Leathernecks dog tags, and read the name. Mabuto, Marvin, Staff Sergeant, followed by a service number. The chief put the tags away. I didn't know you, Sarge, but I sure as hell wish I had. You must have been one hardest son of a bitch. Matt wholeheartedly approved of that statement. It wasn't much as eulogies go, but Matt hoped that, had Sergeant Marvin Mabuto been there to hear it, he would have approved. Author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen. Have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 48 Betrayed. Author's note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again, I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 48 Betrayed. Location the library. D653744, Spartanii Blue Team Mission Clock. The Spartans left Sergeant Mabuto's body behind and approached one of the large metal doors, pleased to see that it was open. They crouched and passed through. 343 Guilty Spark disappeared on one of his mysterious errands a few moments later, and, like clockwork, the flood came out to play. The Spartans were ready for them. The flood swept into the room, dozens of the bulbous infection forms scuttling along the walls and floor, with another half dozen of the combat forms in tow. They paused, as if in confusion. One of the combat forms looked up, and Matt dropped from the pillar he'd shimmied up. His metal boots pulped the creature's face. Assault rifle fire raked the leading edge of the cluster of infection forms. The pods detonated in a chain reaction string. That got their attention, he thought. Matt turned and ran. He jumped up onto a raised platform as he fought, disengaged, and fought again. Finally, as the last body fell, both the monitor and the sentinels reappeared. The two Spartans looked at them in disgust as the duo reloaded their weapons, scrounged ammo off the flood combat forms, and followed 343 Guilty Spark out onto a lift that was identical to the last one he'd been on. The platform carried the humans and the AI up to a still higher level, where they got off, paused to let the sentinels soften up the flood welcome wagon that waited out in the hall, then emerged to lend a hand. There was a loud boom as one of the combat forms leaped from an archway and landed right on top of a sentinel. Its whip tendril flailed at the hovering machine's back and was rewarded with a series of sparks and a gout of flame. A moment later, the sentinel exploded, and the flood and the wrecked drone crashed into the floor in a ball of flesh, bone, and metal. The resulting shower of shrapnel cut three flood forms down and wounded a score of others. Matt took another out with a burst from his assault weapon and the sentinels moved in to fry the remains. Once that contingent of creatures had been dealt with, the Spartans followed the monitor down a hall lined with blue screens, through an area that was infested with flood, and out onto a lift that looked different from the last one they'd been on. Geometric patterns split the floor into puzzle-like shapes, a series of raised panels stood guard around a column of translucent blue light, and the whole thing seemed to glow. The Spartans stepped on board, felt a slight jerk as ancient machinery reacted to his presence, and saw the walls start to rise. Matt realized they were headed down this time, and hoped that their journey was near an end. Without hesitation, Matt slammed fresh ammo into his weapon. It seemed as if they emerged into a huge cluster of flood every time he traveled on a lift. The lift made hollow, rumbling sounds, fell a long way and stopped with a reverberating thud. 343 Guilty Spark hovered over their shoulders as the Spartan stepped off the lift and approached a pedestal. You may now retrieve the index, the monitor said. The artifact glowed lime green, it was shaped like the letter T. It slowly rose from the top of the cylindrical tube in which it had been kept for so many millennia. A series of metal blocks that encircled the device rotated and spun, releasing their protective grip on the index. The chief took hold of the device and pulled it up and out of its tubular sheath. He held it up to examine the glowing artifact, and was startled when a gray beam lanced from Spark. The index was yanked from his hand and disappeared inside a storage chamber in the monitor's body. What the hell are you doing? Crystal demanded. As you know, reclaimers, Spark said, as if addressing an errant child, protocol requires that I take possession of the index for transport. 343 guilty Spark swooped and dived, then floated in place. Your biological form renders you vulnerable to infection. The index must not fall into the hands of the flood before we reach the control room and activate the installation. 
The flood is spreading, we must hurry. Matt was about to reply when he saw the bands of pulsating light flowing down around his body, knew he was about to be teleported, and again felt lightheaded. The Spartans rematerialized back on the walkway which seemed to float over the black abyss below, the control room. Matt saw the replica of Halo which arched above, the globe that floated at the center of the walkway, and the control panel where they had last seen Cortana. Was she still there? 343 Guilty Spark hovered above their heads. Is something wrong? No, nothing, the chief replied. No, Matt answered. Splendid. Shall we? The Spartans made their way forward. The control board was long and curved at either end. An endless light show played across the surface of the panel as various aspects of the ring world's extremely complicated electronic and mechanical machinery fed a constant flow of data to the display, all of which appeared as a mosaic of constantly morphing glyphs and symbols. Here, if one knew how to read it, were the equivalents of the ring world's pulse, respiration, and brain waves. Reports that provided information on the rate of spin, the atmosphere, the weather, the highly complex biosphere, the machinery that kept all of it running, plus the activities of the creatures around whom the world had been formed the flood. It was awesome to look at, and even more awesome to consider. 343 Guilty Spark hovered above the control panel and looked down on the humans who stood in front of him. There was something supercilious about the tone of the construct's voice. My role in this particular endeavor has come to an end. The protocol does not allow units from my classification to perform a task as important as the reunification of the index with the core. The monitor zipped around to hover at the Spartan's side. That final step is reserved for you, reclaimers. Why do you keep calling us that? Matt asked. Spark kept silent. Matt looked at the chief and shrugged. The chief accepted the index and gazed at the panel in front of them. One likely looking slot pulsed the same glowing green that shone from the index. He slid it home. The shaped device fit perfectly. The control panel shivered as if stabbed, the displays flared as if in response to an overload, and an electronic groan was heard. 343 Guilty Spark tilted slightly as if to look at the control board. That wasn't supposed to happen, Spark chirped. There was a sudden shimmer of light as Cortana's holographic figure appeared and continued to grow until she towered over the control panel. Her eyes were bright pink, data scrolled across her body, and the mat knew she was pissed. Oh, really? She said. She gestured, and the monitor fell out of the air and hit the deck with a clank. The chief looked up at her. Cortana, the AI stood with hands on hips. I spent hours cooped in here watching you two today about helping that thing get set to slit our throats. Matt turned toward the monitor and back. Hold on now. He's a friend. Cortana brought a hand up to her mouth in mock surprise. Oh, I didn't realize. He's your pal, is he? Your chum. Do you have any idea what that bastard almost made you two do? Yes, Matt said patiently. Activate Halo's defenses and destroy the flood. Which is why we brought the index to the control center. Cortana's image plucked the index out of its slot and held it out in front of her. You mean this? Now reanimated, 343 Guilty Spark hovered just off the floor. He was furious. A construct in the core. That is absolutely unacceptable. Cortana's eyes glowed as she bent forward. Piss off. The monitor darted higher. What impertinence I shall purge you at once. You sure that's a good idea? Cortana inquired as she waved the index, then added the data contained within it to her memory. How dare you Spark exclaimed. I'll do what? Cortana demanded. I have the index. You can float and sputter. The master chief held both hands up. One held the assault rifle. Enough the flood is spreading. If we activate Halo's defenses we can wipe them out. Cortana looked down on the humans with an expression of pity. You two have no idea how this ring works, do you? Why the Forerunners built it. She leaned forward, her face grim. Halo doesn't kill Flood, it kills their food. Human, Covenant, whatever. You're all equally edible. The only way to stop the Flood is to starve them to death. And that's exactly what Halo is designed to do. Wipe the galaxy clean of all sentient life. You don't believe me. The AI finished. Ask him and she pointed to 343 Guilty Spark. The ramifications of what Cortana said hit home, and Matt gripped his MA5B tightly. He rounded on the monitor. Is it true? Spark bobbed slightly. Of course, the construct said directly. Then, sounding more like his officious self again, this installation has a maximum effective radius of 25,000 light years, but once the others follow suit, this galaxy will be quite devoid of life, 
or at least any life with sufficient biomass to sustain the flood, the AI continued contritely. The little device sounded genuinely puzzled. But you already knew this. I mean, how couldn't you? Cortana glowered at the two Spartans. Left out that little detail, did he? We followed outbreak containment procedure to the letter, the monitor said defensively. You were with me each step of the way as we managed the process. Chief, Commander, Crystal interrupted, I'm picking up movement. Why would you hesitate to do what you've already done? 343 Guilty Spark demanded. We need to go, Cortana insisted. Right now. Last time you asked me if it were my choice, would I do it? The monitor continued, as a flock of sentinels arrayed themselves behind him. Having had considerable time to ponder your query, my answer has not changed. There is no choice. We must activate the ring. Get. Us. Out. Of. Here, Cortana said, her eyes tracking the sentinels. If you are unwilling to help, I will simply find another, Spark said conversationally. Still, I must have the index. Give your constructs to me or I will be forced to take it from you. The Spartans looked up at Spark and the machines arrayed in the air behind them. The assault weapon Matt had in his hands came up ready to fire. That's not going to happen, he said. So be it, the monitor said wearily. Then, in a comment directed to the Sentinels, he added save their heads. Dispose of the rest. Author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen. Have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 49 New Plan. Author's note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again, I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 49 New Plan. Location Halo Control Room. D680327, Spartanii Blue Team Mission Clock. The vast platform that extended out over the control room's black abyss felt small and confining as the two Spartans were attacked from every direction at once. Rubired energy beams sizzled, and the smell of ozone filled the air as the airborne sentinels circled, searching for a chink in his armor. All they needed was one good hit, a chance to put the Spartans down, and they would be able not only to take their heads but the index as well. There was no time to consider Cortana's mental state. There was still a mission to achieve protect Cortana and Crystal and keep Spark the hell away from the Index. For his part, Matt wove back and forth, conscious of the fact that the walkway had no rails, and how easy it would be to fall off the edge. That made hitting his targets a great deal more difficult. Still, he had seen the flood bring sentinels down, and figured that if the combat forms could do it, so could he. He decided to tackle the lowest machines first. Matt was careful to get a good lead on each target. The assault rifle stuttered, and the nearest target exploded. He switched to the shotgun and fired methodically. Matt pumped a new round into the chamber and fired again. Thanks to the broad pattern provided by each shell, the pump gun soon proved itself to be an extremely effective weapon against the sentinels. One of the machines exploded, another hit the deck with a loud clang, and a third trailed smoke as it spiraled into the darkness below. The battle became somewhat easier after that, as there was less and less incoming fire, and he was able to knock three more sentinels out of the air in quick succession. The Spartans started to move, reloading as they went. One especially persistent machine took advantage of the interlude to score three hits on Matt's back, which triggered the audible alarm and pushed his shield to the very edge. With only four shells in his weapon, Matt turned, blew the sentinel out of the air, and spun to nail another. Then, weapon raised, he turned in a circle, searching for more targets there weren't any. So, the chief said as he lowered the shotgun and pushed more shells into the receiver, don't tell us, let us guess. You have a plan. Yes, Cortana replied unabashedly, I do. We can't let the monitor activate Halo. We have to stop him, we have to destroy Halo. Matt nodded and flexed his stiff shoulders. And how do we do that? According to my analysis of the available data, I believe the best course of action is somewhat risky. Naturally, Matt thought. An explosion of sufficient size, Cortana explained, will help destabilize the ring, and will cut through a number of primary systems. We need to trigger a detonation on a large scale, however. A starship's fusion reactors going critical would do the job. I'm going to find out where the Pillar of Autumn went down, Crystal said. If the ship's fusion reactors are still relatively intact, we can use them to destroy Halo. Is that all? The chief inquired dryly. Sounds like a walk in the park. By the way, it's nice to have you back. 
It's nice to be back, Cortana said, and Matt knew she meant it. Their boots made a hollow sound as they approached the gigantic blast doors and hit the switch. They parted to reveal a battle in progress between a group of sentinels and Covenant ground troops. Red lasers split the air into jagged shapes as machines burned a jackal down. The contest was far from one side, however, as one of the machines exploded and showered the Covenant with bits of hot metal. The room was a long rectangular affair with a strangely corrugated floor. Standing at one end of the space, and well out of harm's way, the Spartans were content to watch and let the two groups whittle each other down. However, when the last sentinel crashed, leaving two elites still on their feet, the Matt knew they'd have to take them on. The Covenant spotted the humans, knew they'd have to come to them and stood waiting. The Spartans took advantage of what little bit of cover there was and made their way down the length of the room. With only half a clip of ammo left in his assault rifle, Matt had little choice but to tackle them with the shotgun, far from ideal at this range. The chief fired a couple of rounds just to get their attention, waited for the elites to charge, and lobbed a plasma grenade into the gap between them. The explosion killed one soldier and wounded the other. A single blast from Matt's shotgun was sufficient to finish the job. Striding through the carnage, Matt exchanged the assault weapon for a plasma rifle. From there it was a short journey through an empty room and out onto the top level of the pyramid. It was dark, and a fresh layer of snow had fallen since the time when the noncom had battled his way up to the control room from the valley below. There were guards, but all of them had their backs to the hatch and didn't bother to turn until the doors were half open. That was when they saw the humans, did a series of double takes and started to respond. But the Spartans were ready and Matt used the energy weapon to hose them down. The elites jerked and fell quickly followed by several jackals and grunts. Then, just as suddenly as the violence had started, it was over. Snow swirled around the sole figure who remained standing, began the long, painstaking job of covering each body with a shroud of white, and fostered an illusion of peace. Cortana took advantage of the momentary pause to update the Spartans regarding her plan. We need to buy some time in case the Monitor or his Sentinels find a way to activate Halo's final weapon without the Index. The machines in these canyons are Halo's primary firing mechanisms. They consist of three phase pulse generators that amplify Halo's signal and allow it to fire deep into space, Crystal continued. If we damage or destroy the generators, the monitor will need to repair them before Halo can be used. That should buy us some time. I'm marking the location of the nearest pulse generator with a NAV point. We need to move and neutralize the device. Roger that, the chief said as the Spartans made their way down the first ramp to the platform below. Once again the element of surprise worked in their favor. They killed two elites, caught a couple of jackals as they tried to run, and Matt nailed a grunt as it appeared from below. The wind whistled around the side of the pyramid. The Spartans left a trail of large bootprints as they made their way down to the point where the ramp met the next level walkway, crossed to the other side of the structure, and ran into a pair of elites as they hit the top of the up ramp and rounded the corner. There wasn't enough time to do anything but fire, and keep on firing, in an attempt to overwhelm the Covenant armor. It wouldn't have worked had the aliens been farther away, but the fact that the plasma pulses were pounding them in close made all the difference. The first elite made a horrible gurgling sound as he fell and the second got a shot off but lost half of his face. He brought his hands up to the hole, made a gruesome discovery, and was just about to scream when an energy bolt took his life. Then... As the Spartans prepared to descend into the valley below, Cortana said, Wait, we should commandeer a couple of those banshees. We'll need them to reach the pulse generator in time. Like many of the AI's suggestions, this was easier said than done, but Matt was in favor of speed and filed the possibility away. Now, as they came down off the pyramid, they saw lots of Covenant, but no flood, and felt a strange sense of relief. The Covenant were tough, but Matt understood them, and that lessened his apprehension. The alien plasma rifle lacked the precision offered by an M60 pistol or a sniper's rifle, but Matt did the best he could to pick off some of the Covenant below. Still, he had only nailed three of the aliens when his efforts attracted the attention of a wraith tank, along with more troops. There was nothing he could do except retreat back uphill. The wraith, which continued to hurl plasma mortars upslope, actually helped by preventing other Covenant forces from charging after them. That advantage wouldn't last long, though, which meant that they had to find some additional firepower, and find it fast. Even though there was no sign of the flood at the moment, some of their half-frozen bodies lay scattered about, suggesting that there had been a significant battle within the last couple of hours. 
The duo knew the flood carried weapons acquired from dead victims, so the Spartans ran from corpse to corpse, looking for what they required. For a while, it seemed hopeless as they uncovered a series of M60S, plasma pistols, combat knives, and other gear, anything and everything except what the duo needed most. Then, just when Matt had nearly given up hope, he saw a few centimeters of olive drab tubing protruding from under a dead combat form. He rolled the Exelite over and felt a rising sense of excitement. Was the launcher loaded? If so, he was in luck. A quick check revealed that the weapon was loaded, and as if to prove that luck comes in threes, Matt found additional ammunition only a few meters away. Armed with the launcher, he was ready to go to work. The Wraith represented the most significant threat, so he decided to deal with that first. It took time to make his way back across the face of the pyramid to a point where he could get a clear shot, but he did. The monster was dangerously close as he put a pair of rockets into the mortar tank and watched it explode. Matt ejected the spent rocket tubes, slammed fresh ammunition home, and shifted his aim. Two more rockets lanced ahead and detonated in clusters of Covenant soldiers. He fell back and slung the rocket launcher. He had a limited supply of rockets, and once they were gone, he had no choice but to go down onto the valley floor and finish the job the hard way. The duo crept up on the pair of elites who stood guard near a couple of banshees. They went down from deadly, spine-cracking blows and they stepped past their fallen corpses. Matt examined the banshees' controls while Crystal ensured the machine was fully operational. Matt boarded the aircraft and activated its power plant. He wondered why the aliens hadn't used the banshee against them, was thankful that they hadn't, and eyed the instrument panel. Matt recognized the very alien yet very familiar interface. The takeoff was rough, but it wasn't long before the banshee started to climb. It was dark, and snow continued to fall, which meant that visibility was poor. Matt kept a close eye on both the NAV point Crystal had projected onto his HUD and the instrument panel. The design was different, but an alien turn and bank indicator still looked like what it was and helped the human maintain his orientation. The banshee made good speed, and the valleys were quite close together. So it wasn't long before the Spartans spotted the wellet platform which jutted out from the face of the cliff, as well as the enemy fire which lashed up to greet the duo. The word was out, it seemed, and the Covenant didn't want any visitors. Rather than put down under fire, they decided to carry out a couple of strafing runs first. Matt swooped low and used the Banshee's plasma and fuel rod cannons to sweep the platform clear of sentries before decelerating for what he hoped would be an unopposed landing. The Banshees crunched into the platform, bounced once, then ground to a halt. The Spartans dismounted, passed through a hatch, and entered the tunnel beyond. We need to interrupt the pulse generator's energy stream, Cortana informed the Spartans. I have adjusted your shield system so that it will deliver an EMP burst and disrupt the generator, but you'll have to walk into the beam to trigger it. I'm doing the same for you, Commander, Crystal said. The Spartans paused just shy of the next hatch. We'll have to do what? Matt asked incredulously. You'll have to walk into the beam to trigger it, the crystal repeated matter-of-factly. The EMP blast should neutralize the generator. Should, the chief demanded. Whose side are you two on? Yours, Cortana replied firmly. We're all in this together, remember? Yeah, I remember, Matt growled. But you're not the one with the bruises. The AIs chose to remain silent as the Spartans passed through a hatch, paused to see if anyone would attempt to cancel their ticket and followed the NAV indicator to the chamber located at the center of the room. Once they were there the pulse generator was impossible to miss. It was so intensely white that Matt's visor automatically darkened in order to protect his eyes. Not only that, but he could feel the air crackle around them as they approached the delta-shaped guide structures and prepared to step in between them. We have to walk into that thing. The chief inquired doubtfully. You'll be fine, Crystal replied soothingly. I'm almost sure of it. Almost, Matt growled as he clenched his teeth and pushed himself into the blindingly intense light. The response was nearly instantaneous. There was something akin to an explosion, the light started to pulsate, and the floor shook in response. Matt hurried to disengage, felt a bit of suction, but managed to pull free. As he did so he noticed that his shields had been drained. His skin felt sunburned. The pulse generator's central core is offline, Cortana said. Well done. Another squadron of sentinels arrived. They swooped into the cramped pulse generator chamber like vultures, fanned out, and seared the area with rubired energy beams. Not only did the monitor take exception to the damage, he was after the index too, but the Spartans knew how to deal with the mechanical killers and proceeded to dodge their lasers as they destroyed one after another. 
Finally, the air thick with the stench of ozone, the Spartans were free to withdraw. The duo went back through the same tunnel to the platform where the Banshees waited. The second pulse generator is located in an adjacent canyon, Crystal announced easily. Move out and I'll mark the NAV point when we get closer. The Spartans sent the Banshees into a wide bank and toward the next objective. Author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen. Have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 52 Enemies Author's note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again, I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 52 Enemies Location Surface of Halo D715735 Spartanii Blue Team Mission Clock The Spartans spotted the next waypoint, put the hijacked banshees down on a platform, and entered the complex via an unguarded hatch. Matt heard the battle before they actually saw it, made their way through the intervening tunnel, and peered through the next door. As had occurred before, the Covenant was busy taking it to the Flood and vice versa, so they gave both groups some time to whittle each other down, left the security of the tunnel, and proceeded to tidy up. Then, eager to replenish their supplies, the Spartans made their ghoulish rounds, and soon was able to equip themselves each with an assault weapon, a shotgun, and some plasma grenades. Even though Matt didn't like to think about where it came from, it felt good to dump the Covenant ordinance he'd been saddled with, and lay his hands on some True Blue UNSC issue for a change. Pulse Generator 1 had been dealt with, and he was eager to disable number 2, then move on to their final objective. Matt stepped into the beam, saw the flash of light, felt the floor shake, and was in the process of pulling away when the flood attacked from every direction. There was no time to think and no time to fight. The only thing they could do was run. The duo turned and sprinted for the corridor they'd used to enter the chamber and took two powerful blows from a combat form. They bullied their way between two carrier forms and leaped out of the way as they detonated like grenades. New infection forms spewed from their deflating corpses. There was barely enough time to turn, hose the closest forms with 7.62 millimeters, and toss a grenade at the group beyond. It went off with a loud when broke glass, and put three of the monstrosities down. Matt was out of ammo by then, knew he lacked the time necessary to reload, and made the switch to the shotgun instead. The gun blew huge holes through the oncoming mob. He charged through one of them and ran like hell. Then, with some pad to work with, the humans turned to gun down the pursuers. The entire battle consumed no more than two minutes but it left both Spartans shaken. Could Crystal detect the slight tremor in Matt's hands as he reloaded both weapons? Hell, she had unrestricted access to all of his vital signs, so she knew more about what was going on with his body than he did. Still, if the AI was conscious of the way he felt, there was no sign of it in her words. Pulse generator deactivated, good work, Crystal commented. Matt nodded wordlessly and the duo made their way back through the tunnel to the point where the Banshees waited. The Pillar of Autumn is located 1200 kilometers upspin, Cortana said. Energy readings show her fusion reactors are still powered up the systems on the Pillar of Autumn have failsafes even I can't override without authorization from the captain. We'll have to find him, or his neural implants, to start the fusion core detonation. One target remaining. Let's take care of the final pulse generator, Crystal said. A NAV indicator appeared on Matt S. Hud as he lifted off, took fire from a neighboring installation, and put the Banshee into a steep dive. The ground came up fast, he pulled out and guided the alien assault craft through a pass and into the canyon beyond. The NAV indicator pointed toward the light that spilled out of a tunnel. The Banshee began to take ground fire, and the Spartan knew his piloting skills were about to be severely tested. A rocket flashed by as he pushed the Banshee down onto the deck, fired the aircraft's weapons, and cut power. Flying into the tunnel was bad enough, but flying into it at high speed verged on suicidal. Once inside the passageway the challenge was to stay off the walls and make the tight right and left hand turns without killing himself. A few seconds later the Spartan saw double blast doors and flared in for a jarring landing. John followed closely behind. They hopped down and Matt made his way over to the control panel, hit the switch, and heard a rumbling sound as the doors started to part. Then there was a bang as something exploded and the enormous panels came to a sudden stop. The resulting gap was too small for the Banshee, but sufficient for two carrier forms to scuttle through. The beasts scrambled toward him on short, stubby legs. 
The humpbacked bladders that formed their upper torsos pulsed and wriggled as the infection forms within struggled for release. Matt blew both monsters away with twin shotgun blasts and mopped up the rest of the infection forms with another shot. He paused and reloaded. There were bound to be more of the creatures on the far side of the doors. Resigned to a fight, they stepped through the crack and paused. There was no sound beyond the gentle roar of machinery, the drip, drip, drip of water off to their right, and the rasp of their own breathing. The threat indicator was clear, and there were no enemies in sight, but that didn't mean much. Not where the flood was concerned. They had a habit of coming out of nowhere. The cave, if that was the proper word for the huge cavern-like space, featured plenty of places to hide. Enormous pipes emerged from the walls and dived downward, mysterious installations stood like islands on the platform around him, and there was no way to know what might lurk in the dark corners. Lights mounted high above, provided what little illumination there was. The humans stood on a broad platform that ran the full length of the open area. A deep chasm separated his platform from what appeared to be an identical structure on the other side of the canyon. One of two bridges that had once spanned the gorge was down, leaving only one over which he could pass, a matador or choke point for anyone who wanted to establish an ambush. There wasn't a hell of a lot of choices, so the duo marched down to the point where the remaining span was anchored and started across. They hadn't gone more than 30 paces before 50 or 60 infection forms emerged from hiding and danced out to block the way. The Spartans held their position, waited for the flood forms to come a little closer, and the chief tossed a fragmentation grenade into the center of the group. The cavern ate some of the sounds, but the explosive device still managed to produce a bang, and the resulting shrapnel laid waste to all but a handful of the creatures. There were two survivors, though, both optimists, who continued to bounce forward in spite of the way in which the rest of the group had been annihilated. A single shotgun blast from Matt was sufficient to kill both of them. Matt slipped some additional shells into the gun's magazine tube, took a deep breath, and moved forward again. They made it about halfway to the other side before a mixed force of combat forms, carrier forms, and infection forms started to gather at the far end of the span. Another grenade inflicted casualties, but they charged the duo after that, and the Spartans were forced to retreat, firing the assault weapons as they did so. It was nip and tuck for a few seconds as combat forms launched themselves 15 meters through the air, carriers charged straight in, and the omnipresent infection forms swarmed through the gaps. Retreating, Matt had already reloaded three times before his back hit the wall, and the last combat form collapsed at his feet, started to rise, and took a blast in the head. Once again it was time to reload both weapons, step out onto the gore-splattered bridge deck, and attempt another crossing. This one was successful, with only light opposition on the other side, and an opportunity to replenish their ammo. The next set of blast doors opened flawlessly, allowing the Spartans to enter a relatively short section of tunnel that led back to the surface. Determined to use stealth if at all possible, they slipped out of the passageway, scrambled up over the snow embankment to their right, and ran into a group of four flood. A grenade from Matt took care of two, and the assault weapon from the chief finished the rest. A banshee swooped in, burned a long line of dashes into the snow, and continued up the valley. Matt was surprised to get off so lightly, but given the darkness and all of the confusion, it was possible that the pilot had mistaken them for a combat form. A worthy target, to be sure, but not something to turn around for, particularly not when the valley was full of combat forms. They were careful to hug the face of the cliff and stay within the cover provided by the boulders and trees that lined the edge of the valley. The incessant thud of automatic weapons and the whine of plasma weapons testified to the intensity of a conflict raging off to his left. Then, just as Matt was starting to believe that they could slide by without firing a shot, the duo came up over a slight rise to see that the Covenant and Flood were engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat within the depression below. A grenade followed with bursts of fire from the MA-5B decimated both groups. Snow crunched as the humans made their way down through the blood-stained snow, past the spot where a trio of greedy infection forms squabbled over a wounded elite, and up another rise to a stand of trees where a combat form and a carrier tried to jump him. Both of the floods staggered as bursts of 7.62 mm slugs cut them down, and they flopped onto the snow. Having broken through the perimeter of the battle, the Spartans were able to follow the NAV indicator into a second valley where they came upon a group of dead Marines, loaded up on ammo, and tried to decide whether to stay with the scattergun or trade it in for a sniper's rifle or a rocket launcher. It would have been nice to have all three, but that many weapons would be unwieldy, not to mention damned heavy. 
In the end, Matt went with the rifle and shotgun and hoped it was the right decision. The Spartans checked the Marines for dog tags, discovered that they had already been taken by someone else, and took the time required to drag the bodies into a nearby cave in the hope that the infection forms wouldn't find them. That seemed like a good place to stash the extra weapons, so that's what they did. Then, having followed the second valley to the point where it opened onto a third valley, they came across a no familiar scene. The Covenant were battling the flood with everything they had, including shades, a brace of ghosts, and two extremely active wraiths, but the flood had plenty of bodies to throw back at them and didn't hesitate to do so. What the two wanted were the banshees that was parked at the head of the valley, but in order to get at the aircraft, it would be necessary to cut both groups down to size. They stayed right, slipped along the cliff face, and made use of a thin screen of trees and boulders to hide their movements from those out toward the center of the valley. Finally, having passed behind a houseized rock and found a vantage point that allowed Matt to look out on the area where the vast majority of the Covenant were congregated, the Spartan unlimbered the S2AM, selected the 10X setting for the scope and began his bloody work. In this particular situation, Matt selected the softest targets first, starting with the grunts on the shades, followed by the outlying jackals, all in hope that he could inflict a lot of casualties before the elites took notice and sent the tank to get him. The problem was that the little world inside the scope was all-consuming, a fact that caused him to let down his guard. The first hint he had that a flood form had come up behind him was when it whacked the Spartan in the head. The blow would have killed anyone else, but the armor saved him, and Matt rolled in the direction of the blow. The long-barreled S2 wasn't well suited for close in combat but that's what he had in his hands. There was no time to aim as the flood form charged, only time to fire, and that's what he did. The slug caught the ex-elite in the chest. The combat form didn't even flinch as the bullet passed through its spongy center of mass. A tiny spurt of gray-green ichor trailed from the entry wound, as the creature swung a vicious blow at the mat. Matt ducked the attack and dropped the rifle. He dived, tucked into a roll, and came up with his sidearm in his hand. He emptied the clip into the beast. One round blew its left arm off, and the final round made a foot-wide exit wound in the flood's back. Matt kicked in the creature's chest, crushing the infection form within. He collected the S2 and frowned. He studied the fallen flood for a moment and saw that the creature's insides were rapidly liquefying. The velocity of the S2's projectile had passed through the non-vital mass of the creature's chest and just kept going. Another nasty surprise, courtesy of the flood. After a quick look around to make sure that there weren't any more surprises lurking in the vicinity, with his heart still beating like a trip hammer, Matt went back to his grisly work. Three more Covenant warriors fell before a barrage of fireballs arced high into the air to land all around his position. One came so close that just the bleed off it was enough to push his shielding into the red and trigger the alarm. Matt pulled back, switched to the assault weapon long enough to ice a couple of overly ambitious grunts, and switched back to the S2 as they rounded the opposite side of the big boulder. Matt selected a spot where he could go to work on both the Covenant and the Flood and settled in. He wanted to nail the elites now and... Thanks to the powerful 14.5mm armor-piercing rounds, he could drop most of them with a single shot. Combat forms were a different story, so he switched to the pistol. It was less accurate but did the job. It wasn't long before more than a dozen bodies were laid out in the snow. But then the word was out. Soon the mortar tank moved into position to bombard his new position, and it was necessary to pull back. The wraith was a problem, a serious problem, which meant there was only one thing the Spartans could do hike back to the weapons cache and trade the rifle for the launcher. It was a major pain in the ass, but he didn't have much choice, so he pulled out. It took a full half hour to make the round trip between the valley and the weapons cache, so Matt expected things to have calmed down a bit by the time they returned. That wasn't the case, however, which suggested that the flood had thrown even more forms into the battle. The Spartans followed their own footprints back to the hiding place next to the big boulder. The chief put the launcher on his shoulder and hit the zoom. The wraith, which was busy hurling mortars down the valley, seemed to leap forward. As if somehow aware of the chief's presence, the tank spun on its axis and launched a bomb toward the rock. The Spartan forced himself to ignore the artificial comet, locked onto the target, and triggered the rocket. There was an impact and a loud crump followed by smoke, but the wraith continued to fire nonetheless. Now, with fireballs exploding all around him, the Master Chief had to take a deep breath, hold the tank at the center of his sight, and pull the trigger again. The tube jerked, the second missile ran straight and true, and hit with a loud crack the wraith opened like a red flower, burped pitch-black smoke, 
and nosed into a snowbank. Nice shot, Cortana said admiringly, but watch the ghost. It was good advice, because although the attack vehicle had held back up to that point, it came skittering into sight, opened up with its plasma weapons, and threatened to accomplish what the rest of the Covenant soldiers hadn't. But the chief had reloaded by then. The rocket tube was the right weapon for the job, and a single missile was sufficient to send the attack vehicle flipping end for and to finally wind up with its belly in the air and flames licking at the engine compartment. With that problem out of the way the chief came to his feet, slapped a fresh load into the launcher, and the duo made a beeline for the banshees. They were halfway across, with nowhere to hide, when a pair of hunters emerged from a jumble of boulders. Now, grateful that they still had some rockets, the chief had no choice but to stop, drop to one knee, and take them on. The first shot was dead on, hit the alien in the chest, and blew the bastard apart. Another rocket flew over the second hunter's right shoulder and cut a tree in half. The big alien started to lumber across open ground, picking up speed and charging its R-mounted cannon. It was a waste of ammo to pepper the front end of a hunter with 7.62 mm rounds, and slow though he was, the alien could still bring him down with a blast from his R-mounted fuel rod cannon. So he put his sight onto a target so big he didn't need to zoom and let fly. The hunter saw the missile coming, tried to deflect it with his shield, and failed. Seconds later pieces of warm meat showered the area, melted holes in the snow, and continued to steam. The Spartans ran past without a second look, jumped into the banshees, and strafed the rest of the Covenant forces on his way down the valley. Judging from the way the NAV indicator was oriented, they needed altitude, a lot of it, so Matt put the banshee into a steep climb. Finally, when the red delta flipped over and started to point down, Matt knew he was high enough. He did a nose over and caught his first glimpse of the waypoint below. The surrounding area was dark, and snow continued to fall, but the platform was nicely lit. Matt lowered the banshee onto the pad and had just bailed out of the pilot's seat when the sentinels attacked. The chief was right behind him. This is the last one, Cortana said. The monitor will do anything to stop us. The Spartans blew three of the pesky machines out of the air, back through the hatch, and let the door close on the rest. We're close, Crystal commented. The generator is up ahead. Matt nodded, stepped out into a room, and felt a laser burn across the front of his armor. It seemed that the monitor had posted sentinels inside the complex, as well. Not only that, but these machines had the benefit of intermittent force fields, which were resistant to automatic weapons fire. Still, they had a couple of 102mm surprises in store for the electromechanical enforcers, which the chief fired into the center of the hovering pack. Three sentinels were blown out of the air. A fourth did loops as it tried to rid itself of a plasma grenade, failed, and took another machine with it. The fifth and sixth succumbed to a hail of bullets as their shields recharged, while the seventh slammed into a wall, crashed to the floor, and was busy trying to lift off again when Matt stomped it to death. The way was clear at that point and the Spartans were quick to take advantage of it. A few quick strides were sufficient to carry them into the central chamber where they were free to approach the final pulse generator. Final target neutralized, Cortana said as the non-com stepped back a few moments later. Let's get out of here. Let's find a ride and get to the captain, Matt agreed, as they prepared to leave. No, that'll take too long, Crystal said. Do you have a better idea? The chief asked her. There's a teleportation grid that runs around Halo. That's how the monitor moves about so quickly, Cortana explained. I learned how to tap into the grid when I was in the control center. So, the chief asked, somewhat annoyed, why didn't you just teleport us to the pulse generators? I can't. Unfortunately, each jump requires a rather consequential expenditure of energy, and I don't have access to Halo's power systems to reroute the energy we need. Cortana paused, then reluctantly continued. There may be another way, however. Matt frowned and shook his head. Something tells me I'm not going to like this. I'm pretty sure I can pull the energy we need from your suits without permanently damaging your shield systems or the armor's power cells, Cortana continued. Needless to say, I think we should only try this once. Agreed. Tap into the Covenant network and see if you can find him, the chief said. If we've only got one shot at this, we should make it a good one, Matt added. There was a pause as Cortana worked her magic with the intrusion and skin software. A moment later, she exclaimed, I've got a good lock on Captain Key's CNI transponder signal. He's alive and the implants are intact. There's some interference from the cruiser's damaged reactor. I'll bring us in as close as I can. Do it, the Master Chief growled. Let's get this over with, Matt said as confidently as he could. 
No sooner had the Spartans spoken than bands of golden light started to ripple down over their armor, the no familiar feeling of nausea returned, and the Spartans seemed to vanish through the floor. Once they were gone only a few motes of amber light remained to mark his passing. Then, after a few seconds, they too disappeared. Author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen. Have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 51 Unexpected Entrance Author's note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again, I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 51 Unexpected Entrance Location Covenant Ship Truth and Reconciliation D733416 Spartanii Blue Team Mission Clock He wasn't here, wasn't there, wasn't anywhere insofar as Matt could tell from within the strange never-never land of Halo's teleportation net. He couldn't see or hear anything, save a sense of dizzying velocity. The Spartan felt his body stitched back together, one molecule at a time. He saw snatches of what looked like the interior of a Covenant ship as bands of golden light strobed up and disappeared over his head. Something was wrong and Matt was just starting to figure out what it was, the inside of the ship seemed to be upside down, when he flipped head over heels and crashed to the deck. They'd materialized with his feet planted firmly on the corridor's ceiling. Oh Cortana exclaimed. I see, the coordinate data needs to be. Matt got his feet and the chief did the same. The chief slapped the general area where his implants were and shook his head. Cortana sounded contrite. Right. Sorry. Never mind that, the chief said. Give us a citrep. The AIs patched back into the Covenant computing systems, a much easier task now that they were aboard one of the enemy's warships. The Covenant network is absolute chaos, Crystal replied. From what I've been able to piece together, the leadership ordered all ships to abandon Halo when they found the flood, but they were too late. The flood overwhelmed this cruiser and captured it. I assume, Matt said, that's bad. The Covenant thinks so. They're terrified that the Flood will repair the ship and use it to escape from Halo, Cortana said. They sent a strike team to neutralize the Flood and prepare the ship for immediate departure. The Spartans peered down the corridor. The bulkheads were violet. Strange patterns marbled the material, like the oily sheen of a beetle's carapace. The duo started forward but quickly came up short as a voice that verged on a groan came in over air implants. Chief, Commander, don't be fools. Leave me. It was Key's voice. Captain, Cortana inquired desperately. Captain, I've lost him. Neither Spartan said anything further. The pain in Key's voice had been clear. All they could do was drive deeper into the ship and hope to find him. The duo passed through a hatch, noticed that the right bulkhead was splattered with Covenant blood, and figured a battle had been fought there. That meant they could expect to run into the flood at any moment. As they continued down the passageway, Matt's throat felt unusually dry, his heart beat a little bit faster and his stomach muscles were tight. His suspicions were soon confirmed as he heard the sounds of battle, took a right and saw that a firefight was underway at the far end of the corridor. They let the combatants go at it for a bit before moving in to cut the survivors down. From there the Spartans took a left, followed by a right, and came to a hatch. It opened to reveal a black hole with jagged edges. Farther back, beyond the drop-off, another firefight was underway. Analyzing data, Crystal said. This hole was caused by some sort of explosion. All I detect down there are pools of coolant. We should continue our search somewhere else. The AI's advice made sense, so the Spartans turned to retrace his steps. Then, as they took the first left, all hell broke loose. Cortana said, warning threat level increasing and then, as if to prove her point, a mob of flood came straight at them. They fired, retreated, and fired again. Carrier forms exploded in a welter of shattered flesh, severed tentacles, and green slime. Combat forms rushed forward as if eager to die, danced under the impact of the 7.62 mm rounds, and flew apart. Infection forms skittered across the decks, leaped into the air, and shattered into flaps of flying flesh. But there were too many, far too many for two people to handle, and even as the mat heard Cortana say something about the black hole they'd accidentally backed into it fell about 20 meters, and plunged feet first into a pond of green liquid. Not in the ship, but somewhere under it, on the surface below. The coolant was so cold that he could feel it through his armor. It was thick, too, which made it more difficult to move. Matt felt his boots hit bottom, knew the weight of his armor would hold him in place, and marched up onto what had become a beach of sorts. 
The cavern was dark, lit mostly by the luminescent glow produced by the coolant itself, although streaks of plasma fire slashed back and forth up ahead, punctuated by the steady thud, thud, thud of an automatic weapon. Let's get out of here, Crystal said, and find another way back aboard the ship. They moved up toward the edge of the conflict and let the combatants hammer each other for a bit before the chief lobbed a grenade into the mix, waiting for the body parts to fall, and the duo killed what was left. Then, having moved forward, they were forced to fight their way through a series of narrow, body-strewn passageways as what seemed like an inexhaustible supply of flood forms came at them from every possible direction. Eventually, having made their way through grottos of coolant and past piles of corpses, Cortana said, we should head this way, toward the ship's gravity lift, and the Spartans saw a NAV pointer appear on their HUDs. They followed the red arrow around a bend to a ledge above a coolant-filled basin. Even as they watched, a dozen carrier forms marched up out of the Green Lagoon to attack a group of hard-pressed Covenant soldiers. The Spartans knew there was no way in hell that they'd be able to force their way through that mess. The two turned and made their way back down the trail. A sniper rifle, just one of the hundreds of weapons scattered around the area, was half obscured by a headless combat form. Matt removed the sniper rifle, checked to ensure that it was loaded, and returned to the overlook. Then, careful to make each shot count, he opened fire. The elites, jackals, and grunts went down fairly easily, but the flood forms, especially the carriers, were practically impossible to kill with this particular weapon. With few exceptions, the heavy rounds seemed to pass right through the lumpy-looking bastards without causing any harm whatsoever. When all of the 14.5 mm ammo was gone, Matt went back for the shotgun, jumped into the green liquid, and waded up onto the shoreline. He heard an obscene sucking noise, saw an infection form trying to enter an elite's chest cavity, and blew both of them away. After that, there was more cleanup to do as some combat forms took a run at the humans and a flock of infection forms tried to roll them under. Repeated doses of shotgun fire turned out to be just what the doctor ordered, the area was soon littered with severed tentacles and scraps of wet flesh. A pitch-black passageway led the two back to another pool where they arrived just in time to see the flood overrun a shade and the elite who was seated at the controls. The Spartans began firing, already backpedaling, when the flood spotted them and hopped, waddled, and jumped forward. Matt fired, reloaded, and fired again. Always retreating, always on the defensive, always hoping for a respite. This wasn't their kind of fight. Spartans were designed as offensive weapons, but ever since the duo landed on the ring, they'd been on the run. They had to find a way to take the offensive, and soon, there was no break in the endless wall of flood attackers. Matt fired until his weapons were empty, pried energy weapons out of dead fingers, and fired those until they were dry. Finally, more by virtue of stubbornness than anything else, and having reacquired human weapons from dead combat forms, the Spartans found themselves standing all alone. Rifles raised, with no one to shoot at. Matt felt a powerful sense of elation, he was alive. It was a moment they couldn't take time to enjoy. Eager to reboard the cruiser and find Captain Keys, they made their way back along the path he had been forced to surrender to the flood, past the shade, rounded a bend, and saw a couple dozen infection forms materialize out of the darkness ahead. A plasma grenade strobed the night, pulverized their bodies and produced a satisfying boom it was still echoing off the canyon walls as the humans eased their way through a narrow passage and emerged at one end of a hotly contested pool. About fifty meters away the Covenant and Flood surged back and forth, traded fire with each other, and appeared to be on the verge of hand -to tentacle combat. Two well-thrown grenades cut the number of hostiles in half. The MA-5BS took care of the rest. There's the gravity lift Cortana said. It's still operational. That's our way back in. It sounded simple, but as Matt looked up at the hill on which the lift was sighted, well-aimed plasma fire lashed down to scorch the rock at his right elbow. It glowed as the humans were forced to pull back, wait for a lull, and dash forward again. Looking ahead, Matt spotted the point where a group of hard-pressed Covenant was trying to bar a group of Flood from making their way up a path toward the top of the hill and the foot of the gravity lift. It was the last stand, and the Covenant knew it. They fought harder than he'd ever seen the aliens fight. Matt felt a moment of kinship with the Covenant soldiers. Matt stood and threw two grenades into the middle of the melee, waited for the twin explosions and went in shooting. An elite sent plasma stuttering into the night sky as he fell over backward, a combat form swung a jackal's arm like a club, and a pair of infection forms rode a grunt down into the pool of coolant. It was madness, a scene straight from hell, 
and the humans had little choice but to kill everything that moved. As the last bodies crumpled to the ground, the Spartans were free to follow the steadily rising path upward, turn to the right, and enter the lift's footprint. Matt felt static electricity crackle around his armor and heard plasma shriek through the air as a distant covenant took exception to their plans. Then the Spartans were gone, pulled upward, into the belly of the beast. Authors note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen. Have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 52 Captain Keys Authors note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again, I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 52 Captain Keys Location Covenant Ship Truth and Reconciliation D744407 Spartanii Blue Team Mission Clock The Spartans arrived at the top of the gravity lift and fought their way through a maze of passageways and compartments, occupied by Flood and Covenant alike. They rounded a corner and saw an open hatch ahead. It looks like a shuttle bay, Crystal commented. We should be able to reach the control room from the third level. The CNI link that Cortana followed served to deliver a new message from the captain. The voice was weak and sounded slurred. I gave you an order, soldiers, now pull out. He's delirious, Cortana said, in pain. We have to find him. With the memory of the voice to spur them on, the Spartans made their way out onto a gallery over the shuttle bay, found that a pitched battle was in progress. Matt lobbed two grenades into the center of the conflict. They had the desired effect, but also signaled the human's presence, and the flood came like iron filings drawn to a magnet. The flood onslaught was intense, and the Spartans were forced to retreat into the passageway whence they had come in order to concentrate the targets, by some time, and reload their weapons. The pitched firefight ended, and they sprinted for the far side of the gallery and passed through an open hatch. The duo fought their way up to the next level of the gallery, where the flood appeared to be holding a convention at the far end of the walkway. Both Spartans were fresh out of grenades by then, which meant they had to clear the path the hard way. A carrier form exploded and sent a cluster of combat forms crashing to the ground. The burst carrier spewed voracious infection forms in every direction and collapsed as one of the fallen combat forms hopped forward, dragging a broken leg behind him, hands clutching a grenade as if it were a bouquet of flowers. Matt backed away, fired a series of ten-round bursts, and gave thanks when the grenade exploded. The carrier had given him an idea, when they blew, they went up in a big way. A second of the creatures scuttled into view, and made its ungainly way forward, accompanied by a wave of infection forms and two more combat forms. Matt used his pistol scope to survey the combat forms and was gratified that they fit the bill each carried plasma grenades. Matt stepped into view, and the combat forms instantly vaulted high in the air. As soon as their feet left the deck, he dropped and fired, directly at the carrier. Matt's aim was perfect, as soon as they passed over the carrier, it burst and ignited the plasma grenades the combat forms carried. They all went up in a blue-white flash of destructive energy. The control room should be this way, Cortana said as the duo charged ahead, eager to keep them moving in the right direction. The Spartans moved fast, advancing across the blood-slicked floor, and followed Cortana's new NAV coordinates toward the still-distant hatch. He passed through the opening, followed the corridor to an intersection, took a right, a left, and was passing through a door when a horrible groan was heard over the link. The Captain Crystal said, his vitals are fading please chief, commander, hurry. The Spartans charged into a passageway packed with both Covenant and Flood and sprayed the tangle of bodies with bullets. They kept running at top speed, sprinting past enemies and ignoring their hasty snapshots. Time was of the essence, Keys was fading fast. They made it to the CNI's carrier wave source the cruiser's control room. The lighting was subdued, with hints of blue, and reflections off the metal surfaces. Thick, sturdy columns framed the ramp which led up to an elevated platform, where something strange stood. Matt thought it was a carrier at first glance but soon realized that the creature was far too large for that. It boasted a fleshy material that connected it to the ceiling overhead, like thick, gray-green spiderwebs. There were no signs of opposition, not yet anyway, which left them free to make their way up the ramp with their rifles at the ready. As they moved closer Matt realized that the new flood form was huge. If it was aware of the human presence, the creature gave no sign of it and continued to study a large hollow panel as if committing the information displayed there to memory. No human life signs detected, Cortana observed cautiously. The captain's life signs just stopped, Crystal added. Damn. 
What about the CNI? Matt asked. Still transmitting, Cortana replied. Then Matt noticed a bulge in the monster's side and realized that he was looking at an impression of the naval officer's grotesquely distorted face. Crystal said, the captain he's one of them. Matt realized then that he already knew that somewhere in the back of his mind, but was unwilling to accept it. We can't let the flood get off this ring Cortana said desperately. You know what he'd expect. What he'd want us to do. Yes, Matt thought. We know our duty. They needed to blow the Autumn's engines to destroy Halo and the flood. To do that, they needed the captain's neural implants. Get the captain's neural implants, Matt, John said. Make it quick. Matt felt a lump form in the back of his throat at the thought of what he was about to do. Copy that. Matt drew his arm back, formed his hand into a stiff-fingered armored shovel, and made use of his enormous strength to plunge the crude instrument into the flood form's bloated body. There was momentary resistance as he punched his way through the creature's skin and penetrated the captain's skull to enter the half-dissolved brain that lay within. Then, with his hand buried in the form's seemingly nerveless body, he felt for and found Key's implants. Matt's hand made a popping sound as it pulled out of the wound. He shook the spongy gore onto the deck and slipped the chips into empty slots in his armor. It's done, Crystal said somberly. I have the code. We should go. We need to get back to the Pillar of Autumn. Let's go back to the shuttle bay and find a ride. As if summoned by the lethargic beast that stood in front of the ship's controls, a host of flood poured into the room, all of whom were clearly determined to kill the heavily armored invaders. A flying wedge comprised of carrier and combat forms stormed the platform, pushed the humans back, and soaked up their bullets as if eager to receive them. Finally, more by chance than design, the Spartans backed off the command deck and plummeted to the deck below. That bought a moment of respite. There wasn't much time, though, just enough for the duo to hustle up out of the channel that ran parallel to the platform above. Matt reloaded both of his weapons and put his back into a corner. The chief did the same. The horde really came for them then, honking, gibbering, and gurgling, climbing up over the bodies that were mounted in front of them, careless of casualties, willing to pay whatever price they required. The storm of gunfire put out by the MJOL and ironclad soldiers were too powerful, too well-aimed, and the flood started to wilt, stumble, and fall, many giving up their lives only centimeters from Matt's blood-drenched boots, clawing at his ankles. He breathed a sigh of relief as the last combat form collapsed, relished the silence that settled over the room, and took a moment to reload both of his weapons. Are you okay? Crystal asked hesitantly, both grateful and amazed by the fact that Matt was still on his feet. Matt thought of Captain Keys. No, Matt replied. Let's get the hell out of here and finish these bastards off. Agreed, John said. Matt was numb from creeping exhaustion, hunger, and combat. The planned escape route back to the shuttle bay was littered with flood and covenant alike. The Spartans moved almost as if they were on autopilot, the duo simply killed and killed and killed. The bay was filled with covenant forces. A dropship had deployed fresh troops into the bay and bugged out. A pair of amped up elites patrolled near the banshees at the base of the bay. All the possibilities raced through Matt's weary mind. What if that particular machine was in for repairs? What if an elite took over the shade and gunned them down? What if some bright light decided to close the outer doors? But none of those fears were realized as the aircraft came to life, turned toward the planet that hung outside the bay doors, and raced into the night. Energy beams followed and tried to bring the banshees down, but ultimately fell short. They were free once more. Author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen. Have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 53 Pillar of Autumn. Authors note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again, I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 53 Pillar of Autumn. Location Commandeered Banshee. On approach to the UNSC Pillar of Autumn, D761856, Spartanii Blue Team Mission Clock. The Banshee screamed through a narrow valley and out over an arid wasteland. The vehicle's shadow raced ahead as if eager to reach the Pillar of Autumn first. Matt felt the slipstream fold in behind the aircraft's nose and tug at his armor. It felt good to be out of twisting corridors and cramped compartments if only for a short while. The first sign of the ship's presence on the ringworld's surface was the hundred-meter-deep trench the Autumn's hull had carved into Halo's skin. It started where the cruiser had first touched down, vanished where the vessel had bounced into the air, and reappeared a half-click farther on. 
From there the depression ran straight as an arrow to the point where the starship had finally come to rest with its blunt bow protruding out over the edge of a massive cliff. There were other aircraft in the area as well, all of which belonged to the Covenant, and they had no reason to suspect the incoming Banshee. Not yet, at any rate. The Spartans, who were eager to make their approach look normal, chose one of the many empty lifeboat bays that lined the starship's starboard side and bored in. These things are falling apart, Crystal said panicked. They'll hold, Matt said calmly. We're not gonna make it, Cortana cried. We'll make it, the chief said. Pull up, pull up, the two AIs shouted in unison. Unfortunately, the engine cut out at the last moment, the Banshees hit the Autumn's hull, and although the Spartans were able to bail out, the alien vehicle fell to the rocks below. Not the low visibility arrival they had hoped for. Still, given Cortana's plans for the vessel, their presence wouldn't remain secret for long anyway. You two did that on purpose, didn't you? Crystal said sardonically. It doesn't matter if we did it on purpose or not, Matt said as he and the chief pulled themselves onto the Pillar of Autumn. We're alive and that's all that matters at the moment. We need to get to the bridge, Cortana said. From there we can use the captain's neural implants to initiate an overload of the ship's fusion engines. The explosion should damage enough systems below it to destroy the ring. Shouldn't be a problem, Matt commented as he and the chief made their way toward the tiny airlock. I don't know who's better at blowing things up, AIs or Spartans, the chief said. The moment the duo stepped outside they saw a cluster of red dots appear on their motion detectors and knew some nasties were lurking off to their left. The only question was, which hostiles did they face, the Covenant or the Flood? Given a choice, Matt would take the Covenant. Maybe, just maybe, the Flood hadn't located the ship yet. The passageway ended to the right, which meant they had little choice but to turn left. But, rather than run into the Covenant or the Flood, the Spartans came under attack from a flock of Sentinels. Oh ho, Crystal said as the Spartans opened fire, it looks like the Monitor knows where we are. I wonder if he knows what we're up to, Matt mused. A sentinel exploded, another hit the deck with a loud clang, and Matt shifted fire to a third. Yeah, he's after our heads, but it's you two that he really wants, the chief said. The two AIs made no reply as the third machine exploded, and the Spartans made their way down the hall using the lifeboat bays for cover. Two additional sentinels appeared, were blown out of the air, and turned into scrap. Soon after that they arrived at the end of the corridor, took a right, and spotted an open maintenance hatch. Not ideal, since Matt didn't relish the thought of having to negotiate such tight quarters, but there didn't seem to be any other choice. So the duo ducked inside, found themselves in a maze, and blundered about for a while before spotting a hatch set flush into the deck in front of him. That's when a group of infection forms swarmed up out of the hole, and the Matt's question was answered. It appeared that the flood had located the autumn, and already taken up residence there. Matt swore under his breath, backed away, and hosed the flood with bullets. He eased forward and looked down through the floor hatch. He saw a carrier form and knew there were bound to be more. He dropped a plasma grenade down through the hole, backed away, and took a certain amount of pleasure in the ensuing explosion. The maintenance tunnels didn't seem to be taking them where they needed to go, so the duo dropped through the hole, crushed a handful of infection forms, and shot two more. The blood-splattered corridor was messy but well lit. Matt pried open a wall-mounted locker and was pleased to find four frag grenades and spare ammo. He quickly stowed away two of them, tossed the other two to John, and moved on. Two sentinels nosed around a corner opened fire with their lasers and got what they deserved. They might have been looking for us, Crystal observed, but it's my guess that they were assigned to flood control. The theory made sense but didn't really help much as the Spartans were forced to fight the sentinels, the flood, and the covenant while the duo made their way through a series of passageways and into the ship's heavily damaged mess, where a large contingent of elites and grunts were waiting to have them for lunch. There were a lot of them, too many to handle the assault weapons alone, so Matt served up a couple of grenades. One of the elites was blown to pieces by the overlapping explosions, another lost a leg, and a grunt was thrown halfway across the room. They'd come full circle, the duo had blasted Covenant troops apart before the crash landing, and here they were again. The enemy just didn't learn, Matt thought. There was a survivor, however, a tough elite who threw a plasma grenade of his own and missed by a matter of centimeters. The Spartans ran and were clear of the blast zone by the time the device went off. The elite charged, took the better part of a full clip from Matt's assault rifle, and finally slammed into the deck, dead. It was a short distance to the burned-out bridge, where a Covenant security team was on duty. Word had been passed they knew the humans were on their way and opened fire the moment they saw them. 
Once again Matt made use of a grenade to even the odds, then crushed the head of an elite with his fist. The alien's head was turned to pulp and its body collapsed like a puppet with no strings. The armor gave him enough strength to flip a warthog over. Then, just when he thought the battle was done, a grunt shot him in the back. The audible went off as his armor sought to recharge itself. A second shot, delivered with sufficient speed, would kill him. Time seemed to slow as Matt turned toward his right. The grunt, who had been hiding inside an equipment cabinet, froze as the armored alien not only survived what should have been a fatal shot but turned to face him. They were only an arm's length away from each other, which meant that Matt could reach out, rip the breather off his assailant's face, and close the door on him. There was a loud click followed by wild hammering as the chief made his way forward to the spot where Captain Keyes had issued his orders. Cortana appeared over the control panel in front of them. Everywhere the AI looked she saw burned out equipment, blood-stained decks, and smashed viewports. She shook her head sadly. I leave home for a few days, and look what happens. Cortana brought a hand up to her semi-transparent forehead. This won't take long, there, that should give us enough time to make it to the lifeboat, and put some distance between ourselves and Halo before detonation. The next voice Matt heard belonged to 343 Guilty Spark. I'm afraid that's out of the question. Crystal groaned. Oh, hell. The Spartans brought their weapons up but saw no sign of the monitor or his sentinels. That didn't prevent the construct from babbling in Matt's ears, though, the AI had tapped into his comm system. Ridiculous that you would imbue your warship's AI with such a wealth of knowledge. Wouldn't you worry that it might be captured? Or destroyed? Cortana frowned. He's in my data arrays, a local tap. Mine too, Crystal added. Though nowhere near the bridge, the monitor was on board, and flitted from one control panel to the next. Sucking information out of Cortana's non-sentient subprocessors with the ease of someone vacuuming a set of drapes. You can't imagine how exciting this is to have a record of all our lost time. Oh, how I will enjoy every moment of categorization. To think that you would destroy this installation, as well as this record. I am shocked. Almost too shocked for words. He stopped the self-destruct sequence, Crystal warned. Why do you continue to fight us, Reclaimers? Spark demanded. You cannot win give us the constructs and I will endeavor to make your death relatively painless and the rest of 343 guilty sparks words were chopped off as if someone had thrown a switch. At least I still have control over the comm channels, Cortana said. Where is he? Matt asked. I'm detecting taps throughout the ship, Cortana replied. Sentinels most likely. As for the monitor, he's in engineering. He must be trying to take the core offline. Even if I could get the countdown restarted, I don't know what to do. The chief stared at the hologram in surprise. This was a first, and it made her seem more human somehow. How much firepower would you need to crack one of the engine shields? Not much, Cortana replied, a well-placed grenade perhaps, but why? Matt produced a grenade, tossed the device into the air, and caught it again. Cortana's eyes widened and she nodded. Okay, let's go. The Spartans turned and started to leave. Chief, Commander Crystal said. Sentinels. In unison, the machines attacked. Author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen. Have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 54 Flood Attack. Author's note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again, I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 54 Flood Attack Location UNSC Pillar of Autumn D763551 Spartanii Blue Team Mission Clock Having fought their way clear of the bridge, the Spartans made their way through a series of passageways, ran into more flood and gunned them down. Cortana figured that they could access the engine room via the cryo chamber, and that was where the duo was headed. The problem was that they kept running into jammed hatches, locked doors, and other obstacles that kept them from taking a direct route. After they moved through a large, dark room strewn with weapons, Matt heard the sounds of combat coming from the area beyond a closed hatch. The Spartans paused, heard the noises die away, and slipped out into the corridor. Bodies lay all about as they slid along a bulkhead, saw some spikes sticking up over a cargo module, and Matt felt his blood run cold. A hunter or more accurately two hunters, since they traveled in pairs. Lacking a rocket launcher, the Spartans turned to the only heavy-duty firepower that they had grenades. Each Spartan threw a grenade in quick succession, saw the behemoth go down, and heard a roar of outrage as the second hunter charged. 
The Spartans fired just to slow the alien down, back through the hatch, and gave thanks as the door closed. That gave them two or three seconds that they needed to plant their feet. Both pulled another grenade and prepared to throw it. The hatch opened, the fragmentation grenades flew straight and true, and the explosion knocked the beast off its feet. The deck shook as the body hit. The hunter attempted to rise but fell under a hail of armor-piercing bullets. The duo gave the corpse a wide berth as they left the room and passed back into the hall. As they made their way through the ship's corridors, Matt saw blood-splattered bulkheads, bodies sprawled in every imaginable posture of death, blown hatches, sparks flying out of junction boxes, and a series of small fires, which thanks to a lack of combustible materials seemed to be fairly well contained. They heard the sound of automatic weapons fire somewhere ahead and passed through another hatch. Inside, a fire burned at the point where two large pipes traversed a maintenance bay. They were close to the cryo chamber, or thought they were, but needed to find a way in. Hesitant to jump through the flames unless it was absolutely necessary, three took a right turn instead. The sounds of combat grew louder as the hatch opened onto a large room where a full array of flood forms were battling a clutch of sentinels. Matt paused, shouldered his weapon, and fired. Sentinels crashed, carrier forms exploded, and everyone fired at one another in a mad melee of crisscrossing energy beams, 7.62 mm projectiles, and exploding needles. Once the sentinels had been put out of action, and most of the flood had been neutralized, the Spartans were able to cross the middle of the room, climb a ladder, and gain the catwalk above. From that vantage point they could look across into the maintenance control room, where a couple of sentinels were hard at work trying to zap a group of flood, none of whom were willing to be toasted without putting up a fight. The combatants were too busy to worry about stray humans, however, and the Spartans took advantage of that to work their way down the walkway and into the control room. And that, as they soon learned, was a big mistake. It wasn't too bad at first or didn't seem to be, as the duo destroyed both of the sentinels and went to work on the flood. But every time they put one form down, it seemed as if two more arrived to take its place, soon forcing the Spartans onto the defensive. They retreated into the antechamber adjacent to the control room. The humans had little choice but to place their backs against a locked hatch. The larger forms came in twos and threes, while the infection forms came in swarms. Some of the assaults seemed to be random, but many appeared to be coordinated as one, or two, or three combat forms would hurl themselves forward, die under the assault weapon's thundering fire, and fall just as the Spartans ran out of ammo, and more carrier forms waddled into the fray. Matt slung his AR, drew the shotgun, briefly hoping there would be a lull during which to reload, and opened fire on the bloated monstrosities before the force exerted by their exploding bodies could do him harm. Then, with newly spawned infection forms flying in every direction, it was cleanup time followed by a desperate effort to reload both weapons before the next wave of creatures attempted to roll over them. They dropped into a pattern of fire and movement. The duo made their way through the ship, closer to the engineering spaces, pausing only to pour fire into knots of targets of opportunity. Then, they quickly disengaged, reloaded, and ran farther into the ship. The noise generated by his own weapons hammered at Matt's ears, the thick gagging odor of flood blood clogged his throat, and his mind eventually grew numb from all the killing. After dispatching a Covenant combat team, Matt crouched behind a support strut and fed rounds into the shotgun. Without warning, a combat form leaped on his back and smashed a large wrench into his helmet. His shield dropped away from the force of the blow, which allowed an infection form to land on his visor. Even as he staggered under the impact, and pawed at the form's slick body, a penetrator punched its way through his neck seal, located his bare skin, and sliced it open. Matt gave a cry of pain, felt the tentacle slide down toward his spine, and knew it was over. Though unable to pick up a weapon and kill the infection form directly, Crystal had other resources and rushed to use them. Careful not to drain too much power, the AI diverted some energy away from the Mjolnir armor and made use of it to create an electrical discharge. The infection form started to vibrate as the electricity coursed through it. Matt jerked as the flood form's penetrator delivered a shock to his nervous system, and the pod popped, misting the Spartan's visor with green blood spray. Matt could see well enough to fight, however, and did so killing the wrench-wielding combat form with a burst of bullets. Sorry about that, Crystal said, as the Spartans cleared the area around then, but I couldn't think of anything else to do. You did fine, Matt replied, pausing to reload. That was close. You all right? John asked. Yeah, I'm fine, Chief. 
John nodded and the two continued on. Another two or three minutes passed before the flood gave up and Matt could take the moment necessary to remove his helmet, jerk the penetrator out from under his skin, and slap a self-adhering antiseptic battle dressing over the wound and a quick injection of nanites. It hurt like hell Matt winced as he lowered the helmet back over his head and sealed his suit. Then, pausing only to kill a couple of stray infection forms and still looking for a way to gain entry to the cryo chamber. The Spartans made their way through a number of passageways, into a maze of maintenance tunnels, and out into a corridor where they spotted a red arrow on the deck along with the word engineering. Finally, a break. No longer concerned with finding a way into cryo, the Spartans passed through a hatch and entered the first passageway they'd seen that was well lit, free of bloodstains, and not littered with corpses. A series of turns brought them to a hatch. Engine room located, Crystal announced. We're here. The Spartans heard humming and knew that 343 Guilty Spark was somewhere in the vicinity. The duo had already started to back through the hatch when Crystal said, Alert the monitor has disabled all command access. We can't restart the countdown. The only remaining option will be to detonate the ship's fusion reactors. That should do enough damage to destroy Halo. Don't worry. I have access to all of the reactor schematics and procedures. I'll walk you through it, Cortana said. First we need to pull back the exhaust coupling. That will expose a shaft that leads to the primary fusion drive core. Oh, good, John replied. I was afraid it might be complicated. Matt reopened the hatch, stepped out into the engine room, and an infection form flew straight at his faceplate. Author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen. Have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 55 Warthog Run Authors note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again, I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 55 Warthog Run Location UNSC Pillar of Autumn D764539 Spartanii Blue Team Mission Clock The engine room hatch opened. An infection form went for Matt's face, and he fired a quarter of a clip into it. A lot more bullets than the target required, but the memory of how the penetrator had slipped in under the surface of his skin was still fresh in his mind, and he wasn't about to allow any of the pods near his face again, especially with a hole in his neck seal. A red NAV indicator pointed the way toward a ramp at the far end of the enormous room. The Spartans pounded their way up onto a raised platform, ran past banks of controls, and ducked through the hatch that led up to level 2. They followed a passageway out into an open area, and then up the ramp to level 3. Near the top, a pair of combat forms fell to their well-placed fire. The duo policed the fallen creature's ammo and grenades and kept going. Not acceptable, reclaimers, 343 guilty spark intoned. You must surrender the constructs. The Spartans ignored the monitor, made their way up to level 3, and encountered a reception party comprised of Flood. They opened fire, took two combat forms and a carrier down off the top, and backed away in order to reload. Then, with a fresh clip in place, Matt opened fire, cut the nearest form off at the knees, tossed a grenade into the crowd behind him. The frag detonated and blew them to hell. Quick bursts of automatic fire were sufficient to finish the survivors and allow the Spartans to reach the far end of the passageway. A group of forms was waiting there to greet them but quickly gave way to a determined assault as they made their way up the blood-slick steel, and through the hatch at the top of the ramp. The duo moved onto the level 3 catwalk and immediately started to take fire. There was total chaos as the sentinels fired on the flood, the flood shot back, and everyone seemed to want a piece of him. It was important to concentrate, however, to focus on their mission, so the Spartans made a mad dash for the nearest control panel. The chief hit the control labeled open, heard a beeper go off, followed by the sound of Cortana's voice. Good step one complete we have a straight shot into the fusion reactor. We need a catalytic explosion to destabilize the magnetic containment field surrounding the fusion cell. Oh, Matt said as he jumped down onto a thick slab of duracrete and felt it start to move. I thought we were supposed to throw a grenade into a hole. That's what I said. Matt grinned as a brightly lit rectangular slot appeared and he tossed a grenade in through the opening. The ensuing explosion threw bits of charred metal around the smoke-filled compartment. One down, and three to go, Matt told himself as the sentinels fired, and the laser beams hit his chest. As the final grenade went off, Matt felt the shaft he was standing on shake in sympathy and Cortana yelled into his ears. That did it the engines will go critical. 
We have 15 minutes to get off the ship we should move outside and get to the third deck elevator. It will take us to a class 7 service corridor that runs the length of the ship. Hurry. The Spartans jumped up onto the level 3 platform, blasted a combat form, and turned toward the hatch off to their right. It opened, they passed through and ran the length of the passageway. A second door opened onto the area directly in front of the large service elevator. Matt heard machinery whir, figured he had triggered a sensor, and waited for the lift to arrive. For the first time in hours, there was no immediate threat, no imminent danger, and the Spartan allowed himself to relax fractionally. It was a mistake, Commander Crystal said. Get back. Thanks to the warning, he was already backing through the hatch when the lift appeared from below, and the elite, seated in the plasma turret, opened fire. Damn Matt exclaimed. Where did that come from? It looks like someone has been tracking you, Cortana said grimly. Now, get ready, I'll take control of the elevator and cause it to drop. You two roll a couple of grenades into the shaft. Cortana brought the lift back up. The Spartans had little choice but to step onto the gore-splattered platform and let it carry them toward the service corridor above. Cortana took advantage of the moment to work on the escape plan. Cortana to Echo 419, come in Echo 419. Roger, Cortana, Fohammer said from somewhere above, I read you five by five. Matt felt a series of explosions shake the elevator, knew the ship was starting to come apart and looked forward to the moment when he would be free of it. The pillar of autumn's engines are going critical, Fohammer, Cortana continued. Request immediate extraction. Be ready to pick us up at external access junction 4C as soon as you get my signal. Affirmative. Echo 419 to Cortana, things are getting noisy down there. Is everything okay? The elevator shook again as the AI said, negative, negative we have a wildcat destabilization of the ship's fusion core. The engines must have sustained more damage than we thought. Then, as the platform jerked to a halt, and a piece of debris fell from somewhere up above, Crystal spoke to the Spartans. We have six minutes before the fusion drives detonate. We need to evacuate now the explosion will generate a temperature of almost 100 million degrees. Don't be here when it blows. That sounded like excellent advice. The Spartans ran through a hatch into a bay full of warthogs, each stowed in its own individual slot. They chose one that was located near the entry. Matt jumped into the driver's seat and was relieved when the vehicle started up. John hopped into the passenger seat. The countdown timer which Crystal had projected onto the inside surface of his HUD was not only running, but running fast, or so it seemed to Matt as he drove out of the bay. Hooked a left to avoid a burning hog and plowed through a mob of Covenant and Flood. An elite went down, was sucked under the big off-road tires, and caused the vehicle to buck as it passed over them. The slope ahead was thick with infection forms. They popped like firecrackers as the human accelerated uphill and plasma bolts raced to catch them from behind. Then, cautious lest he made a mistake and lose valuable time, he took his foot off the accelerator and paused at the top of the ramp. A large passageway stretched before him, with walkways to either side, a pedestrian bridge in the distance, and a narrow service tunnel directly ahead. A couple of flood forms were positioned on top of the entrance and fired down at them as Matt pushed the warthog forward and nosed into the opening ahead. The ramp sloped down, Matt braked, and he was soon glad that he had as something went boom and hurled pieces of jagged metal across the passageway in front of him. Matt took his foot off the brake, converted a carrier form into a paste, and sent the LRV up the opposite slope. They emerged from the subsurface tunnel, and with a barrier ahead, Matt swung left, and ran the length of a vertical wall. He saw a narrow ramp, accelerated upslope, and jumped a pair of gaps that he never would have tackled had he been aware of them. Matt hit a level stretch, braked reflexively, and was thankful when the warthog nosedived off the end of the causeway and plunged into another service tunnel. Now, with a group of flood ahead, he pushed through them, crushed the monsters under the tires. Nice job on that last section, Crystal said admiringly. How did you know about the dive off the end? Cortana asked. I didn't, Matt said as the LRV lurched up out of the tunnel and nosed into another. Oh, Crystal said. This passage was empty, which allowed Matt to pick up speed as he guided the warthog up into a larger tunnel. The hog caught some air, and he put the pedal to the metal in an effort to pick up some time. The large passageway was smooth and clear, but took them out into a hell of flying metal, homicidal flood, and laser-happy sentinels all of whom tried to cancel their ticket while Matt paused, spotted an elevated ramp off to the left, and steered for it even as crisscrossing energy beams sizzled across the surface of his armor and explored the interior of the vehicle. 
Matt fought to control the hog as one tire rode up onto the metal curb and threatened to pull the entire vehicle off into the chaos below. It was difficult, with fire sleeting in from every possible direction, but Matt made the necessary correction, came down off the ramp, hooked a left, and found himself in a huge tunnel with central support pillars that marched off into the distance. Careful to weave back and forth between the pillars in order to improve his time, he rolled through a fight between the Flood and a group of Covenant, took fire from a flock of Sentinels, and gunned the LRV out into another open area with a barrier ahead. A quick glance confirmed that another elevated ramp ran down the left side of the enormous passageway, so he steered for that. Explosions sent gouts of flame and smoke up through the grating ahead of them, and threatened to heave the warthog off the track. Once off the ramp, things became a little easier as the Spartans entered a large tunnel, sped the length of it, braked into an open area, and pushed the vehicle down into a smaller service tunnel. Infection forms made loud popping sounds as the tires ate them alive. The engine growled, and Matt nearly lost it as he came out of the tunnel too fast, realized there was another subsurface passageway ahead, and did a nose-over that caused the front wheels not only to hit hard but nearly flip the hog end for end. Only some last-minute braking and a measure of good luck brought the LRV down right side up and allowed Matt to climb up out of the passageway and into a maze of pillars. Matt swore as they were forced to wind their way between the obstacles while precious seconds came off the countdown clock and every alien, parasite, and machine with a weapon took pot shots at them while he did so. Then came a welcome stretch of straight-level pavement, a quick dip through a service tunnel, and a ramp into a sizable tunnel as Cortana called for evac. Cortana to Echo 419 requesting extraction now on the double. Affirmative, Cortana, the pilot replied, as Matt accelerated out onto a causeway. Wait stop Crystal insisted. This is where Fohammer is coming to pick us up. Hold position here. Matt braked, heard a snatch of garbled radio traffic, and saw a UNSC dropship approach from the left. Smoke trailed behind the Pelican and the reason was plain to see. A banshee had slotted itself in behind the transport and was trying to hit one of the ship's engines. There was a flash as the starboard power plant took a hit and burst into flames. Matt could imagine Fohammer at the controls, fighting to save her ship, eyeing the causeway ahead. Pull up pull up the chief shouted, hoping she could pancake in, but it was too late. The pelican lost altitude, passed under the causeway, and soon disappeared from sight. The explosion came three seconds later. Crystal said, Echo 419 and, receiving no response, said, she's gone. Matt remembered the cheerful voice on the radio, the countless times the pilot had saved somebody's tail, and felt a deep sense of regret. There was a short pause while Cortana tapped into what remained of the ship's systems. There's a long sword docked in Launch Bay 7. If we move now we can make it. Rubber screeched as Matt put his foot to the floor, steered the warthog through a hatch, down a ramp, and into a tunnel. Huge pillars marked the center of the passageway and a series of concave gratings caused the LRV to wallow before it lurched up onto the smooth pavement again. Explosions sent debris flying from both sides of the tunnel and made it difficult to hear Crystal as she said something about full speed and some sort of a gap. He hit the accelerator, but the rest was more a matter of luck rather than skill. Matt pushed the hog up a ramp, felt the bottom drop out of his stomach as the LRV flew through the air dropped two or three levels, hit hard, slewed sideways, and came to a stop. Matt wrestled with the wheel, brought the front end around, and glanced at the timer. It read 011020. He stamped on the accelerator. The warthog shot ahead, raced through a narrow tunnel, then slowed as he spotted the array of horizontally striped barrels that blocked the road ahead. Not only that, but the entire area was swarming with covenant and flood. The Spartans jumped out, hit the ground running, and gunned an elite who had the misfortune to get in the way. The fighter was straight ahead, ramped down, waiting for them to come aboard. Plasma bolts stuttered past their heads, explosions hurled debris in every direction, and then the duo was there, boots pounding on metal as they entered the ship. The ramp came up just as a mob of flood arrived, the longsword shook in sympathy as another explosion rocked the Pillar of Autumn, and the Spartans staggered as they made their way forward. Precious seconds were consumed as John dropped into the pilot's seat, brought the engines online, and took the controls. Meanwhile, Matt sat down in the co-pilot's seat. Here we go, Crystal said. The chief made use of the ship's belly jets to push the long sword up off the deck. He turned the fighter counterclockwise and hit the throttles. G-forces pushed Matt back into his seat as the spacecraft exploded out of its bay and blasted up through the atmosphere. 
There was an insistent beeping sound as the words engine temp critical flashed on the control panel, and Crystal said, shut them down. We'll need them later. Matt reached up to flick some switches, got up out of his seat, and arrived in front of the viewport in time to see the last intact piece of Halo's hull sheared in half by the dreadful slow-motion ballet of flying metal. For some reason, Matt thought of Lieutenant Melissa McKay, her calm green eyes, and the fact that he had never gotten to know her. Did anyone else make it? John asked. Scanning, Cortana replied. She paused, and he could see scan data scroll across the main terminal. A moment later, she spoke again, her voice unusually quiet. Just dust and echoes. We're all that's left. Matt winced. McKay, Fohammer, Keys, and all the rest of them. Dead. Just like the children he'd been raised with, just like a part of himself. When Crystal spoke it was as if the AI felt that she had to justify what had transpired. We did what we had to do, for Earth. An entire Covenant armada obliterated. And the Flood, we had no choice. Halo, it's finished. No, the Chief replied, settling in behind the Longsword's controls. The Covenant are still out there, and Earth is at risk. We're just getting started, Matt added. Author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen. Have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 56 Potential Survivors Authors note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again, I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 56 Potential Survivors Location Uncharted System Aboard Long Sword Fighter Halo Debris Field September 22, 2552 1637 hours Matt settled into the Sistmop seat of the Long Sword Attack Craft. He didn't fit. The contoured seat had been engineered to mate with a standard-issue Navy flight suit, not the bulky Mjolnir armor. Both Spartans had their helmets off. Matt scratched his scalp and breathed deeply. The air tasted odd, it lacked the metallic quality of his suit's air scrubbers. This was the first quiet moment he'd had to sit, think, and remember. First, there was the satisfaction after the successful space op at Reach, which went sour after Linda was killed and the Covenant glassed the planet, and Red Team. Then the time spent in a pillar of autumn cryotube, the flight from Reach, and the discovery of Halo. And the Flood. Matt stared out of the front viewport and fought down his revulsion at the memory of the Flood outbreak. Whoever had constructed Halo had used it to contain the sentient, virulent xenoform that had nearly claimed them all. The rapidly healing wound in his neck, inflicted by a flood infection form during the final battle on Halo's surface, still throbbed. Matt wanted to forget it all, especially the flood. Everything inside him ached. The system's moon, basis, was a silver-gray disk against the darkness of space, and beyond it was the muted purple of the gas giant threshold. Between them lay a glistening expanse of debris, metal, stone, ice, and everything else that had once been Halo. Scan it again, Matt heard John tell Cortana. Already completed, her disembodied voice replied, There's nothing out there. I told you just dust and echoes. Matt's hand curled into a fist, and for a moment he felt the urge to slam it into something. He relaxed, surprised at his frayed temper. He'd been exhausted in the past, and without a doubt, the fight on Halo had been the most harrowing of his career, but he'd never been prone to such outbursts. The struggle against the Flood must have gotten to him, more than he'd realized. With effort, he banished the Flood from his mind. Either there'd be time to deal with it later, or there wouldn't. Worrying about it now served no useful purpose. Scan the field again, Matt repeated. Cortana's tiny holographic figure appeared on the projection pad mounted between the pilots and Sistmop seats. She crossed her arms over her chest, visibly irritated with the Spartan's request. If you don't find something out there we can use, John told her, we're dead. This ship has Northwest slipspace drive and no cryo. There's no way to get back and report. Power, fuel, air, food, water, we only have enough for a few hours. So, Matt concluded as patiently as he could manage. Scan. Again. Cortana sighed explosively, and her hologram dissolved. The scanner panel activated, however, and mathematical symbols crowded the screen. A moment later the scanner panel dimmed and Cortana said, There's still nothing, you too. All I'm picking up is a strong echo from the moon, but there are no transponder signals, and no distress calls. I don't know what you guys expect to find, Crystal said. You're not doing an active scan. John asked. Cortana's tiny hologram appeared again, 
and this time static flashed across her figure. There are trillions of objects out there. If you want I can start to scan and identify each individual piece. If we sit here and do nothing else, that would take 18 days. What if someone's out there but they turned off their transponder? Matt asked. What if they don't want to be found? That's highly un. Cortana froze for a split second. The static around her vanished, and she stared off into space. Interesting. What? John asked. Cortana looked distracted, then seemed to snap out of it. New data. That signal echo is getting stronger. Meaning? Matt asked. Meaning, she replied, it's not an echo. The scanner panel hummed back to life as Cortana activated the Longsword's long-range detection gear. Oho, she said, a moment later. Matt peered at the skin panel as Cortana identified the contact. The distinctive, bulbous silhouette of a Covenant cruiser edged into view as it moved around the moon's far side. Power down, John snapped. Kill everything except passive scanners and minimal power to keep you online. The longsword darkened, Cortana's hologram flickered and faded as she killed power flow to the hollow system. The cruiser moved into the debris field, prowling like a hungry shark. Another cruiser appeared, then another, and then three more. Status. Matt whispered, his hands hovering over the weapon's controls. Have they spotted us? They're using the same scanning frequencies as our system, Crystal said in his helmet speaker. How strange. No mention of this phenomenon in any of the UNSC or ONI files on the Covenant. Why do you suppose they'd use the same frequencies? Never mind that, Matt said. They're here and looking for something. Like I said before, if there are survivors out there, they'd be powered down. I can listen to their echoes, Cortana said, her voice flat and oddly procedural. Operating at lower power levels seemed to limit her more colorful behavior. Process active analyzing Covenant signals. Piggybacking their scans. Diverting more runtime to the task. I'm building a multiplex filtering algorithm. Customizing the current shape signature recognition software. Another ship rounded the horizon of basis. It was larger than any Covenant ship Matt had seen. It had the sleek three-bulbed shape of one of their destroyers, but it must have been three kilometers long. Seven plasma turrets were mounted on universal joints, enough firepower to get any ship in the UNSC fleet. Picking up encrypted transmissions from a new contact, Cortana whispered. Descrambling, lots of chatter, orders being given to the cruisers. It appears to be directing the Covenant fleet operations in the system. A flagship, John murmured. Interesting. Skin still in progress, Chief, Commander. Stand by. Matt got out of the SysOp seat. He had no intention of just standing by with seven Covenant warships in the system. Matt drifted to the aft compartment of the longsword fighter. He'd assess what equipment was on board. He might get lucky and find a few of those Shiva nuclear-tipped missiles. As he had seen when they first boarded the ship, the cryotube had been removed. Matt wasn't sure why, but maybe, like everything else on the Pillar of Autumn, the ship had been stripped down and upgraded for their original high-risk mission. Where the cryo unit was supposed to be there was a new control panel. Matt examined it and discovered it was a Moray space mine laying system. He didn't power it on. The Moray system could dispense up to three dozen free-floating mines. The mines had tiny chemical fuel drives that allowed them to keep a fixed position or move to track specific targets. These would come in handy. He moved to the weapons locker and forced it open, it was empty. Matt checked his own assault rifle fully functional, but only 13 rounds remained in the magazine. Got something, Cortana said. Matt returned to the sysop seat. Show us. On the smallest view screen, a silhouette appeared a small, bullet-shaped cone with maneuvering thrusters on one end. It could be a cryotube, Crystal said. Thruster and power packs can be affixed on their aft sections for emergencies, if a ship has to be abandoned, for example. And most of the crew on the Pillar of Autumn never had a chance to be revived from cryo, Matt said. They could have been jettisoned before the ship went down. Move us toward them. Docking thrusters only. Course plotted, Cortana said. Thrusters engaged. There was a slight acceleration. ETA 20 minutes, Chief, Commander, Cortana said. But given the Covenant Cruiser's current search pattern, I estimate they will encounter the pod in five minutes. We need to move faster, John told her, but without firing the engines. The drive emissions will show up like a flare on their sensors. Hang on, Cortana said. I'll get us there. Both Spartans donned their helmets and locked its atmosphere seals. Status lights pulsed green. Ready, John said. The aft hatch of the longsword breached and slammed open. There was an explosive sound as the atmosphere vented.
The long sword jumped forward. Matt's head slammed into the back of his helmet. Adjusting course, Cortana said calmly. ETA two minutes. How are we going to stop? John asked. She sighed. Do I have to think of everything? The aft hatch resealed, and Matt heard the faint hiss as the internal compartments pressurized. One of the sleek Covenant cruisers slowed and turned toward them. Picking up increased scanning signal activity and strength, Cortana reported. Matt's hand hovered over the weapon system console. It would take several seconds for the weapons to power up. The 110mm rotary cannons could fire immediately, but the missiles would have to wait for their target lock software to initialize. By then the cruiser, which outgunned them 100 to 1, would turn the longsword into molten slag. Attempting to jam their scanners, Cortana said, that may buy us some time. The Covenant cruiser turned away, slowed, and turned back to face the comparatively tiny longsword. It took no further action, as if it were waiting for them to get closer. So far so good, Matt said to himself as he clenched and unclenched his gauntlet hand. We, re not dead yet. He glanced at the skin display. The contact resolved into a clearer image definitely a UNSC cryopod. It tumbled, and he saw that what he thought was a single pod was, in fact, three of them, affixed side by side. Three possible survivors out of the Pillar of Autumn's total complement of hundreds. He wished there were more. He wished Captain Keyes were here. In Matt's opinion, Keyes had been the most brilliant spatial tactician he had ever encountered. But even the captain would have thought twice about approaching seven Covenant warships in a single longsword. Matt risked feeding more ship's power to Cortana's systems. If they were going to make it through this, they needed her and Crystal as effective as possible. New contact, Cortana said, interrupting his thoughts. I think it is, anyway. Whatever it is, it's stuck onto a chunk of rock, half a kilometer in diameter. Damn, it just rotated out of my view. On the display, Cortana replayed a partial silhouette of an oddly angled shape on the surface of the rock. She highlighted its contours, rotated the polygon, and overlaid this onto a schematic of a pelican dropship. Match with a tolerance of 58%, she said. They might have parked there to avoid detection, as you suggested. Matt thought he detected a hint of irritation in her voice as if she resented him for thinking of something she had not. Or, Cortana continued, more likely, the craft merely crashed there. I don't think so. John pointed at the display. The position of that wing indicates its nose out, ready for takeoff. If it had crash landed, it would be faced the other way. Another Covenant cruiser moved toward this new ship. Coming about, you too, Cortana told them. Brace yourselves, and then get ready to retrieve the pods. I'll get the pods, Chief, Matt said. Roger that. Matt unsnapped his harness and drifted aft. He grabbed a tether and clipped one end to his suit, the other to the bulkhead of the longsword. He felt the maneuvering thrusters fire, and the ship rotated 180 degrees. Decompression in three seconds, Cortana said. Matt opened the empty weapons locker and climbed partially inside. He braced himself. Cortana dropped the aft hatch, and the inside of the ship exploded out. Matt slammed into the door of the locker, denting the centimeter-thick titanium A. He climbed out and Crystal overlaid a blue arrow-shaped NAV point on his heads-up display, indicating the location of the drifting cryopods. Matt jumped out of the long sword. He floated through space. He was only 30 meters from the pods, but if he'd guessed wrong about his trajectory and missed the target, he wouldn't get a second chance. By the time he reeled himself back to the long sword and tried again, those Covenant ships were certain to kill them all. Matt stretched his arms and hands toward the cylinders. 20 meters to go. His approach was off. He shifted his left knee closer to his chest and started a slow tumble. 10 meters. His upper body rotated down relative to the pods. If he spun just right as he passed the cryotubes, it would give him enough extra reach to make contact. He hoped. He rotated back almost standing up now. Three meters. He stretched his arms until the elbow joints creaked and popped. He stretched his hands, willed his fingers to elongate. His fingertips brushed against the smooth surface of the leading cryopod. It slid off and over and touched the second pod. He flexed and failed to grab hold. He scratched the surface of the third and final pod, his middle finger hooked on the frame. His body swung inward, curled, and landed on the pod. He quickly looped his tether through the frame, secured himself to it, and pulled their combined mass back to the longsword. Hurry, Commander, Crystal said over the comm. We've got trouble. Matt saw exactly what the trouble was the engines of two Covenant cruisers flared electric blue as they accelerated toward the longsword. 
The plasma and laser weapons along their hulls warmed from red to orange as they ready to fire. He pulled as fast as he could, making minor adjustments with the muscles in his braced legs so his motions didn't send them into a tumble in the zero gravity. The longsword was a sitting duck for those Covenant cruisers. Cortana couldn't fire the engines until he got on board. Even if he and the pods survived the thruster wash, any evasive maneuver Cortana made would snap him and his cargo like the end of a whip. The Covenant ships were within firing range, lined up perfectly to destroy the longsword. Three missiles streaked through space, impacting on the starboard side of the lead Covenant ship. The explosion splashed harmlessly across its shield, which shimmered silver as it dissipated the energy. Matt turned his head and saw the pelican blast off from the asteroid where it had been hiding. It rocketed on a perpendicular course toward the two Covenant ships. The cruisers came about, apparently more interested in hunting live prey than the motionless longsword. Matt gave one final yank on the tether. He and the pods flew through the aft hatch and crashed into the deck of the longsword. Cortana immediately sealed the hatch and fired the engines. Author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen. Have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 57 Rendezvous Author's note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again, I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 57 Rendezvous Location Uncharted System, Aboard Long Sword Fighter, Halo Debris Field September 22, 2552, 1655 hours Matt climbed into the Systemop's seat just as they accelerated and turned toward the cruisers. He activated the weapon systems. The two Covenant cruisers powered their engines and pursued the Pelican, but it had entered a dense region of the debris field, dodged a chunk of metal and rock, dived over an ice ball and charged through clouds of shattered alien metal. The Covenant fired energy blasts impacted on the debris and missed the Pelican. Whoever's piloting that Pelican knows their stuff, Cortana said. We owe them a favor. Matt fired the longsword's guns, and tiny silver dots punctuated the trailing Covenant cruiser's shields. Let's settle that debt. You realize, Crystal said, that we really can't damage those Covenant ships. The cruiser slowed and turned toward them. We'll see about that. Get me a firing solution for the missiles. I want them to target their plasma turrets just before they fire, Matt said. They have to drop a section of their shields for a fraction of a second. Working, Cortana replied. Without precise data, However, I'll have to base my calculations on several assumptions. A string of mathematics appeared on the weapons ops panel. Give me fire control. Matt punched the auto override on the firing systems. It's yours, he said. The Covenant cruiser's plasma turrets turned to track them as the ship came to bear. They warmed, and Cortana fired all the longsword's ASGM-10 missiles. White vapor trails snaked toward the target. Let's move, John said. The longsword accelerated into the debris field following the pelican's path. The aft camera displayed the missiles racing to their target. Anti-missile laser fire stabbed through space, and three of the missiles exploded into red fireballs. The Covenant's plasma turret glowed white hot, about to fire, when the last missile impacted. The explosion smeared across the hull. At first, Matt thought it had hit the shield, but then he saw that the explosion was inside the shimmering envelope of energy. The plasma turrets fired, their energy was immediately absorbed into the cloud of dust and vapor around the ship. Dull red plasma ballooned inside the cruiser's shield, obscuring its sensors. The ship listed to port, momentarily blind. That should keep them busy for a while, Crystal said. The long sword arced under a half-kilometer wide metal plate, just as a plasma bolt impacted and boiled the surface, sending the plate sputtering and spinning through space. Or not, Cortana muttered. Better let me drive. The autopilot engaged and the controls jerked out of John's hand. The longsword's afterburners kicked in, and it accelerated toward a field of tumbling rocks. Cortana rolled and pitched, keeping the hull mere meters from the jagged surfaces. Matt hung onto the seat with one hand and pulled his harness tight with the other. He moved the scanner display to the center view screen and saw the two nearest Covenant cruisers vectored toward his and the Pelican's position. The two UNSC ships might evade and dodge through the debris field for a few minutes, but soon their fuel would be exhausted, and the Covenant would move in for the kill. And where could they really run to, anyway? Neither ship had Shafujikawa Translite engines, so they were stuck in the system and the Covenant knew it. They could afford to take their time and play with their prey before they pounced. John performed a sweep scan of the system looking for something, 
anything to give him a tactical advantage. No, thinking of tactics was going to get him killed. There was no tactical advantage he could gain that would give them a victory in this mismatch. He had to change the rules, change his strategy. John scanned the massive Covenant flagship, that was the key. That's how they'd be able to turn the tables on the enemy. John keyed the comm system and hailed the Pelican. This is Master Chief SPARTAN117. Recognition code Tango Alpha 340. Copy. This is Commander SPARTAN038. Recognition code Whiskey Foxtrot 360. Copy, Matt said. Copy, a woman's voice answered. Warrant Officer Pulaski here. Other voices argued in the background. Damn good to hear you, Chief, Commander. Pulaski, proceed at maximum burn to this position. John dropped a NAV point on the display directly on the Covenant flagship. He included an exit vector indicating a rough course. There was silence over the comm. Copy, Pulaski. Matt asked. I copy. Plotting course now, Commander. The voices arguing in the background became loud and more strained. I hope you know what you're doing. Pulaski out. The channel snapped off. Get us there, Cortana, Matt said, tapping the NAV point. As fast as you can make this thing fly. The long sword rolled right and pitched toward the moon, basis. Matt's safety harness groaned as G-forces increased. You two do know what you're doing. Crystal asked. I mean, we're headed straight toward the largest and most dangerous Covenant ship in this system. I assume this is part of some daring and brutally simplistic plan you've cooked up. Yes, Matt replied. Oh, good. Hang on, Cortana said. The long sword rolled to port and dived under a rock. An explosion detonated aft of the ship. Looks like your plan has gotten their attention. I'm reading all six Covenant cruisers moving to overtake us at flank speed. And the Pelican? John asked. Still there, Cortana reported, taking heavy fire, but on a trajectory to the NAV point, moving slower than us, of course. Adjust our speed so we arrive at the same time, Matt said. When we're in range for a secure system link, let us know. The longsword decelerated, it shuddered to starboard and then to port, and laser fire flashed along either side. You two never told us, Crystal said in a voice that was equal parts irritation and calm indifference, precisely what your plan is. Something Captain Keys would approve of. Matt summoned the navigation console on the main display. If we survive long enough, I want a course from here. John tapped the NAV point over the flagship, into the gravity well of basis to slingshot us around. Done, Cortana replied. I still, hey, they've stopped firing. Matt tapped the aft camera. The six cruisers continued their pursuit, but the tips of their weapons cooled as they powered down. We were counting on this. We're on the same line of fire as their flagship. They won't shoot. Pelican now 1200 kilometers and closing. Crystal said suddenly. Within range for system link. John hailed the Pelican. Pulaski, release your controls. We're taking over. Chief, establish an encrypted system link. Acknowledge. A long pause. Then, Roger. Cortana's hologram appeared on the tiny protection pad. She appeared to listen intently for a moment, and then declared, got them. Synchronize our courses, Cortana, John said. Put us right on top of the Pelican. Maneuvering to intercept the Pelican. 500 kilometers to the flagship. Prepare to alter our course, Cortana, as we pass the flagship, Matt said. Also get ready to direct all scanners at the flagship if we pass. If? Crystal asked. The flagship's turrets turned to bear on the longsword and Pelican. They glowed like angry eyes in the dark. 300 kilometers, Cortana said. Light sparkled along the length of the Covenant craft as it prepared to fire, dull red plasma gathered, three torpedoes extruded and raced toward them. Evasive, Matt said. Cortana banked hard to port, starboard, and then hit the afterburners and pulled up. Streaks of plasma brushed close to the hulls of the long sword and pelican, then were gone behind them. The Spartans had hoped for this their extreme oblique approach angle combined with their speed made them hard to hit, even for the notoriously accurate Covenant plasma weapons. 10 kilometers, Cortana announced. Scanning in burst mode. They flashed over the 3 kilometer long ship in the blink of an eye. Matt saw gun turrets straining to track their approach. The alien craft had sleek lines, relatively flat top to bottom, but it curved from stem to stern into three distinct bulb sections. Along its hull ran glowing blue conduits of superheated plasma. Surrounding the ship was a faint shimmer of silver energy shields. Matt eased back into his seat. 
He hadn't realized that he'd been holding his breath, and he exhaled. Good, John said. Very good, Matt agreed. Burning into a high slingshot orbit, Cortana announced. The longsword's engines rumbled. The acceleration played hell with the chief's inner ear. He wasn't certain for a moment which way was up. Bring us closer to the pelican, Matt said. Right on top. Give us a hard dock on its top access hatch. Cortana set her hands on her hips and frowned. Readjusting burn parameters. But you know a linked ship configuration during an orbital burn is not stable. We won't be linked long, Matt said and slipped out of his harness and John did the same. John drifted aft, pulled himself down to the floor and opened the longsword's access hatch. Green lights on the intervening pressure door winked on in succession. He removed the safeties and popped the seal. A hand reached up from the other side. John pulled the person through. The shock only lasted a moment. John's reflexes kicked in, he grabbed a handful of the man's uniform, kicked the hatch shut, and propelled both of them against the hull. With a lightning-quick motion, he drew the newcomer's pistol and aimed it squarely at the man's forehead. Chief, Matt said. What the hell are you doing? You were dead, John said to the newcomer. I saw you die. On Jenkins's mission record, the flood got you. The black man smiled a set of perfect white teeth. The flood. Hell, chief, it'll take more than that pack of walking alien horror show freaks to take out Sergeant A. J. Johnson. Author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen. Have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 58 Taking Charge Author's note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again, I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 58 Taking Charge Location Uncharted System Aboard Long Sword Fighter Halo Debris Field September 22, 2552 1710 hours Matt held on to the ship's frame with one hand so he wouldn't float away in zero G. With his other hand, he aimed his assault rifle directly at Johnson's head. After he heard what John had said, Matt was suspicious of Johnson and if the sergeant was infected by the flood. The sergeant's smile faded, but there was not a trace of fear in his dark eyes. He snorted a laugh. I get it you think I'm infected. Well, I'm not. This, he patted his chest, is 100% grade A marine, and nothing else. The chief eased his stance but didn't lower the gun. Explain how that's possible. They got us all right, those little mushroom-shaped infectious bastards, Johnson said. They ambushed me, Jenkins, and Keys. He paused at the captain's name, then shook his head and went on. They swarmed all over us. Jenkins and Keys were taken, but I guess I didn't taste too good. The flood doesn't taste anything, Cortana interjected. The infection forms rewrite a victim's cellular structure and convert him into a combat form, then later a carrier form, an incubator for more infection forms. Based on what we've seen, they certainly don't just decide to pass up a victim. The sergeant shrugged. He fished into his pocket, found the remaining stub of a chewed cigar, and stuck it in the corner of his mouth. Well, I've seen different. They passed me up like I was undercooked spinach at a turkey dinner. Crystal, Matt asked. Is it possible? It's possible. She carefully replied. But it's also highly unlikely. She paused for two heartbeats, and then added, According to the readings from the sergeant's biomonitors, his story checks out. I can't be 100% positive until he's been cleared in a medical suite, but preliminary findings indicate that he is clean of any flood parasitic infection. He's obviously not a mindless, half-naked alien killing machine. All right. The chief clicked the pistol's safety to on then flipped the pistol around and handed it back to the sergeant, grip first. But we're having you checked inside and out the first chance we get, Matt said as he also lowered his weapon. We can't risk letting the flood infection spread. I hear you, Commander. Looking forward to those Navy nurses. Now, the sergeant pushed off the hull and drifted toward the hatch. Let's get the rest of the crew on board. He hesitated by the cryotubes. I see you already picked up a few stragglers. They'll have to wait, Matt said. It'll take half an hour to thaw them out without risking hypothermic shock. We don't have that much time left before we re-engage the Covenant. Re-engage, the sergeant said. Savoring the word, he smiled. Good. For a second I thought we were running away from a perfectly good fight. The sergeant opened the hatch to the pelican. The barrel of an MA-5B assault rifle extended through the opening. The sergeant reached down and pulled it up. 
A Marine Corporal drifted through the hatch. The name stitched on his uniform read Locklear. He was tanned, shaved bald, and had a wild look in his clear blue eyes. He retrieved his gun from the sergeant and swept the interior with the point of his weapon. Clear he shouted back down into the pelican. At ease, Corporal, Matt said. The Corporal's eyes finally locked onto Matt and then the chief. He shook his head in disbelief. Spartans, he muttered. Figures. Out of the friggin' frying pan. Matt spotted the Marine's shoulder patch the gold comet insignia of the orbital drop shock troops. The ODSD, more colorfully known as Helljumpers, were notorious for their tenacity in a fight. Locklear must have been one of Major Silva's boys, which explained the young Marine's general hostility. Silva was ODSD to the bone, and during the action on Halo had been decidedly negative about the Spartanias in general, and Matt in particular. Another man gripped the edge of the hatch and pulled himself up. He had a plasma pistol strapped to his side and wore a crisp black uniform. His red hair was neatly slicked back, and his eyes took in the Spartans without obvious surprise. He wore the black enameled bars of a first lieutenant. Sir the chief snapped off a crisp salute. Adjusting burn and angle, Cortana announced. The long sword and pelican tilted relative to the moon, basis, on the view screen. That should give you a little more than one G on the deck. The lieutenant settled to the floor and lazily returned the salute. I'm Haverson, he said. He looked John over with interest. You are the Master Chief, Spartan 117. Yes, sir, John said. Haverson turned to Matt. And you are the Commander, Spartan 038. Yes, sir. Matt was surprised. Most people, even experienced officers, had difficulty distinguishing one Spartan from another. How had this young officer so quickly identified him? Matt saw the round insignia on the man's shoulder, the black and silver eagle wings over a trio of stars. Inscribed above the eagle wings were the Latin words Semper Vigilance, Ever Vigilant. Haverson was with the Office of Naval Intelligence. Good, Haverson said. He glanced quickly at Locklear and Johnson. With you two, Spartans, we might have a chance. He reached into the hatch and pulled another person onto the longsword. This last person was a woman, and she wore the flight suit of a pilot. Her dirty blonde hair was tucked into a cap. She saluted the Spartans. Petty Warrant Officer Pulaski, requesting permission to come aboard, Master Chief, Commander. Granted, Matt said and returned her salute. John did the same. Stenciled onto her coveralls was a flaming fist over a red bullseye, the insignia of the 23rd Naval Air Squadron. Although Matt had never met Pulaski, she was from the same chalk as Captain Carol Raleigh, callsign Fohammer. If Pulaski was anything like Fohammer, she would be a skilled and fearless pilot. John opened a private comm channel to Matt and said, Take command. You're the highest ranking officer here. You sure about that chief? Yes, John replied. Even after what happened back on Reach, I still trust you. Matt let out a quick breath. Okay, I'll do it. So what's the story? Locklear demanded. We got something to shoot here. At ease, Marine, the sergeant growled. Use that stuffing between your ears for something besides keeping your helmet on. Notice we're not floating. Feel those G-forces. This ship is in a slingshot orbit. We're coming around the moon for another crack at the Covenant. That's correct, Matt said after he terminated the private comm channel between him and John. Our first priority should be to escape, Haverson said, and his thin brows knitted in frustration, not to blindly engage the Covenant. We have valuable intelligence on the enemy, and on Halo. Our first priority should be to reach UNS controlled space. That was our intention, sir, the chief replied. But neither this longsword nor your pelican is equipped with Shafujikawa engines. Without a jump to slip space, it would take years to return. Haverson sighed. That does limit our options, doesn't it? He turned his back to the Spartans and paced, deep in thought. Matt respected the chain of command, which meant that he had to obey Lieutenant Haverson. But, officer or not, Matt had never liked it when people turned their backs to him. And he certainly didn't like the way Haverson assumed he was in charge. Matt had already gotten his orders, and he intended to follow them, whether or not Haverson approved. Pardon me, sir, the chief said. I must point out that while you are the ranking officer, we are on a classified mission of the highest priority. Our orders come directly from high command. Meaning. Meaning, Matt continued, we and more specifically, I have tactical command of this crew, and these ships, and you. Sir. Haverson turned, his expression dark. The lieutenant's mouth opened as if he were going to say something. He closed his mouth and looked Matt over. 
A faint smile flickered over his thin lips. Of course. I am well aware of your mission, Commander. I'll do anything I can to assist. The lieutenant knew about the Spartans' original mission to capture a Covenant prophet. What was an ONI officer doing here anyway? So what's the plan? Locklear asked. Slingshot orbit, then what? We just going to talk all day, Commander. No, Matt replied. Matt didn't spare John a glance. Matt knew he could count on him 100. He glanced at Pulaski and the sergeant. He could count on her, and though he was suspicious of exactly how Sergeant Johnson had avoided falling to the flood, he was willing to give the men the benefit of the doubt. Haverson. Matt wouldn't trust him, but the men knew what was at stake, and he wouldn't interfere. Probably. Locklear was another story, though. The ODST was coiled and ready to pounce, or come apart like an antipersonnel mine. Some men broke under pressure and wouldn't fight. Some snapped and disregarded their own and their team's safety for blind revenge. Add that to the Helljumper's fierce pride and one had a volatile mix. Matt had to establish his authority over the men. Get onto the Pelican, Matt told him. We only have a few minutes while we're on the far side of this moon. Grab anything we can use extra weapons, ammunition, grenades. Keep linked up to my comm so you can hear the briefing. Locklear stood there, glared into Matt's faceplate, and tensed. Sergeant Johnson opened his mouth, but Matt made a subtle cutting gesture with his hand. The sergeant kept whatever he had to say to himself. Matt took a step closer to Locklear. Was my order unclear, Corporal? Locklear swallowed. The blue fire in his eyes dulled and he looked away. No. His body slumped and he shouldered his rifle, accepting, for now, Matt's authority. I'm on it, Commander. He went to the hatch and dropped into the pelican. To say this team was mismatched for a high-risk insertion op was an understatement. So how do we get a Shafujikawa drive? Pulaski asked. We don't, Matt replied. But we go after the next best thing. He moved to the ops console and tapped the display. The scan of the Covenant flagship appeared on the view screen. This is our objective. Haverson frowned. Commander, if we approach that ship will be blown out of the sky before we can even think about engaging them. Normally, yes, he replied. But we're going to rig the Pelican as a fire ship, we load it with moray mines and send it out ahead of us. We'll have to remote pilot the Pelican, but it can be accelerated past the point where a crew would black out. It'll draw enemy fire, drop a few mines, and let us slip by. Pulaski's expression hardened into a frown. They're a problem, warrant officer. No, commander. I just hate to lose a good ship. That bird got us off Halo in one piece. He understood. Pilots got attached to their ships. They gave them names and human personalities. Matt, however, never fell into that trap. He had long ago learned that any equipment was expendable. Except, maybe, Crystal or in John's case, Cortana. Southwest we get close to the flagship, Haverson said and crossed his arms over his chest. Are we going nose to nose with a ship with a thousand times our firepower? Or are you planning another flyby? Neither. Matt pointed to the flagship's fighter launch bay. That's our LZ. Pulaski squinted at the comparatively tiny opening in the belly of the flagship. That's a hell of a window to hit coming in this fast, but, she bit her lower lip, calculating, technically possible in a longsword. They'll launch Seraph fighters to engage the Pelican and the longsword, the chief said, and to do that, they'll have to drop that section of their shields. We get in, neutralize the crew, and we have a ship with slip space capability. Rock and roll Locklear yelled over the comm. Penetrate and annihilate. Sergeant Johnson chewed on his cigar as he considered the plan. No one has ever captured a Covenant ship, Haverson whispered. The few times we've had one of them beaten and in a position to surrender, they've self-destructed. There's no choice, the chief said as he came to Matt's defense. He looked over Pulaski, Johnson, and finally Haverson. Unless anyone has a better plan. They were silent. Anything to add, Cortana? Matt asked. Our exit orbit burn leaves us low on fuel and traveling at high velocity on an intercept course with the flagship. There are overlapping fields of enemy fire on our approach vector. We have to decelerate and dodge simultaneously. That will be tricky. Pulaski will be on that. Matt turned to her. Pilot a long sword. Pulaski slowly nodded, and there was a gleam in her green eyes that hadn't been there a second ago. It's been a while, but yes, Commander. I am 110% on it. She moved to the pilot's seat and strapped herself in. With all due respect to Miss Pulaski's skill, Cortana said, allow me to point out that I process information a million times faster and I need you to link with the flagship's internship bat Lennett, Matt cut in. 
When we're close you'll need to shut down its weapons. Jam its communications. Sending an unescorted lady ahead to do your dirty work. Cortana sighed. I suppose I'm the only one who can. Lieutenant Haberson, Matt said, I'll need you to program the Moray mines to release and attach onto the Pelican before we exit this orbit. Set half for detonation on impact. Program the rest to detach and track any enemy ship on our approach. Haverson nodded and settled into the op station next to Pulaski. Author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen. Have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 59 Explosive Entrance Author's note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again, I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 59 Explosive Entrance Location Uncharted System Aboard Long Sword Fighter Halo Debris Field September 22, 2552 1730 hours Two crates and a duffel pushed through the open access tunnel to the Pelican. Lockley emerged from the opening and sealed the hatch. That's it, Commander, he said. A he pistol, two extra MA5 BS, one M90 close assault shotgun, and a crate or so of frag grenades. About a dozen clips for the rifles, only a few shells for the shotgun, though. Matt took four grenades and a half dozen clips for his assault rifle. John did the same. Matt ejected his weapon's nearly spent magazine and slapped a full one into place with a satisfying clack. The sergeant grabbed ammo, an MA-5B, and three grenades. Orbital exit burn in ten seconds, Pulaski said. Dog the rest of that, Matt told Locklear. And brace yourself. Locklear secured the collection of weapons and ordnance in a duffel bag, looped it around his neck, and then found a handhold. Sergeant Johnson leaned against the cryopods. The Spartans grabbed the bulkhead. Releasing Pelican, Pulaski said. There was a thump from beneath the hull. Pelican away. Pelican autopilot programmed, Cortana said. Moray mines attached and armed, Haverson added. Pulaski said, exit burn in three, two, one. Burn. The longsword's engine roared to life, the hull creaked with stress, and everyone leaned against the acceleration. The Pelican pulled ahead, rounded the horizon of the moon first, and arched back into the debris field. As the longsword followed, the light struck the surface of the moon just right and Matt saw meteors rain upon the planetoid, leaving craters and tiny puffs of dust as they impacted. Pulaski snapped the display port camera centered on the Covenant cruisers. They were waiting for us, she cried. Evasive maneuvers. The Pelican rolled to starboard. Accelerating to the flagship. The flagship was close. Too close. It must have anticipated their orbital trajectory. But it hadn't counted on them turning straight toward it. If they hadn't, the flagship would have been in a perfect perpendicular firing position. Pelican now 200 kilometers in the lead, Pulaski said. The bulky craft drew fire from the cruisers. Smoke trailed from its hull, and bits of the empty ship were vaporized. Mines away, Haverson announced. Plugging coordinates and trajectories into NAV, Pulaski. Don't run them over. Roger, she said. Hang on, we're going in. I hate this crap, Locklear muttered. Ships shooting each other, fire so thick you could walk on it to the LZ, and me sitting here not able to do a damn thing but hang on and wonder when I'm going to get blown up. Matt said nothing, but he agreed. Despite the ODSD's foul disposition, he shared his uneasiness with space combat. Amen, Sergeant Johnson added. Now shut up and let the lady drive. He removed a mission record unit from his pocket and inserted a chip. The screen blanked, a rhythmic cacophony blasted from its single tiny speaker. Matt recognized the sound as flip music, a descendant of some century-sold noise called metal. The Sarge had peculiar tastes, to say the least. Just shoot me now, Sarge, Locklear protested, and get it over with. Don't torture me with that crap first. Suck it up, Marine. This is a classic. So's a mercy killing. Pulaski continued to evade, and the long sword rolled and jinked port and starboard. She sent the ship into a double-barrel roll to dodge a plasma torpedo fired from the flagship. Show off, Crystal muttered in Matt's helmet speaker. Connecting to the Covenant Batlinet, Cortana announced over the ship comm. Accessing their weapon systems. Stand by. Ahead, the Pelican intercepted a second torpedo and burst into flames, vaporized, and smeared across the night as a cloud of sparkling ionized metal. The flagship appeared on the forward view screen, no larger than a dinner plate. No more time to play around, Pulaski muttered. 
She hit the afterburners and rocketed toward the flagship. The sudden acceleration sent Matt, John, and Sergeant Johnson bouncing to the aft of the longsword. Locklear still hung on to the frame, now nearly horizontal. There is now insufficient distance to decelerate and make a soft landing inside the flagship launch bay, Cortana warned. Really? Pulaski replied, irritated. No wonder they call you smart AIs. She tugged her cap lower over her eyes. I'll do the flying. You concentrate on getting those weapons offline. They're launching fighters, Haverson warned. On the view screen, the Covenant flagship now filled half the display, and six Seraph fighters emerged from the belly of the massive ship. I've still got active signals from 20 of the Moray mines. Their momentum is carrying them within range. Tracking, locked on, maneuvering. Tiny puffs of fire overlapped the teardrop-shaped Seraph fighters as they exploded. Haverson laughed. Bull say yeah. Forward weapon systems and shields are disabled, Cortana said. The doors are open, Pulaski murmured. We're invited in. It'd be damn impolite to say no. The flagship filled the display. Collision imminent, Cortana warned. Sergeant Johnson got to his feet. Matt knew better and stayed where he was on the deck. He grabbed onto the sergeant's leg. John also stayed where he was. Pulaski cut the engines and hit the maneuvering thrusters. The long sword spun 180 degrees. With the ship now pointed backward, she pushed the throttle to maximum, and the engines thundered in full overload. The hull strained against the sudden reverse deceleration. Matt hung onto the floor with one hand. With the other, he held onto the sergeant and kept him from flying across the ship. Pulaski changed the view screen to a split view, fore and aft. She maneuvered with the ship's thrusters, adjusting their approach to the launch bay opening. On screen the small opening grew larger alarmingly fast. Hang on, hang on. The engines whined and the ship slowed, but it wasn't going to be enough. They entered the launch bay at 300 meters per second. Flames from the longsword's engines washed over grunt technicians as they vainly attempted to scramble out of the way. Their methane-filled atmosphere tanks popped like firecrackers. Pulaski cut power. The ship slammed into the wall. Matt, John, Sergeant Johnson, and Locklear crashed into the pilot and op seats in a heap. Grunts approached the ship with plasma pistols drawn, the weapons glowing green as the aliens overcharged them. Covenant engineers struggled to put out fires and repair burst conduits. Shield re-energizing in place over the launch bay, Cortana announced. External atmosphere stabilizing. Please feel free to get up and move around the cabin. Locklear scrambled to his feet. Yeah he hooped. The young hell jumper yanked his MA-5B's charging lever and racked around into the chamber. Let's rock. Good work, people, Matt said, standing. He readied his own assault rifle. But that was just the easy part. Author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen. Have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 60 on enemy soil. Authors note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again, I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 60 on Enemy Soil Location Uncharted System Aboard Unidentified Covenant Flagship Halo Debris Field September 22, 2552 1,750 hours Plasma bolts impacted on the longsword's hull and splashed across the windshield. The packets of glowing energy sizzled across the cockpit and etched cloudy, molten trails into the glass. A legion of grunts hunkered behind docked seraph fighters and fuel pods. Some darted in and out of cover and fired ghostly green blobs of plasma at the longsword. I got M, Pulaski said and flipped a switch. The longsword's landing gear deployed and raised the craft a meter off the floor. Guns clear, Pulaski announced. Bye, boys. She brought up a targeting reticle and swept it around the bay. A hail of 120 mm rounds tore through the grunt's cover. Fuel pods and unshielded fighters detonated and sent metal fragments and alien soldiers hurtling to the deck. The air exploded into roiling flame, which billowed toward the ceiling and then subsided. Pools of burning fuel and the charred bodies of grunts and covenant engineers littered the launch bay. Fire suppression system activating, Crystal said. Jets of gray mist blew down from above. The fires intensified for a moment, then guttered and went out. Is there atmosphere in the bay? John asked. Scanning, Cortana replied. Traces of ash, some contamination from the melted ship holes, and a lot of smoke, but the air in the bay is breathable. Good, Matt said. He turned to the others. We're going in. 
I'll lead. Chief, Locklear, you're up with me. Sergeant, you've got the rear. You'll need to take me, too, Cortana said. I've pulled a schematic of this ship to navigate, but the engineering controls have been manually locked down. I'll need direct access to the ship's command data systems. Why would we need you when we already have Crystal? Pulaski asked Cortana. Crystal can help with navigation. You'll need me to get direct access to the ship's command data systems, Cortana answered. Matt hesitated for a second. We'll have Crystal with us, but having Cortana wouldn't hurt. Grab her chief. Copy that, John said as he turned to the computer terminal. Stand by, John said. He punched a key on the computer terminal and dumped Cortana to a data chip. A moment later the terminal pulsed green. He removed the chip and slotted it in the back of his helmet. After John slotted Cortana into his helmet, Matt nodded at Locklear and Johnson. Let's go. Sergeant Johnson hit the door release, and the side hatch slid open. Locklear shouldered his rifle and poured fire through the opening. A pair of grunts who had crouched near the longsword to protect themselves from the fire flew backward onto the deck. Phosphorescent blood pooled beneath their prone forms. Matt dived through the open hatch and rolled to his feet. His motion tracker picked up three targets to his side. He whirled about and saw a trio of Covenant engineers. He removed his finger from the weapon's trigger. Engineers were no threat. The odd, meter-high creatures hovered above the deck, using bladders of some lighter-than-air gas produced by their bodies. Their tentacles and feelers probed a tangle of fuel lines, quickly repairing the pipes and pumps. Funny that there's no welcoming committee yet, Crystal whispered. Cortana and I looked over this ship's personnel roster 3,000 Covenant, mostly engineers. There's a light company of grunts and only a hundred elites. Only a hundred, Matt muttered. That's just great, John murmured. Matt waved his team forward toward a heavy door at the back of the launch bay. The air was full of smoke and fire-suppressing mist, which reduced visibility to a dozen meters. The rattle of assault rifle fire echoed through the bay. Matt spun to his right and brought his own rifle to bear. Locklear stood over the twitching corpses of the engineers. He fired another burst into the fallen aliens. Don't waste your ammunition, Corporal, the sergeant said. They may be ugly, but they're harmless. They're harmless now, Sarge, Locklear replied. He wiped a spatter of alien blood from his cheek and smirked. Matt tended to agree with Locklear's threat analysis of the Covenant when in doubt, kill. Still, he found the young Marine's actions unnecessary and a little sloppy. The architecture of the Covenant fighter bay was similar to the interior of the other Covenant ship he and John had recently been inside, the truth and reconciliation. Low indirect lights illuminated the dark purple walls. The alien metal appeared to be stenciled with odd, faintly luminescent geometric patterns that overlapped each other. The ceiling was vaulted and unnecessarily high, maybe 10 meters. In contrast to a human ship, it was a waste of space. Matt spotted a large door at the back of the bay. The door was a distorted hexagonal shape and large enough that the entire team could enter at the same time, not that he'd ever be foolish enough to take up such a formation in hostile territory. The door had four sections that, when keyed to open, would silently slide away from the center. That will take us to the main corridor, Crystal said. And from there, to the bridge. Matt waved Locklear to the right side of the door, Sergeant Johnson to the left, and John to stay with him. Lieutenant Haberson, he called out, you're our rear guard. Pulaski hit the door controls. Hand signals from now on. Haverson tossed an ironic salute to Matt but tightened his grip on his weapon and scanned the bay. Pulaski moved forward and crouched by the panel in the middle of the door. She turned her cap around and leaned closer, then looked back to Matt and gave him a thumbs up. He raised his rifle and nodded, giving her the go-ahead to breach the door. She reached for the controls. Before she touched them, though, the door slid apart. Standing on the opposite side were five elites two stood shielded by either edge of the door, a third stood centered in the corridor, plasma rifle leveled at Matt, behind it. The fourth elite covered the rear of their formation, and one last elite crouched in front of the door control panel, nose to nose with Pulaski. Matt fired two bursts directly over Pulaski's head. His first shot struck the elite in the middle of the corridor. His second burst hit the elite standing rear guard. The alien warriors hadn't activated their shields, and 7.62 mm rounds punctured their armor. The pair of elites dropped to the deck. Their comrades on either side of the door howled and attacked. The whine of plasma rifle fire echoed through the bay as blue-white energy bolts crashed into Matt's own shields. His shield dropped away, and the insistent drone of a warning indicator pulsed in his helmet. 
His vision clouded from the flare of energy weapon discharges, and he struggled to draw a bead on the elite in front of Pulaski. It was no good, he had no clear shot. The elite drew a plasma pistol. Pulaski drew her own sidearm. She was faster, or luckier. Her pistol cleared its holster, she snapped it up and fired. The pistol boomed as a shot took the elite right in the center of its elongated helmet. The elite's own shot went wide and seared into the deck behind Pulaski. Pulaski emptied her clip into the alien's face. A pair of rounds rocked the alien back. Its shields faded, and the remaining rounds tore through armor and bone. It fell on its back, twitched twice, and died. Johnson and Locklear unleashed a hellish crossfire into the corridor and made short work of the remaining elites as Pulaski hugged the deck plates. Now that's what I'm talking about, Johnson crowed. An Anestogod turkey shoot. Ten meters down the passage a dozen more elites rounded a corner. Oho, Locklear muttered. Sergeant, Matt barked. Door control chief cover me. Matt moved to Pulaski's position in two quick strides, grabbed her by her collar, and dragged her out of the line of fire. Plasma bolts singed the air where she'd been. He dropped her, primed a grenade, and tossed it toward the rushing elites. The sergeant fired his assault rifle at the door controls, they exploded in a shower of sparks, and the doors slammed shut. A dull thump echoed behind the thick metal, then an eerie silence descended on the bay. Pulaski struggled to her feet and fed a fresh clip into her pistol. Her hands shook. Crystal, Matt said. We need an alternate route to the bridge. A blue arrow flashed on his heads-up display. Matt turned and spotted a hatch to his right. He pointed to the hatch and signaled his team to move, then ran to the hatch and touched the control panel. The small door slid open to reveal a narrow corridor beyond, snaking into the darkness. He didn't like it. The corridor was too dark and too narrow, a perfect place for an ambush. He briefly considered heading back to the primary bay door but abandoned that idea. Smoke and sparks poured from the door seams as the Covenant forces on the other side tried to burn their way through. Matt clicked on his low-light vision filters, and the darkness washed away into a grainy flood of fluorescent green. No contacts. He paused to let his shields recharge, then dropped into a low crouch. He brought his rifle to bear and crept into die corridor. The interior of the passage narrowed, and its smooth purple surface darkened. Matt had to turn sideways to pass through. This looks like a service corridor for their engineers, Crystal said. Their elite warriors will have a tough time following us. Matt grunted an acknowledgement as he eased his way through. There was a scraping sound and a flash of sparks as his energy shield brushed the wall. It was too tight a fit. He powered down the shields, which left him just enough room to squeeze through. John followed behind Matt, Locklear followed behind him, then Pulaski, the sergeant, and finally Haberson. Matt pointed at Haverson, then at the door. The lieutenant frowned, then nodded. Haverson closed the hatch and ripped out the circuitry for the control mechanism. There had been dozens of engineers in the launch bay, and there were enough on the ship to merit their own access tunnel. Matt hadn't seen anything like this on the truth and reconciliation. In fact, he hadn't seen a single engineer on that ship. What made this ship different? It was armed like a ship of war, yet had the support staff of a refit vessel. Stop here. Cortana said. Matt halted and killed his external speakers so he could speak freely and he switched to Blue Team's comm channel. Problem. He asked Cortana. No. A lucky break, maybe. Look to your left and down 20 centimeters. Matt squinted and noticed that a portion of the wall extruded into a circular opening no larger than the tip of his thumb. That's a data port, or what passes for one with the Covenant engineers. I'm picking up handshake signals in shortwave and infrared from it. Remove me and slot me in chief. Are you sure? John asked. I can't do much good in there with you. Once I'm directly in contact with the ship's bat Lennet, however, I can infiltrate and take over their systems. You'll still need to get to the bridge and manually give me access to their engineering systems. In the meantime, I may be able to control secondary systems and buy you some time. If you're sure, Matt said. When have I not been sure? She snapped. Good point, John said. Go ahead and slot her in chief, Matt said. John nodded and slotted Cortana's chip into the Covenant data port. Locklear's face rippled with disgust, and he whispered, You couldn't pay me to stick any part of myself in that thing. Matt made a slashing gesture across his throat, and the Marine fell silent. I'm in, Cortana said. How is it? Matt said. There was a half-second pause. It's different, Cortana replied. Proceed 30 meters down this passage and turn left. Matt motioned the team forward. 
Commander, Cortana said. We may have a prob. Hold transmission, Cortana, Matt interrupted. We're outside the command center. Can you tell how many are inside? Negative. They have disabled the bridge sensors, she replied. You heard Cortana, Matt said, addressing his companions. Expect anything. Sergeant, you and Locklear get in position. Roger that, Sergeant Johnson whispered. In position and ready to kick Covenant ass. We're about to blow the door on this end, Cortana. Stand by, Commander, Cortana said. Hurry, plasma grenades on my mark, Matt said on the comm. Mark tossed them and take cover. Matt and John tossed one plasma grenade each. They burned magnesium brilliant and adhered to the heavy alloy of the bulkhead doors that encased the bridge, one of the alien weapon's more useful properties. Matt moved around the corner of the passage and shielded Haberson and Pulaski. Five seconds elapsed, and a flash filled the hallway. Matt moved back to the doors. They shone mirror bright where the grenade had detonated but was otherwise unharmed. A hundred grenades wouldn't have blasted through these doors, but when Covenant plasma grenades detonated, they disrupted electronics and shielding. Matt dug his gauntlet fingers into the door crack, hoping that the disruption had knocked out the motors and shielding keeping these doors closed. He braced himself and tried to pull the doors apart at the seams. They slid a few centimeters, then ground to a halt. Matt adjusted his footing and strained at them again, but the doors remained frozen in place. Matt's motion sensors pulsed a warning, there was movement directly on the other side of the door. He shoved the muzzle of his assault rifle into the narrow opening and squeezed the trigger. Spent shell casings clattered to the floor. A howl echoed from the other side, and a curl of gray smoke drifted through the crack. Matt slung his rifle, grabbed the doors, flexed, pulled, and this time the heavy metal moved. A flash of plasma fire washed over his shields, blinding him. He ignored it, closed his eyes, and continued to force his way through the door. Another plasma shot struck him in the chest. The doors were half a meter apart, good enough. He rolled to the side and gave his shields a moment to regenerate. Nothing. The suit's alarms pulsed insistently. He squinted through the glowing spots that swam in his vision and scanned the damage report, the Mjolnir's internal temperature was over 60 degrees Celsius, and Matt heard the whine of microcompressors in his armor, trying to compensate. Marines Matt yelled. Suppressing fire. Hell yes, Commander, Locklear replied. Locklear dropped to one knee and fired through the opening. Johnson stood and fired over the younger Marine's head. Matt rebooted his shielding control software. Nothing. His shield system was dead. The shooting stopped. I'm out, Locklear said. And I'm in, Matt said. Matt rushed into the room and stepped over the dead elite on the floor before him. Its torso had been ripped open, shot as it tried to hold the doors closed. Matt scanned the room. It was circular, 20 meters across, with a raised platform in the center that was 10 meters across and ringed with holographic control surfaces. The central platform floated over a pit in the floor. Within the pit were exploded optical conduits and a trio of Covenant engineers, cowering in fear. Don't shoot the engineers, Crystal warned. We need them. Understood, Matt replied. Acknowledge that order, Locklear. There was a pause over calm and then Locklear said, Roger. Along the circular walls, floor-to-ceiling displays showed the flagship status as a variety of charts and graphs, peppered with the odd calligraphy of the Covenant. They also showed the space surrounding them, and the five remaining Covenant cruisers closing in. Matt caught motion in his peripheral vision an elite in jet-black armor materialized from the wall display, its light-bending camouflage dissolving. It strode toward him, roaring a challenge. Matt's rifle snapped up, and he squeezed the trigger. Three rounds spat from the muzzle, then the bolt locked open. The ammo counter read oh, oh empty. The shots flared on the elite's shielding, a lucky round penetrated and deformed its shoulder. Purple-black blood spattered on the deck, but it shrugged off the wound and kept coming. Haverson charged into the room and leveled his pistol. Hold it he yelled and thumbed off the weapon's safety. The elite drew a plasma pistol and fired at the lieutenant, but never took its eyes off Matt. Haverson cursed and scrambled out of the room as the plasma charge slashed at him. Matt altered his grip on the rifle and crouched in a low fighting stance. Even with the shield malfunction, he was confident he could take a single elite. The elite removed its helmet and dropped it. The plasma pistol clattered to the deck a moment later. It leaned forward, and its mandibles parted in what Matt guessed had to be a smile. It moved closer, and a blue-white blade of energy flashed to life in its hands. The elite raised the energy blade and charged. Author's note did you love that chapter? 
I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen. Have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 61 Clearing House. Authors note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again, I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 61 Clearing House. Location Uncharted System, Aboard Unidentified Covenant Flagship, Halo Debris Field. September 22, 2552, 1802 hours. Matt ducked as the hissing energy blade slashed at him. He dived toward the Elite and slammed the butt of his rifle into the alien's midsection. The Elite doubled over, and Matt brought the rifle butt down to smash the alien's skull, but the Elite rolled back. There was a blur of motion as the energy blade lashed out and neatly bisected the assault rifle. The two halves of the wrecked MA-5 be clattered to the deck. The blade of crackling white-hot energy narrowly missed Matt. The Mjolnir's internal temperature skyrocketed. He couldn't risk dancing at this range, so Matt did the last thing the creature expected he stepped closer and grabbed its wrists. The bands of muscle on the elite's arms were iron-hard, and it struggled to free itself from Matt's grasp. He wrenched the alien's sword arm and forced the blade away, but this took most of his strength, and he had to weaken his grasp on the elite's other hand. The energy blade blurred perilously close to Matt's head. It missed by a fraction of a centimeter and sent a wash of static across his heads-up display. The blade was a flattened triangle of white-hot plasma, contained in an electromagnetic envelope that emanated from its hilt. Matt had seen such weapons slice battle-armored ODSTs in half and gouge gaping wounds in titanium-A armor plating. Worse, this elite was tough, cunning, well-trained, and it hadn't spent days fighting non-stop on Halo. Matt felt every wound, pulled a muscle, and strained tendon in his body. Haverson and Pulaski moved onto the bridge, their pistols drawn, but neither of them had a clear line of fire. Move, Commander Haverson shouted. Damn it, we've got no shot. Easier said than done. If he let go, the elite would cut him in two. Matt grunted, struggling to turn the elite. The alien fought back for a moment, then, instead of resisting, lurched back, right into the path of Matt's advancing teammates. The elite flicked the angle of its blade flat so the arc of energy whipped toward Haverson and Pulaski. Haverson screamed and fell to the ground as the energy blade sliced through his pistol and across his chest. Pulaski cursed and fired a single shot, but it glanced off the elite's shield. The alien glanced at the source of the fire and growled in its guttural, warbling tongue. Get the lieutenant out of here, Matt barked. He raised his knee to his chest and lashed out with a straight kick. His boot connected with the elite's breastplate. The alien's energy shield flared, then faded, and its breastplate cracked like porcelain beneath the force of the blow. The alien staggered back, dragging Matt with it. It coughed up purple-black blood that smeared Matt's visor, obscuring his vision. Its foot struck something on the ground, the alien's fallen helmet, and it lost its footing. Together they crashed to the ground. Matt kept his grip on the elite's sword arm. The alien's other hand, however, wrenched free and grabbed the fallen plasma pistol. The weapon's muzzle charged with sickly green energy. Matt rolled to his right as the pistol discharged. A globe of plasma arced across the compartment and splashed over the displays behind him. The instruments flickered, then flashed and sparked as the energy bolt melted their systems. Before the displays went dark, however, Matt saw one of the Covenant cruisers open fire. A lance of plasma rushed through space toward the flagship. Matt and the Elite struggled, rising to their feet. He batted the plasma pistol aside and it clattered across the control center. The elite's mouth opened, and it snapped at the mat. It was angry or panicking now, and he felt it getting stronger. His grasp on the alien loosened. There was motion behind the elite, Sergeant Johnson and Locklear still struggled to get their hatch open more than a crack. Chief, Sergeant, prepare to fire. Ready, Commander. John cried from the other side of the hatch. Matt tightened his grip on the elite's sword arm shoved his forearm into the alien's throat and drove it backward, across the bridge. He slammed the creature into the partially opened hatch. The energy blade cut into Matt's armor, boiling through the alloy that protected his upper arm. Chief, Sergeant now fire. Gunfire exploded from the hatch, oddly muffled because the rounds impacted directly into the elite's back. The alien snarled and contorted, but it held on to Matt. The alien warrior sawed the blade deeper, cutting through the tough crystalline layers of the Mjolnir armor. Hydrostatic gel oozed from the wound, mixed with Matt's blood. Keep. Shooting. A bullet hole appeared through the elite's broken chest plate, 
bits of shattered armor and torn flesh spattered over Matt. Matt slammed the elite into the bulkhead, and a control panel behind the alien sparked. The door to the escape corridor hissed open, and the creature reeled back. The alien was off balance, and Matt finally had leverage. He buelled the elite backward and hammered its arm into the wall. The alien metal rang like a gong, and the elite dropped its energy sword. The blade guttered and went dark as its failsafes permanently disabled the weapon. Matt forced the alien back, step by step. The deck was slippery with blood. Finally, he twisted the elite to the right and launched a powerful open-handed strike into the alien's wounded chest. The elite howled in pain and flew back, through the open hatch of an escape pod. Get off this ship, Matt said. He hit a control stud and the hatch slammed shut. There was a sharp, metallic bang as the locking clamps released. The pod screamed away from the hull. Matt exhaled. Sweat dripped in his eyes, momentarily blurring his vision. Good work, chief, you two marines, he panted. His shoulder burned. He tried to move it, but it was stiff and wouldn't respond. The ship lurched. Plasma impact on the starboard Ford at Cortana called out. Shields down to 67%. She paused and then added, amazing radiative properties. Commander, you need to disable the navigation override so I can maneuver. Haverson and Pulaski strode toward the chief. Haverson clutched his chest and grimaced in pain from the sword wound. Pulaski set her hand on Matt's shoulder. That's bad, she whispered. Let me get a first aid kit from the pelican, and Matt shrugged off her touch. Later, he saw her concerned expression melt into one of, what? Fear. Confusion. Cortana, show me what to do, Matt said and made his way to the raised platform in the center of the bridge. Pulaski, you and Haverson get that other hatch open. Aye aye, Pulaski muttered, her voice tight. She and Haverson went to the hatch and got to work. Matt glanced at the control surfaces. As his hand hovered over them, the flat controls rose and became a three-dimensional web of the distinctive covenant calligraphy. Where? He asked. Move your hand to the right half a meter, Cortana said. Up twenty centimeters. That control. No, to the left. She sighed. That one. Tap it three times. Faint lights traced the surface as Matt touched it. They flared red and orange and finally cooled to brilliant blue. It worked, Cortana said. NAV controls coming online. I can finally move this crate. Hang on. The ship spun to port. On the displays that still functioned, four more Covenant cruisers tracked them and fired. The flagship accelerated, but the plasma torpedoes arced and followed them. No good, Cortana said. I can't overcome our inertia in this tub. They're going to hit us unless I can get us into slip space. A rhythmic warble pulsed from one of the displays. It flashed red. Oh no, Cortana said. The leading plasma torpedo impacted. Dull red fire smeared across the view screens. Oh no, what? Haverson demanded. This ship slip space generator is inert, Cortana replied. The disabled NAV controls were a trick. It must have been the Covenant AI. It lured me here while the drive was physically decoupled from the reactor. I can maneuver all I want, give orders to the slip space generator, but without the system powered up we're not going anywhere. There's a Covenant AI. Haverson muttered and raised an eyebrow. Upload the coordinates to power coupling, Matt said. I'll take care of it. Two more plasma torpedoes impacted and splashed across the shield. Energy shields collapsing, Cortana said. Brace. The last shot collided with the flagship. The hull heated, and plasma boiled layers of armor plating away. The ship rolled as plumes of superheated metal vapor outgassed. Another hit like that will breach the hull, Cortana said. Moving this tub at flank speed. The power coupling coordinates, Cortana, Matt insisted. A route appeared on his heads-up display. The engineering rooms were twenty decks below the bridge. Those won't do you any good, Cortana told him. There are bound to be elite hunt-and-kill teams waiting for you. And even if you manage to remove them, there is no way to repair the power coupling in time. We don't have the tools or the expertise. Matt looked around the bridge. There had to be a way. There was always a way. He leaned over the edge of the central platform and grabbed one of the Covenant engineers that cowered below. He dragged it up by its float sack. The creature squirmed and squealed. Maybe we don't have the expertise, he said and shook the engineer. But this thing does. Can you communicate with it? Tell it what we need. There was a pause. Then Cortana replied, there is an extensive communication suite in the Covenant lexic. Just tell it I'm taking it to fix something. All right, Commander, Cortana said. 
A stream of high-pitched chirps emanated from the bridge speakers and the engineer's six eyes dilated. It stopped squirming and grabbed hold of Matt with its tentacles. It says, good and hurry, Cortana told him. Everyone else, stay here, Matt said. If you insist, Haverson muttered, his face pale. Blood trickled from the wound in his chest. Matt looked at John, Johnson, and Locklear. Don't let the Covenant retake the bridge. Not a problem, Commander, Sergeant Johnson said. He stopped to kick the dead elite once in the teeth, then slapped a fresh clip into his MA-5B. He yanked the weapon's charge handle, fed around into the chamber, and stood at arms. Those Covenant sissies are going to have to tango with me before they set one foot in this room. On the display, two of the Covenant cruisers fired again. Matt watched as the plasma raced toward them, fire that spread across the black of space. Cortana, buy me some time, he said. I'll do what I can, Commander, Cortana told him. But you'd better move fast. I'm running out of options. As he walked off the bridge he asked Crystal, can you repair my armor? No, she answered. Armor system isn't responding. We'll figure out the issue later. Let's just get to the engine room. Matt spun in midair and planted his feet on the ground. The gravity had been disabled in this elevator shaft. That had made traversing the many intervening decks easy, as long as he'd been willing to jump and trust that the power in this part of the ship wouldn't be restored. The engineer clutching his shoulder tapped the tiny control panel on the wall. The doors at the bottom of the shaft sighed and slowly slid apart. Funny how the creature didn't care what or who Matt was. Didn't it know their races were enemies? It was clearly intelligent and could communicate. Maybe it didn't care about enemies or allies. Maybe all it wanted to do was its job. There was a corridor ahead, five meters wide, with a vaulted ceiling. Past a final arch, the passage opened up into the cavernous reactor room. The ambient lights in the hallway and room were off. Along the far wall of the room, however, the 10-meter-high reactor coils pulsed with blue-white lightning and threw hard shadows onto the walls. Matt adjusted his low-light filters to screen out the glow from the reactor. He made out the silhouettes of crates and other machinery. He also saw one of those shadows on the wall move, with the distinct slouching waddle of a covenant grunt. Then the motion was gone. An ambush. Of course. He paused, listened, and heard the panting of at least half a dozen grunts, and then the high-pitched uneasy squeaks the creatures emitted when they were excited. This came as a relief to Matt. If there was an elite here, it would have maintained better discipline and silenced the grunts. Still, Matt hesitated. His shields were gone, his armor breached. He had been fighting almost non-stop for what felt like years. He was forced to admit that he was at the limits of his endurance. A good soldier always assessed the tactical situation, and right now, his situation was serious. A single lucky plasma shot could inflict third-degree burns along his arm and shoulder and incapacitate him, which would give the grunts an opportunity to finish him off. Matt flexed his wounded shoulder, and pain lanced across his chest. He banished his discomfort and concentrated on how to win this fight. It was ironic that after facing the best warriors in the Covenant, and after defeating the Flood, he could be killed by a handful of grunts. Commander, Cortana said over the comm, are you there yet? I'm down to one last option. The Master Chief replied in a whisper, almost. Be careful. Your armor is breached, Crystal warned. You can no longer function in a compromised atmosphere. He flashed an acknowledgement to Crystal and concentrated on the problem at hand. Using grenades was not an option, a plasma grenade or a frag near those reactor coils could breach the containment vessel. That left stealth, and outwitting the grunts. Maybe he'd use his grenades after all. Matt set a plasma grenade in the center of the elevator shaft. He took his remaining two frag grenades and set them aside as well. He felt along the elevator shaft walls and found what he needed, a length of hair-fine optical cord. He pulled out a THRE emitter length. The engineer gave a huff of irritation at this destruction. Matt threaded the line through the rings of his frag grenades and tied each end at anchor points 10 centimeters off the floor. He wedged the grenades into the slot of the open door. The trap was set, all he needed now was bait. He set a plasma grenade on the far wall of the shaft and triggered it. He pushed into the corridor, fast. Four seconds to go. The gravity, still active in this portion of the ship, pulled him to the deck. He melted into the shadows and sprinted along the wall two meters farther in, and halted along the inside of the first support brace. Three seconds. One grunt emitted a startled cry and a plasma shot sizzled down the center of the hallway. Two seconds. Matt pried the engineer off his shoulder and pressed the creature firmly into the join where the brace met the wall. One second. 
The engineer squirmed for a moment, then stilled, perhaps sensing what was about to happen. The plasma grenade detonated. A flash of intense light flooded the hallway and the room beyond. The rest of the grunts cried out, plasma bolts and a hail of crystalline needles filled the passage, impacting inside the elevator shaft. The grunts ceased fire. A lone grunt cautiously stepped out from behind a crate and crept forward. It gave a barking, nervous laugh and then, encountering no resistance, waddled down the passage toward the elevator. For more grunts followed, and they passed Matt, oblivious that he hid behind the wall brace less than a half meter from them. They approached the elevator, sniffed, and entered. There was the gentle ping as the frag grenade rings pulled free of the tripwire. Matt covered the engineer. One of the grunts squealed, high and panicky. They all turned and ran. Twin blasts of thunder enveloped the elevator shaft. Bits of meat and metal spattered along the corridor. A needier skidded to a halt a meter away. It was cracked, its energy coil dim. Matt grabbed it, ducked as another plasma bolt singed over his head. He withdrew to the cover of the bracing support. He tried to activate the weapon. No luck. It was dead. The engineer snaked a tentacle around the weapon and tugged it away from Matt's grasp. It cracked the case and peeled the housing open. The tip of one of its tentacles split into a hundred needle-fine cilia and swept over the inner workings. A moment later it reassembled the weapon and handed it, grip first, to Matt. The needier hummed with energy and the glassing quills the weapon fired glowed a cool purple. Thanks, he whispered. The engineer chirped. Matt edged around the brace. He waited, needier held tightly in his hand, and became completely still. He had all the time in the world, he told himself. No need to rush. Let the enemy come to you. All the time. A grunt poked its nose over a crate, trying to spot its enemy. It took a blind shot down the corridor and missed. Matt remained where he was, raised the needier, and fired. A flurry of crystal shards propelled down the passage and impaled the grunt. It toppled backward, and the shards detonated. Matt waited and listened. There was nothing except the gentle thrumming of the reactor. He moved down the corridor, weapon held before him as he cleared the room. He was careful to watch for the faint rippling of air that would alert him to the presence of camouflage deletes. Nothing. The engineer floated behind him, and then accelerated toward the disengaged power coupling. It hissed and chittered as it rapidly manipulated a small square block of optical crystal, unscrambling the internal circuit pathways. Cortana, he said. I've gotten to the coupling. The engineer appears to know what it's doing. You should have power for the slip space generator in a moment. It's too late, Cortana told him. Author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen. Have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 62 Relinquishing Command. Author's note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again. I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 62 Relinquishing Command Location Uncharted System Aboard Unidentified Covenant Flagship Halo Debris Field September 22, 2552 1827 hours Cortana Status please, Matt said. Stand by, Cortana reported. Matt felt decompressive explosions reverberate through the deck, Thunder that suddenly silenced itself as the atmosphere vented. He waited for an explosion to tear through the engine room or for plasma to envelop him. He scanned the engine room for any signs of grunts or elites, and then exhaled, and stared into the face of death for the countless time. He had always been a hair's breadth from death. Matt wasn't a fatalist, merely a realist. He didn't welcome the end, he knew, though, that he had done his best, fought and won so many times for his team, the Navy and the human race, it made moments like this tolerable. They were, ironically, the most peaceful times in his life. Cortana, status please, he asked again. There was a pause over the comm, then Cortana spoke. We're safe, in slip space, heading unknown. She sighed, and her voice sounded tinged with weariness. We're long gone from Halo, Threshold, and that Covenant fleet. If this tin can holds together a bit longer, I want to put some distance between us and them. Matt replied, good work, Cortana, very good. He moved toward the elevator. Now we have a hard decision to make. He paused and turned back toward the Covenant engineer. The creature moved away from the repaired power coupling and drifted to a scarred, half-melted panel that had been hit with stray plasma fire. It huffed, removed the cover, and delved into the tangle of optical cables. 
Matt left it alone. It wasn't a threat to him or his team. In fact, it and the others like it might be key to repairing the ship and their continued survival. He continued to the elevator shaft, stepping over the bodies of the grunts in the hallway. He nudged them with his foot to make certain they were dead and then retrieved two plasma pistols and one of the needle launchers. He entered the elevator shaft, pushed off the deck, and floated upward in the null gravity. Matt kept his eyes and ears sharp for any hint of a threat as he moved through the corridors to the bridge. Everything was quiet and still. At the open bridge door, he paused and watched as Warrant Officer Pulaski supervised a Covenant engineer while it removed the blasted door control panels. The engineer turned a melted piece of polarizing crystal before its six eyes, and then picked up an unblemished crystalline panel off the floor and inserted it into the wall. Pulaski wiped her hands on her greasy coveralls and waved him in. Thin, blue smoke still filled the bridge, but Matt noted that most of the display panels were once again active. Nearby, John was checking his weapons, Sergeant Johnson tended Haverson's wounds, and Locklear stood guard. The young Marine's eyes never left the engineer, and his finger hovered close to, though not quite on, his MA-5B's trigger. The engineer floated back, spun on its long axis, and looked first at Pulaski, then Matt. A burst of static issued from the bridge speakers and the Covenant engineer looked to them and then to Pulaski. It tapped the control, and the massive bridge doors slid shut. The engineer passed a tentacle over the controls. They flashed blue, then dimmed. It locks now, Pulaski told them. Ugly here knows his stuff. Three ultrasonic whistles filled the air. The Covenant engineer who had just repaired the bridge door snapped to attention, and its eyes peered intently forward. It chirped a response and then floated toward Matt, trying to maneuver behind him. What's it doing? Matt asked, turning to face the creature. The engineer huffed in annoyance and tried again to move around him. Matt didn't let it. While he had seen no hostility from the creatures, they were still part of the Covenant. Having one at his back grated against every instinct. I've told it to repair your armor's shields, Cortana said. Let it. Matt allowed the small alien to pass. He felt the access panel removed from the shield generator housing on his back. Normally it took a team of three technicians to remove the safety catches and get to the radioactive power source. Matt shifted uneasily. He didn't like this one bit, but Cortana had always known what she was doing. Locklear watched this and ran a hand over his shaved head. He stood on the raised center platform and turned to the other Covenant engineer as it repaired the burned-out displays on the port side of the room. He held his MA-5B loosely, but it was still aimed in the alien's general direction. I don't care what Cortana says, he told Matt, I don't trust them. The engineer near Locklear floated to the bridge's holographic controls and passed a tentacle over a series of raised dots. The screen snapped on and showed three Covenant cruisers closing fast. Adrenaline spiked through Matt's blood. Cortana, quick, take evasive action. Relax, Commander, Locklear said. He waved his hand over a holographic control, the images on screen froze. It's just a replay. He turned and examined the suspended plasma bolts just as they impacted on the flagship's shields. Man, he whispered. I wish our boats had weapons like those. We might soon have exactly that, Marine, Lieutenant Haverson said. He winced and stood, then moved to a screen that showed the storms in the upper atmosphere of Threshold. Play this one, Corporal. Locklear tapped one of the controls. A line of sparkling blue lights appeared on screen, and the nose of the flagship edged into view. The blue line ripped a hole in space, and the ship jumped forward. The clouds of Threshold vanished, there was only blackness on the screen. Haverson slicked back the strands of his red hair that had fallen into his face. Cortana, he asked, has anyone, human or covenant, ever performed a slip space jump from within an atmosphere? No, Lieutenant. Normally such strong gravitational fields would distort and collapse the Shafujikawa event horizon. With the Covenant's slip space matrices, however, I had greatly increased resolution. I was able to compensate. Amazing, he whispered. Goddamned lucky, Pulaski muttered. She tugged on the rim of her cap. It worked, Matt told them. For now, that's all that matters. He faced his team, trying to ignore the motions of the Covenant engineer attached to his back. We have to plan our next move. I'm sorry to disagree, Commander, Lieutenant Haverson said. The mere fact that Cortana's maneuver worked is the only thing that matters now. Matt squared himself to the lieutenant and said nothing. Out of the corner of his eye, Matt saw John start to do the same, but Matt sent him a subtle cutting motion with his hand. Haverson held up his hands. I acknowledge that you have tactical command, Commander. 
I know your authority has the backing of the brass and ONI Section 3. You'll get no argument from me on that point, but I put it to you that your original mission has just been superseded by the discovery of the technology on this ship. We should scrub your mission and head straight back to Earth. What's this other mission? Locklear asked, his voice suspicious. Haverson shrugged. I see no reason to keep this information classified at this point. Tell him, Commander. Matt didn't like how Haverson acceded to his tactical command yet readily ordered him to reveal highly classified material. Cortana, he said. Is the bridge secure from eavesdroppers? A moment, Cortana said. Red lights pulsed around the room's perimeter. It is now. Go ahead, Commander. My team and I, Matt started. He hesitated, the thought of his fellow Spartan stopped him cold. For all, he knew they were all dead beside John. He pushed that to the back of his mind, however, and continued. Our mission was to capture a Covenant ship, infiltrate Covenant-controlled space, and capture one of their leaders. Command hoped they could use this to force the Covenant into a ceasefire and negotiations. No one said a word. Finally, Locklear snorted and rolled his eyes. Typical Navy suicide mission. No, Matt replied. It was a long shot, but we had a chance. We have a better chance now that we have this ship. Excuse me, Commander, Pulaski said. She removed her cap and wrung it in her hands. You're not suggesting that you're going to continue that half-assed op, are you? We barely survived four days of hell. It was a miracle we got away from Reach, survived the Covenant on Halo, not to mention the Flood. I have a duty to complete my mission, Matt told her. The Chief and I will do it with or without your help. There's more at stake than our individual discomfort, even our lives. We're not Spartans, Haverson said. We're not trained for your kind of mission. That was certainly true. They weren't Spartans. John's team would never give up. But as he scanned their weary faces, he had to acknowledge that they weren't ready for this mission. The sergeant stepped forward and said, You still want to go? I got your back, chief. John nodded, but he saw the exhaustion even in the sergeant's dark eyes. There were limits to what any soldier, even a hardcore marine like Johnson, could endure. And as much as he didn't want to admit it, his original orders, given only a week ago, felt as if they'd been issued a lifetime in the past. Even Matt felt the temptation to stop and regroup before continuing. What's on this ship, Haverson said, can save the human race. And wasn't that the goal of your mission? Let's return to Earth and let the Admiralty decide. No one would question your decision to clarify your orders given the circumstances, he paused, then added, and the loss of your entire team. Haverson's expression was carefully neutral, but Matt still bristled at the further mention of his team, and at the attempt to manipulate him. He remembered his order sending Fred, Kelly, and the others to the surface of Reach, thinking that he, John, Linda, and James were going on the hard mission. Listen to the LT, Locklear said. We deliver a little something for the Randy eggheads and maybe buy some shore leave. I vote for that plan. He saluted Haverson. Hell yeah. This isn't a democracy, Matt said, his voice both calm and dangerous. Locklear twitched but didn't back down. Yeah, maybe it isn't, he said, but last time I checked, I take my orders from the Corps, not from some swabby. Sir. The sergeant scowled at the ODST and moved to his side. You better get it together, Marine, he barked, or the commander will reach down and pull you inside out by your cornhole. And that'll be sweet, sweet mercy, compared to what I'm gonna do to you. Locklear contemplated the sergeant's words and Matt's silence. He looked to Pulaski and then to Haverson. Pulaski stared at the Marine with wide eyes, then turned away. Haverson gave him a slight shake of his head. Locklear sighed, eased his stance, and dropped his gaze. Man, I really, really hate this shit. I hate to interrupt, Crystal said, but I find myself agreeing with the lieutenant. Matt clicked on a private comm channel. Explain, Crystal. I thought our mission was what you and Cortana were built for. Why are you backing out now? I'm not backing out, she shot back. Our orders were given when the UNSC had a fleet, and when Reach was still an intact military presence. All that has changed. Matt couldn't disagree with what she was saying, but there was something else in her voice. And for the first time, Matt thought that Crystal might be hiding something from him. We have intact ship-scale plasma weapons and new reactor technologies, Cortana continued. Imagine if every ship could maneuver with pinpoint precision in slip space. She paused. The UNSC could be just as effective in space as you are in ground engagements. We could actually win this war. Matt frowned. He didn't like the lieutenant's or Crystal's arguments because they made sense. Aborting his mission was unthinkable. 
He had always finished what he started, and he'd always won. As a professional soldier, Matt was ready to give up anything for victory, his personal comfort, his friends, his own life if that's what it took, but he'd never considered that he'd have to sacrifice his dignity and pride as well for the greater good. He sighed and nodded. Very well, Lieutenant Haverson. We'll do it your way. I hereby relinquish my tactical command. Good, Haverson said. Thank you. He faced the others and continued, Sergeant. You, Pulaski, and Locklear get back down to the Pelican and grab whatever gear wasn't smashed to bits. Look for a field medkit, too, and then get back up here double time. Yes, sir, Sergeant Johnson said. We're on it. He and Pulaski headed for the door, tapped the control, and let the panel slide apart. Pulaski shot a stare at Matt over her shoulder, then, shaking her head, she followed the sergeant. Shit, Locklear said, checking his rifle as he loped after them. Wait up man, I'm never going to get another hour's sleep. Sleep when you're dead, Marine, the sergeant said. The bridge door is sealed. Haverson said, plot a course back to Earth, Cortana, and then. I'm sorry, Lieutenant Haverson, Cortana said. Crystal and I can't do that. A direct course to Earth would be in violation of the Cole Protocol. Furthermore, we are not allowed an indirect route, either. Subsection 7 of the Cole Protocol states that no Covenant craft may be taken to human-controlled space without an exhaustive search for tracking systems that could lead the enemy to our bases. Subsection 7, Haverson said. I haven't heard of it. Very few have, sir, Cortana answered. It was little more than a technicality. Before this, no one had actually ever captured a Covenant vessel. An exhaustive search of this vessel would be difficult under the circumstances, Haverson said and cupped his hand over his chin, thinking. It must be more than three kilometers long. I have a suggestion, sir, Matt said. An intermediate destination reach. Reach? Haverson quickly hid the shock on his face with a smile. Commander, there's nothing in the reach system except a Covenant Armada. No, sir, Matt replied. There are other possibilities. Haverson raised an eyebrow. Go ahead, Commander. I'm intrigued. The first possibility, Matt said, is that the Covenant have glassed the planet and moved on. In which case, there might be a derelict, but serviceable, UNSC craft that we could repair and take to Earth. We'd leave the Covenant flagship in low orbit and return with the proper scientific staff and equipment to effect a salvage operation. Haverson nodded. A long shot. Although the Euphrates did have a prowler attached to her. They were supposed to launch a reconnaissance mission before they got the signal to drop everything and help defend Reach. So maybe it's not such a long shot, after all. And the other possibility? The Covenant are still there, Matt said. The likelihood that they would attack one of their own capital ships is low. In either event, there is no violation of the Cole Protocol because the Covenant already know the location of Reach. True, Haverson said. He paced to the center of the bridge. Very well, Commander. Cortana set course for reach. We'll enter at the edge of the system and assess the situation. If it's too hot, we jump and find another route home. Acknowledged, Lieutenant, Cortana replied. Be advised that this ship traverses slip space much faster than our UNSC counterparts. ETA to reach in 13 hours. Matt sighed and relaxed a little. There was another reason for choosing reach, one he didn't reveal to the lieutenant. He knew the odds of anyone surviving on the surface were remote. Astronomical, in fact, because once the Covenant decided to glass a planet, they did so with amazing thoroughness. But he had to see it. It was the only way he could accept that his teammates were dead. A wash of static covered Matt, first along his spine and then wrapped about his torso. There was an audible pop, and sparks crackled along the length of his Mjolnir armor. The engineer released its grasp on him and cluttered with excitement. Diagnostic routines scrolled upon Matt's heads up display. In the upper right corner, the shield recharge bar flickered red and slowly filled. They work, Crystal said in awe. These Covenant engineers incredible. Matt was relieved to have his shields back. He wouldn't forget what it was like to fight without them, though. It had been a wake-up call not to become dependent upon technology. It was also a reminder that most battles were won or lost in his head before he engaged an enemy. Impressive little creatures, Haverson remarked. He scrutinized the Covenant engineer as it floated toward the wall of displays and began tinkering with one. I wonder how the Covenant cast system. Sir Sergeant Johnson's voice blasted over the comm, breaking with static. You've got to get down to the Pelican ASAP. You, the commander, and the chief, are you under fire? John asked. Negative, he replied. 
It's one of the cryotubes you recovered. What about it, Sergeant? Haverson snapped. Commander, Chief, there's a Spartan in it. Author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen. Have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 63 Arrival at Reach. Author's note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again, I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 63 Arrival at Reach. Location captured Covenant flagship, in slip space, location unknown. September 23, 2552, 0455 hours. Matt brushed off the frost buildup that clouded the top half of the cryo tube and revealed the green armored figure sprawled behind the plastisteel shell. Spartan 058, Linda. She'd been mortally wounded during the raid on Gamma Station, just before Reach fell. He dragged her burned, limp body back to the Pillar of Autumn, and the medics had placed her in deep cryostasis just before the jump. When the Autumn crashed on Halo, Keys must have jettisoned the active cryo tubes, standard operating procedure. They had frozen her while she'd still been in her suit. That was for the best, considering the extent of her injuries, but he would have given anything to see her face one last time. Linda had been unique among the Spartans with her blood-red hair and dark emerald eyes, but her appearance was not what set her apart. Besides himself, she was the unit's best sniper scout and could hit targets the rest of them couldn't. While the other Spartans preferred to operate as a team, Linda was content to separate, hide, and post in some remote location, and wait for days for the single, critical shot that could turn the tide of battle. Although snipers in the UNSC were always trained to function in pairs, a shooter and a spotter, he and Linda were the exception to that rule, both had proven time and again that they were most effective on their own. If any one of the Spartans could be called a lone wolf, it was he and Linda, in many ways that made the two the strongest of them. To see Linda like this, Matt wiped away the condensation that formed over her helmeted head. She was neither dead nor alive. She was in some twilight place in between. That uncertainty was worse than seeing her broken and burned body on Gamma Station. It felt like an open wound in Matt's chest. Linda's prognosis was good. The occupants of the other two cryopods hadn't made it. Some kind of energy discharge had deactivated the units, and the occupants had died cold bleak deaths. Matt felt an armored land on his shoulder. He glanced out of the corner of his eye and saw John standing slightly behind him. You care about her, don't you? John said. I don't think we should talk about this right now, John, Matt answered. Don't go there. No, I think we should about this right now, John replied. We never got a chance to have our talk back on the autumn. Matt sighed. Okay, fine, let's talk. What do you want to talk about? You care about her, don't you? John asked again. How do you know? That Spartan smile gesture you put over her faceblade after her vitals flatline told me a lot, John said. That and over the years I've seen you looking at her when you think no one is watching. Matt was surprised but at the same time, wasn't surprised that John had been watching. He was the leader of the Spartans after all. As a leader, you have to watch out for the members of your team. Okay fine you got me there. I have been looking and I do care about her, a lot more than I should, Matt said. What do you mean? John asked. I think I have feelings for her, Matt admitted. What kind of feelings? I think. I think I love her. John was surprised by that admission. Do you think she knew that you loved her? He asked. No. I never got the chance to tell her, Matt replied. Now I wish I did tell her. You'll get a chance to tell her, John said. How can you be so sure about that? Matt asked. She's not dead yet. Hopefully, we'll find someone that can revive her, John said. Just promise me one thing. What is it? Matt asked. Promise me you'll tell her how you feel about her if she's able to be revived. Matt closed his eyes. He curled his hands into fists. He could still very vividly remember when he saw Linda get hit by the plasma back on Gamma Station. He could still remember his heart sinking when he saw her vitals flatline. He quickly pushed that that memory aside. I promise, he replied. Good, John said. That's all I ask. There was a gentle knock on the hull of the pelican, and Sergeant Johnson pulled himself inside. Master Chief, Commander, he said. Do you two have the air scrubbers? The remote comm. Pulaski says she's ready to call it a day with that Covenant dropship. We need to get on board and work. Matt stood and nodded to the aft hatch, where he had stripped the air scrubbers and comm from the pelican. The sergeant picked up the gear, and then he, Matt, 
and John crawled out of the pelican. Matt hesitated and looked back at the cryotube. Don't you worry about her, Johnson said. Hell, I've been hit worse and she's three times the soldier I am. She'll pull through. Matt sealed the hatch without comment. He had heard the same hollow promises a hundred times before with critically wounded men. Why was it that soldiers would face their own deaths without blinking an eye, but when faced with the death of a squad mate, they turned away and lied to themselves. They silently marched across the hangar. It had been cleared of debris and bodies, and Warrant Officer Pulaski had, for the last six hours, been practicing inside the space with the intact Covenant dropship. She spun the odd Ushup craft around on its center axis, shimmied to port, rose, and then floated down for a landing. Johnson squinted his dark eyes at her performance and nodded approvingly. She says that she's figured out the weapon controls, too. No way to test them in here, of course. Understood, the Master Chief replied. And the rest of the team's progress? Matt asked. I've got the doors from here to the bridge and to the engine room welded shut, Sergeant Johnson told the Spartans. If those transient sensor contacts that Cortana keeps picking up are anything, they'll have to cut through to get to us. Locklear's grabbing some sack time. He needed it. The sergeant shrugged. He'll be fine, though. ODSDs are tough as nails. Lieutenant Haberson slept some then got up, had a long conversation with Cortana, and started reading through some of the Covenant database. Everyone seems to be fine, considering what we've been through. Understood, Matt said. Cortana. Ship status. ETA to reach in 20 minutes, she said. Matt checked his mission clock. You said 13 hours total travel time. By my count, we have approximately two hours to go. I had determined it would be 13 hours based on the specifications of the Covenant slip space drive, but there's. Her voice trailed off and faded. Cortana. John asked. Sorry. There's a curious time dilation effect at these slip space velocities. Although, technically, velocity, acceleration, and for that matter even time have no meaning in the folds of slip space. I thought I told you all this, she said. Irritation crept into her voice. Matt looked to the sergeant, who shook his head and shrugged. Cortana sounded more than distracted, and she didn't just forget things. It was a bad sign. They depended on her to fly this ship, and if she started falling apart they were in real trouble. Matt opened the comm channel. Change of plans, team. Reach ETA is 19 minutes. I'll explain later, just grab your gear and meet on the bridge ASAP. There was a pause, then Lieutenant Haverson replied, Roger, Commander. Locklear and I are already up here. The hatch of the Covenant dropship opened, and Pulaski jogged out. The four of them proceeded at a brisk pace to the bridge. Matt switched to Blue Team's comm channel. Anything else we should know? The channel was silent for a full ten seconds. I have the Covenant magnetic plasma shaping system figured out, Cortana replied. We'll have a limited offensive capacity when we get to reach if we need it, I think. And the rest of this ship is still functional. John asked after he switched comm channels. Yes, she replied. I'm sorry, Chief, Commander, these calculations are tricky. The comm went dead. Cortana's behavior worried Matt, but he resigned himself to trust her. What other option was there? Matt, John, the sergeant, and Pulaski halted outside the bridge. The thick blast doors were sealed. Lieutenant, Matt said. We're outside. The doors pulled apart. Locklear and the lieutenant stood with their assault rifles aimed down the hall. They relaxed their stance when they identified them as friendlies. Lieutenant Haverson slung his rifle and said, Sorry for the warm welcome. Cortana's been picking up transient contacts all over the ship. We're going to have to deal with them sooner or later, preferably before they deal with us. Agreed, Matt said. Pulaski approached the lieutenant, saluted, and gave her report on her efforts to master the Covenant dropship's controls. Locklear edged closer to Matt, the chief, and the sergeant. What do you think, Sarge? He whispered and cast a furtive glance at Pulaski. I mean, about her. Sure, there's that Marine Navy thing to get over, but I can get past that. Do you think there's a chance that she and I, I mean, I'd give you the same odds as spacing yourself and walking the rest of the way to reach, the sergeant declared, in your skivvies. Give me a drop capsule and I'd take those odds, Sarge. A smile split Locklear's tanned face, and he turned to the Spartans. Sure, I get it. Wouldn't be so defensive if I hadn't been close to the mark. Where there's smoke, there's fire, right? John looked at the Marine and didn't say a word. Matt stared at Locklear and slowly shook his head. Locklear's smile faded, but not entirely. 
You guys are just jealous, he muttered and absent-mindedly ran his finger over the scar that lined his jaw. That's cool. I get that all the time. Locklear's spirits had improved. Despite the ODST's rough edges, Matt had seen him in combat. He didn't panic, and he had the skill and luck to survive Halo, qualities Matt knew they'd need if they were ever going to get back. Exiting slip space, Cortana announced, in 3, 2, 1. According to Matt's mission clock, it had only been 8 minutes since Cortana had told him their ETA was 19 minutes. Was there more to the time dilation effect than she realized? The bridge lights dimmed, and blackness filled the arc of displays along the wall. Stars winked into existence, and at 3 o'clock blazed the warm yellow orb of Epsilon Eridani. We are 700,000 kilometers from the system center, Cortana told them. I wanted to jump in close enough to see what's going on, but far enough away so we would have time to recharge and re-enter slip space if there's any trouble. Picking up signals now. Covenant signals. Lots of them. Translating. Stand by. Haverson tapped one of the screens and magnified the image. My God, he whispered. A planet appeared on the screen. He sucked in his breath as he saw a world smoldering from pole to equator. Fires raged over its surface, and a hurricane of black spiraled through the atmosphere. Matt felt as if the ship had suddenly decelerated. His hands clenched. He'd sent the majority of his team down there, and had considered it the easier mission. He'd gotten his Spartans killed, he was sure of it. Had they at least died fighting? Or were they burned from an orbiting Covenant ship, helpless? Matt felt John put a hand on his shoulder to calm him. Slowly, Matt unclenched his hands. Are we in the right place? Locklear murmured. That's reach. He removed his cap, crushed it in his hand, and whispered, poor bastards. The other displays showed Covenant warships orbiting the planet, as well as dozens of smaller craft and one large structure that seemed to be a central docking station. What is this? Matt asked, stepping closer. He tapped the center display, pushing the limits of its resolution and magnifying a portion of the surface near the mid-latitudes. The image resolved into patches of green, brown, and white, different from the angry black and livid orange that dominated the view of the rest of the planet. Looks like they missed a spot, the sergeant said. The Covenant don't miss anything when they glass a planet, the Master Chief replied. We've seen them do it a thousand times. This is no accident. Matt turned to Lieutenant Haverson. We should get closer and see what this is, sir. Commander, Haverson said softly and held up his hands. I sympathize with yours and the Chief's need to know with absolute certainty what happened to your fellow Spartans, but this is. He gestured to the planet and then frowned as he scrutinized the undamaged part of Reach. Indeed, he murmured. This does warrant a closer look, provided we can get away with it. The lieutenant pulled the magnification back and refocused the display on the upper atmosphere. A hundred Covenant ships popped into view. There are several smaller vessels circling over that spot. Forget what I just said, Haverson whispered. If the Covenant are so interested in this region, then we should be as well, as long as our cover holds. Cortana, take us in closer. Yes, Lieutenant, Cortana replied. The Covenant flagship smoothly accelerated in system. They're hailing us, Cortana said, preparing the proper counter-response. Matt counted the ships on the display. There were hundreds, most no larger than a Covenant dropship, but there were at least a dozen cruisers and two of the Titanic carriers that each carried three squadrons of Seraph fighter craft. There was more than enough firepower to turn their captured flagship into molten slag. Many of the smaller ships herded debris from the battle into one spot over Reach, a floating junkyard of UNSC and Covenant ships. You see this? Matt pointed to the field of floating debris. The lieutenant stared at it. It's almost as if they plan to stay here for a while, their cleaning house. We're in, Cortana announced. The fleet is curious why a Covenant flagship is here, but not suspicious enough to question our authority. The translation is tricky, but apparently... From the string of honorifics attached to their responses, there's supposed to be someone of extremely high rank commanding this ship, someone they referred to, among other things, as the Guardian of the Luminous Key. Damn silly name, muttered Sergeant Johnson. Can you tell what they're doing down there, Cortana? The lieutenant asked. Not yet, she replied. Their language doesn't translate in a literal manner, and each word has multiple meanings. There's something they consider holy. There are ten times as many religious illusions than in their typical communique. Hang on, picking up a new signal. Weaker than the others. Not on a covenant frequency. It's the UNSC band. Lieutenant Haverson licked his lips. Play it, he said. A message beeped through the speakers, six tones, then a Tuscan pause, it repeated. 
Matt stiffened. Beside him, he felt John do the same. That's it, Cortana said. Just those six notes over and over. It originates here. A tiny NAV triangle appeared on the edge of the intact region on the planet's surface. It's not Morse code, Pulaski said. Not any code I've heard of. Maybe it's a test signal. Something automated, like an air traffic repeater relay, maybe. It's not automated, John said. Everyone gear up and get ready. We're going down there, Matt said. There are Spartans down there. And they're still alive. Matt whispered so softly that only he, John, Crystal, and Cortana heard Oli Oli Oxen Free. Author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen. Have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 64 Admiral Whitcomb. Author's note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again, I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 64 Admiral Whitcomb. Location Epsilon Eridani System, aboard captured Covenant dropship, en route to surface of reach. Date time record anomaly. Estimated date September 23, 2552. Estimated time 0530 hours. Matt stood on the deck of the Covenant dropship. He stood because the crash seats had been designed for elites and jackals and none of the contours fit their human backbones. It didn't matter, he preferred to stand. They drifted through the upper atmosphere of reach, descending like a spider on a thousand kilometer thread of silk. They passed close to a hundred other ships moving in orbital arcs, seraph fighters, other dropships, scavenger craft with grappling tentacles that dragged sections of salvaged metal. Dominating the skies were a pair of 300 meter long cruisers. The cruisers accelerated toward them. Matt moved up to the cockpit with John right behind him where Pulaski and Haberson sat in the seats they had removed from the pelican and welded in place. They're pinging us, Pulaski whispered. Nice and easy, warrant officer, Lieutenant Haberson whispered. Just use the programmed response Cortana gave us. Aye aye, Lieutenant, Pulaski replied and concentrated on the Covenant scripts that scrolled across the display on her left. Sending now. She tapped a holographic icon. Sergeant Johnson and Corporal Locklear stood two meters behind the Spartans, both of them nervous. Johnson chewed his stub of a cigar and scowled at the incoming Covenant warships. Locklear's trigger finger twitched, and beads of sweat dotted his forehead. Cortana has this stuff wired tight. Sergeant Johnson whispered. No worries. I got plenty of worries here, Locklear muttered. Man, I'd rather be in an HEV pod on fire and out of control than up here. We're sitting ducks. Quiet. Lieutenant Haverson hissed at Locklear. Let the lady concentrate. Pulaski kept one eye on the communication screen and one eye on the external displays as the twin cruisers grew larger, filling the holographic space before her. Both her hands hovered over the flight yoke, not touching it, but twitching in anticipation. Three Seraph fighters burned out of their orbits and took a closer pass. Is that an attack vector? Lieutenant Haverson asked. I don't think so, Pulaski said. But it's hard to tell with those things. Locklear inhaled deeply, and Matt noticed that he didn't exhale. He set his hand on the man's shoulder and pulled him aside. Relax, Marine, he whispered. That's an order. Locklear exhaled and ran a hand over his smoothly shaven head. Right, right, Commander. With effort, the Marine forced himself to calm down. A red light flashed on the control panel. Collision warning, Pulaski said with the practiced nonchalance all Navy pilots had in the face of imminent death. She reached for the yoke. Hold your course, the lieutenant ordered. Yes, sir, she said and released the controls. Fighters 100 meters and closing. Hold your course, Lieutenant Haverson repeated. They're just taking a closer look, he whispered to himself, and there's nothing to see. Nothing to see at all. When the Seraph fighters were only 10 meters away, they tumbled to either side of the dropship. Their engine pods flared blue and they looped overhead, then moved to rejoin the cruisers. The larger ships passed directly overhead and blotted out the sun. In the darkness, the cockpit lights automatically adjusted and flooded the display panels with the purple-blue frequency the Covenant favored. Matt realized that he, too, had been holding his breath. Maybe he and Locklear were more alike than he had realized. He took a closer look at the ODST the Wild, desperate look in his eyes and the flaming comet tattoo covering his left deltoid seemed almost alien to Matt. The man had survived the Covenant and the flood on Halo, and he had been lucky and resourceful enough to escape in one piece. True, his emotional responses were uncontained, 
but give him the same augmentations and a set of Mjolnir armor and what was the difference between the two of them? Experience, training, discipline, luck. Matt had always felt the other men and women in the UNSC were different, he'd felt at ease only with the other Spartans. But weren't they all fighting and dying for the same reason? The ruddy light from Epsilon Eridani suddenly filled the cockpit as the two cruisers passed on. Pulaski sighed, slumped forward, and wiped the sweat from her brow. Locklear reached into his shirt pocket, removed a clean and pressed red bandana, and offered it to Pulaski. She looked at it for a second, then glanced at the corporal, then took it. Thanks, Locklear. She folded it into a headband, flipped her blonde hair from her face, and tied it around her forehead. No problem, ma'am, Locklear replied. Anytime. Locking onto the signal source, Lieutenant Haberson said, Course 230 by Oneone Zero. 230 by Oneone Zero, I, Pulaski said. She gently pushed forward and turned the yoke. The dropship smoothly banked into a gentle dive. The surface of reach disappeared from the screens as the dropship entered the thick clouds of smoke that wreathed the planet. There was a quiet beep, and the display filters activated. A moment later, images resolved on the display screens, hundreds of thousands of hectares of raging firestorms and blackened char where there had once stood forests and fields. Matt tried not to think of this as reach anymore, it was only one more world the Covenant had taken. That canyon, Lieutenant Haberson said and pointed at a fissure where the earth had been eroded in a sinuous twisting scar. Scanners are just picking up surface information. Let's get a closer look. Understood. Pulaski inverted the ship, executed a reversed roll, and dropped into the canyon. When she righted the dropship, sculpted rock walls raced past them only 30 meters to either side. The lieutenant reached for the backpack comm system they had removed from the pelican. He fine-tuned the frequency of the unusual signal they were homing in on, a six-tone message played, followed by a Tuscan pause, and then it repeated. Open a channel on that band, Lieutenant, Matt said. I'll need to send the counter signal. Channel open, Commander. Go ahead. Matt linked his comm and encrypted the channel so only those people sending the signal would hear him. Oli oli oxen free, he spoke into his microphone. All out in the free. We're all free. The beeping over the backpack comm speaker suddenly stopped. Signal's gone. Lieutenant Haberson snapped his head around and stared at Matt. I'm not sure what you just told them, but whatever it was, they heard you. Good, Matt replied. Set us down somewhere safe. They'll find us. There's an overhang ahead, Pulaski said. She moved the ship toward a deep shadow along the starboard side where the cliff angled out from the canyon. I'll put us down there. She spun the ship backed into the darkness, and set it down light as a feather. Open the side hatch, Matt told Pulaski. The chief and I will go out alone and make sure it's safe. Alone? Lieutenant Haverson asked. He rose from his seat. Are you certain that's wise, Commander? Yes, sir. This was my idea. If it's a trap, we want to be the one to set it off. You stay here and back us up. Haverson drummed his long fingers across his chin, thinking. Very well, Commander. I got your six, Master Chief, Commander, Locklear said and unslung his assault rifle. The Spartans nodded to Locklear and marched down the ramp. Matt wanted them on board the dropship for two reasons. First, if this was a trap and they were all caught out in the open, he wouldn't have time to save them and himself. Second, if the Covenant were here, waiting, then Haverson and the others had to get away and get Cortana and Crystal back to Earth. He and the Chief could buy them the time to make it out alive. At the bottom of the ramp, Matt hesitated as his motion tracker pinged off a single signal. There, 30 meters ahead, just behind a large boulder the Frenderfoe identification system tagged the contact as neither Covenant nor UNSC. Matt motioned for John to watch his back and the chief flashed his acknowledgement light in response. Matt drew his pistol, crouched, and crept forward. A private comm channel snapped on Commander, relax. It's me. Another Spartan stepped out from the cover of the rock. His armor, while not as battered as Matt's, was covered with scuffs and burns, the left shoulder pauldron had been dented. Matt felt a surge of relief. His teammates, his family, hadn't all been killed. He recognized the Spartan from his voice and the subtle way he glanced right and left. It was Spartan 044, Anton. He was one of the unit's best scouts. The two stood there a moment and then Anton moved his hand, making a quick, short gesture with his index and forefinger over the faceplate of his helmet where his mouth would be. That was their signal for a smile, the closest any Spartan got to an emotional outburst. Matt returned the gesture. 
Good to see you, too, Matt said. How many are left? Three, Commander and one other make up our team. Apologies for the disabled FOF tag, but we're trying to confuse the Covenant forces in this area. He looked again to his left and right. I'd rather not give a full report in the open. He motioned toward the shadows of the cliff face. Matt flashed his acknowledgement light, motioned for John to join him and Anton, and then the three Spartans jogged out of the center of the ravine, the trio keeping their eyes on the rim of the canyon overhead. Matt had plenty of questions for Anton, however. Like, why had his team split from Red Team? Where was Red Team? And why hadn't the Covenant glassed every square centimeter of reach yet? You okay, Chief, Commander? Lieutenant Haberson's voice broke in from the comm. Affirmative, sir. Contact made with a Spartan. Stand by. Anton halted before a dark cavern entrance. It was difficult to see, even with image enhancement, there was only the faint outline of a tunnel in the shadows of the cliff face. Just inside were reinforcing steel eye beams painted matte black, and beyond there were tumeter wide boulders with chain guns bolted to their sides. Each gun was crewed by a Spartan whom Matt recognized as Grace 093 and Lee 008. When they saw Matt and John they gave them the smile gesture, which they returned. Grace followed Matt, John, and Anton into the cavern. Lee remained to operate the guns. Matt blinked as his eyes adjusted to the harsh fluorescent lights that illuminated the interior of the cavern. The walls had a grooved texture as if they'd been dug out by machinery. Standing before a fold-out card table in the center of the cavern was another man, in a navy uniform. Matt and John stiffened and saluted. Admiral, Sir Matt and John said in unison. Vice Admiral Danforth Whitcomb, despite his Western European name and Texas drawl, claimed to have descended from Russian Cossacks. He had the physique of a large bear, a closely shaved and polished head, eyes so dark they could have been made of coal, and a salt and pepper mustache that drooped over his upper lip and dangled off the edge of his chin. Master Chief, Commander. The Admiral snapped off a crisp salute. At ease, Spartans. Damn good to see you too. He strode to the duo and shook their hands, a gesture very few non-Spartans cared to endure, pressing bare flesh into a cold unyielding gauntlet that could pulverize their bones. Welcome to Camp Independence. Accommodations ain't four stars, but we call it home. Thank you, sir, John said. Matt and John had never worked with the Admiral before, but his accomplishments during the battles for New Constantinople and the Siege of the Atlas Moons were well known. Every Spartan had studied Whitcomb's record. Matt opened a comm channel to Lieutenant Haberson. Move up, sir. All clear. Roger, Haberson said. On our way. I'm happy to see you, Chief, Commander, Admiral Whitcomb said. So don't take this the wrong way, but what the hell are you two doing here? Keyes had orders to take you on a mission deep into Covenant territory. Yes, sir. It's a long story, Matt said. The admiral twisted the end of his mustache, glanced at his wristwatch, and smiled. We got the time, son. Let's hear it. Matt sat on a rock and recounted to the admiral what had happened since they had left reach the recovery of the NAV database on Gamma Station. The Pillar of Autumn's harrowing escape, the discovery of the Halo Construct and its eccentric caretaker, 343 Guilty Spark. He hesitated, then described his and John's encounters with the flood and subsequent destruction of Halo ending with their capture of the Covenant flagship. During the story, Lieutenant Haberson and the others from the dropship arrived. They remained silent as Matt told the tale. The Admiral listened without speaking a word. As Matt finished, the men gave a slow, low whistle and sat contemplating it all. That's one hell of a tale. And if it had come from anyone but you two, I'd order a psych exam. He stood and paced. He stopped and frowned. I believe it all, but something still doesn't add up. His face wrinkled as he thought. Can't quite put my finger on it, though. Sir, Lieutenant Haverson meekly said. Pardon me for asking, but how is it you are alive? Here. The Admiral smiled. Well, that's another long story, Lieutenant. Let me give you the short and sweet version. He leaned against the cavern wall and crossed his arms over his chest. The second those Covenant bastards entered the system I knew reach was history. The Covenant don't do anything halfway. Everyone planetside was busy evacuating, which was the right thing to do, but I had to stay behind. Several emotions played across the Admiral's face concern, amusement, and then his features settled into a firm stare as he looked into the past, recalling what happened. We've been working on a new bomb, called the Nova. It was a cluster of nukes, each with a lithium trite ride casing. 
Now, these things, in theory, when they detonate, not only make a big bang like you expect a nuke to, but they also force their tritium cases together in one big superheated and pressurized center. He made a fist and slammed it into his other palm for emphasis. Boosts the yield a hundredfold. A grin spread across his face. Planet killers. We had planned to use these things in space battles to level the playing field. His grin faded and he stroked his mustache. Well, things didn't quite turn out as planned, and we got caught flatfoot with those novas on the ground. So I decided to repurpose them. Lieutenant Haverson's face wrinkled with confusion. He didn't dare interrupt, but the admiral saw his expression and said, Think, son. All that ordnance around with plenty of covenant to blow up. Haverson shook his head. I'm sorry, sir. I still don't understand. Intelligence officer, huh? Whitcomb snorted and turned to Matt. What would you have done? Arm them, sir, Matt replied. Activate the failsafe tampering detonators and start a countdown timer. Say, two weeks. The admiral nodded. I gave it only ten days. There's no need to give them too much time to tinker. He set one of his heavy hands on Lieutenant Haverson's shoulder, and Haverson flinched. There are two possible outcomes to this plan, Lieutenant. Either the Covenant pack up the Novas and take them home for study, a possibility I pray to God happens. A bomb like that would crack their homeworld in half. Or the bombs stay here, and they'll stop the Covenant on reach. I see, sir, Lieutenant Haverson replied in a whisper, then glanced at his watch. This was how many days ago. Got plenty of time left, the Admiral told him. Around twenty hours. Lieutenant Haverson swallowed. There's just one snag in that plan, though. The admiral removed his hand from Haverson and his gaze settled onto the dirt floor of the cavern. I had a team of Marines, Charlie Company, that got wiped out before we could get to those Novas. He sighed. Brave kids. Damned waste of good men. That's when I picked up Red Team on Coded Com. I convinced them to lend me a few of your Spartans. We got to the Novas, armed them, and we've been raising eight kinds of hell down here with Hitandran exercises, just to keep everyone busy, you understand. Wouldn't want to get bored. And the rest of Red Team, sir? John asked. Whitcomb shook his head. We got one last transmission from them before they said they were falling back. He walked to the table, unrolled an old paper topological map, and pointed at Menachite Mountain. Here, where O and I had their castle base. He paused. But the Covenant is tearing that mountain apart, rock by rock. I want to believe they're still there, but we've counted at least a dozen companies. Those Covenant have air support close orbit patrols, and, on the ground, armor. The place is a fortress. Could anyone survive? Matt scrutinized the lines on the map and had an answer for the admiral. They're underground, he said. The castle facility. We did a lot of training there. The Covenant can fill up those tunnels with only so many search parties. Then you think they all have a chance? Yes, sir. More than a chance. I'd guarantee they're in there. That's where I'd be. The admiral set his fingertip on the representation of Menachite Mountain, tapped it twice, thinking, and then suddenly looked up. You got into this canyon in a captured Covenant ship, right? A dropship? Yes, sir. Matt hadn't told him that. Despite his brusque manner, the admiral knew his business. Then we'll go get them, son. Sir Lieutenant Haverson said. With all due respect, sir, our first priority should be to get back to Earth. The intelligence we've gathered on the Halo Construct, the technology aboard the flagship we've captured. Cortana's slipspace calculations alone could turn the tide of this war for us. I know all that, the Admiral replied tersely. And you're 300% correct, Lieutenant. But, he tapped the map again with his meaty forefinger, I won't leave a single man or woman behind on this planet for the Covenant to tear apart for sport. No way. And that goes double for a Spartan. We're going in. Author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen. Have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 65 Reunion. Author's note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again, I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 65 Reunion. Location Epsilon Eridani System, aboard captured Covenant dropship, on route to surface of reach. Date time record anomaly. Estimated date September 23, 2552. Estimated time 0610 hours. Pulaski accelerated the captured dropship to its maximum velocity, just under Mach 1. 
The craft arced up and joined the long convoy of Covenant ships, troop transports, scavenger drones, and Seraph fighters, as they descended from a higher orbit down to the surface. The formation of alien vessels headed straight toward Menekite Mountain. Covenant communiques scrolled across a screen next to the pilot's seat and then ceased. Incoming transmissions from the convoy. I guess they don't like strays, Pulaski muttered calmly, looking at the Covenant calligraphy. They're not shooting, the Admiral said, gripping the back of Pulaski's seat. We're fine. Just fly, warrant officer. He turned to Matt. Get M ready, son. Matt nodded and moved aft to the rest of the squad. His four Spartans as well as Lieutenant Haberson, Locklear, and Sergeant Johnson stood over an array of weapons laid out on the deck. Anton ticked off the inventory shotguns, a fuel rod gun, jackhammer rocket launchers, plasma, and e-pistols, and every type of grenade, take your pick. Matt picked up five clips of ammunition for his MA-5B assault rifle, three frag grenades, and a shotgun for close work. Nothing fancy, he wanted to keep it simple so he could keep one eye on the rest of his team. Locklear hefted the fuel rod gun, grunting from the exertion. The weapon glowed an eerie green along its fuel casing. Grace relieved him of the too heavy weapon and shouldered it with ease. Make sure you get a handgun, Matt told Locklear. We'll be in close quarters underground. Roger that, Locklear said. We're close, the Admiral called out. Matt moved up to the cockpit to watch. The line of dropships and drones maneuvered toward a pile of truck-sized stones that had been carved from the mountain. A spiraling hole, ten kilometers across, sat where Menekite Mountain had once risen majestic and impregnable, covered with forests and glaciers. It was only a strip mine now, with a single shaft drilled down its center. A Covenant cruiser hovered over the shaft, and the purple glow of a grav lift knifed into the hole. That's our LZ, Whitcomb announced. Pulaski, I want you to drive this crate straight down, but ease up a tad on the engines and let their grav beam do the work. It'll take us all the way down to whatever's at the bottom. With respect, Admiral, Pulaski said, I'm not sure we'll fit. The Admiral squinted at the hole. We'll fit, he said. I have every confidence in you, warrant officer. Now make it quick. I don't think anyone topside is going to think us going down there is a good idea. Yes, sir her eyes locked onto the hole. No problem, sir. Matt marveled at the Admiral's lack of fear. He trusted the man's judgment, he had been criticized during his campaigns for unorthodox tactics and strategies, but his insight had been proven correct each time. Matt, however, also had observed that the higher up the chain of command you received your orders, the more likely those orders would demand the near impossible. Hang on, Matt called back to his team. Pulaski knows the Covenant dropship over and plummeted into the dark purple scintillating grab beam. The instant they entered the field, the ship jumped, accelerated, and shuddered into the hole drilled through solid rock. Cut off from the thin shreds of sunlight above, the ship went dark. The internal running lights glowed a faint blue. We've got no room to maneuver in here, Pulaski whispered. Lieutenant Haverson climbed forward. Admiral Whitcomb, sir, I see how we can get in, assuming this hole leads somewhere, but it's the other part of your plan that's unclear. What's our exit strategy, sir? The Admiral's steely glare pinned Haverson. I've got it figured out. You just shoot when I tell you to and keep it all puckered up tight. Got it. Haverson clenched his jaw, looking extremely unsatisfied. Yes, sir. Pulaski focused intently on the walls of the tunnel rushing toward her craft. Short-range sensors have a contact, she said. It looks like the bottom of the shaft. ETA 60 seconds at this speed. The Admiral leaned closer to Matt and whispered, We're gonna get hit heavy by whatever's down there. You make sure you hit them back three times harder. Then you get Anton on point and see if he can't locate your Spartans. I'm guessing they've gone to ground. Before the mat could reply, the Admiral moved aft and grabbed an assault rifle and two he pistols. He clipped plasma and frag grenades to his belt. Thirty seconds, Pulaski called out. She cut the engines, and the dropship coasted on the grab beam only. There's something down there, she said. Is that sunlight? The dropship emerged into a titanic room, three kilometers across, circular, with a dozen galleries circumscribing the space. Overhead, a holographic sun and a dozen moons wheeled along its domed ceiling. Except for the hole drilled into the mountain by the Covenant, the holographic projection was perfect. The Admiral scrutinized the room, and his dark eyes locked onto a gathering of Covenant forces on the floor, near one edge of the great room. There, he said and pointed. I make out about a hundred of them a few elites, jackals, mostly grunts. Looks like they're clearing a cavian and not ready for company yet. 
Good. Pulaski, land us half a kilometer from M and then dust off. I want you back in that hole ASAP. Plug it up. We don't want to leave our back door wide open. I, sir, Pulaski replied. Admiral Whitcomb addressed Lee. You're our rear guard, son. Stay here and guard the ship with Pulaski. Sorry. Sir, yes, sir, Lee replied. Matt detected a hint of bitterness in the Spartan's voice for drawing what he undoubtedly would think was soft duty. Their dropship eased lower until it was a meter above the blue tiles of the room. The side hatches opened. Matt jumped out first, followed by Anton, Lieutenant Haverson, and Locklear. From the hatch on the opposite side leapt the Admiral, Sergeant Johnson, John, and Grace. The dropship immediately rose into the hole in the ceiling, far enough in to be shielded from any stray ground fire. Move, everyone, the Admiral growled. He pointed at Grace and Locklear. You too, fire long-range weapons. Everyone else, haul ass. Take them out, people. The Admiral's plan was sound. He wasn't risking the dropship, their only means of escape, by landing too close to the enemy. They still had the element of surprise, the Covenant would have never anticipated an assault on the heart of their operation. But how long would this advantage last? How long before the cruiser blasted their dropship to atoms? The Covenant was not their most dangerous enemy. Time was. Grace paused, muscled the fuel rod gun to a 45 degree angle into the air, and launched a round. The alien weapon hissed and spat a glowing sphere of energy. The blast arced over the half kilometer distance, impacted and exploded in a green flash. Grunts and jackals flew through the air. Locklear fired two jackhammer rockets, then dropped the spent launcher. The pair of rockets connected with a cluster of elites who had, until a second ago, been running the show. The twin explosion obscured that end of the room with billowing clouds of dust, fire, and smoke. Matt motioned for his team to spread out and move forward at a jog. Ahead there were silhouetted grunts and jackals in the dust clouds, screaming and shooting at the air, each other, anything that moved. Keep moving, Matt said. Move while they don't know what's hit them. Anton paused and knelt next to a set of tracks dug into the tiled floor. Kelly's been this way, he reported over the comm. Matt clicked on Red Team's comm frequency. Kelly, Fred, Joshua, Spartans, acknowledged this signal. Only Static answered him. A hundred meters from the stunned Covenant work crew, a stray plasma bolt fired from the hazy, rubble-strewn region detonated a few meters from Matt. He sent a spray of automatic fire across the area, hoping to force the enemy to keep their heads down. Grace halted and fired the fuel rod gun again. A second glowing burst of radioactive energy flashed overhead and detonated along the far wall. In the intense light, Matt saw that a dozen jackals had braced themselves along the wall and overlapped their energy shields to create a phalanx. Behind them, five elites readied plasma rifles. Down, he shouted and dived to one side. Grace hit the floor and rolled away. Plasma bolts sizzled over their heads, and Matt's shields drained as a shot hit too close. The barrage turned several of the blue tiles around him into a crater of blackened glass. Grenades, up and over those shields, Spartans, Admiral Whitcomb bellowed. John and Anton primed plasma grenades and hurled them from their prone positions. They hit the far wall and dropped into the cluster of elites and jackals, behind their shields. There was a pair of blue flashes, and the enemy formation blew apart. Jackals scattered and ran. Grace fired the fuel rod gun, hit the broken phalanx formation, and blew them literally to bits. She dropped the weapon. Rad counter at max dosage, she called out. This thing's too hot to use anymore. Back away, Matt ordered. Those things have a failsafe. Grace sprang back, just in time. The fallen fuel rod gun sparked, sputtered, and then blew with the force of a frag grenade. Blackened, twisted tile rained down on them. Locklear jogged up and fired at the Grants fleeing the excavation. They weren't armed. Locklear mowed them down without remorse. From a pile of shattered stone, a pair of battered elites struggled to rise. Blood and bone exploded outward from their chests, and they spun around toward the source of this force, boulders pushed away from the blocked passage. Three Spartans emerged from their cover, assault rifles smoking from their recent discharge. Matt knew instantly the three were Kelly, Fred, and Will. He ran forward to meet them. Fred lowered his weapon. Anton. Grace. John. Matt. He said disbelievingly. Matt opened a calm channel to his Spartans. It's us. I wish I had time to explain everything. I will, later. Let's get the hell out of here first. Kelly quickly reached out and swiped her two fingers across John's faceplate. 
He wanted to return the smile, but at that moment Admiral Whitcomb, running full force, skidded to a stop next to the Spartans. He was followed in short order by Haverson, Locklear, and Johnson, who kept looking over his shoulder to scan the huge empty room around them. Is this everyone? Admiral Whitcomb asked. No, sir, Fred replied. There's one more. He turned and extended his hand back into the partially collapsed tunnel. Ma'am, it's safe to come out. For a heartbeat Matt forgot that he was in the heart of an enemy's camp, he forgot about the war, that Reach had fallen, and everything else he had gone through in the last few days. He had never thought he would see her again. Dr. Halsey emerged from the partially cavitin tunnel. She brushed dust from the hem of her skirt and lab coat with one slender hand. Admiral Whitcomb, she said, a pleasure to see you again. My thanks for the rescue. It was far timelier than you could imagine. She turned to Matt. Or is it you I have to thank for this daring operation, Matt? Matt found he had no words to answer. He also bristled at her casual use of his given name, but he could forgive her that. She had always used his name, never his rank or serial number. He noticed the fist-sized crystal clutched in her hand. It had a thousand facets and emitted a brilliant blue light the color of sapphires and sunlight on water. Thank anyone you want, Catherine, Admiral Whitcomb said. Throw us all a party if that'll make you happy, once we're out of here. He clicked open his comm. Pulaski, get down. Sergeant Johnson set his hand on the Admiral's arm and nodded toward the far wall. What is it, Sergeant? The Admiral's voice died in his throat. Matt's motion tracker flickered on his heads-up display, but there was no solid contact, nor did he see anything across the entire three-kilometer-wide cavern. Had it picked up a camouflaged elite? No, the dust in the air would have certainly given it away. No one move, the Admiral whispered. Matt saw them, then. He saw them all. He had missed them before because he had thought it was the haze in the air rippling, the dust, maybe the distance causing a mirage-like image. He hadn't thought it possible for so many Covenant to be so still. On each level of the twelve-tiered galleries that circumscribed the gigantic room stood Covenant soldiers. They crowded the balconies with grunts, jackals whose energy shields popped on, snarling elites, and several pairs of hunters with fuel rod cannons glowing green. The whine of thousands of plasma weapons charging filled the air like a swarm of locusts. No one moved. No one breathed except Locklear, who exhaled a long and heartfelt expletive. Matt tried to count them all. There had to be thousands, on every level. A battalion at least, maybe more. They wouldn't even have to aim. All they had to do was shoot and fill the space with needle shards and boiling energy. They'd be vaporized before they could get halfway to the tunnel at their backs. A hunter pair roared with rage. They leveled their fuel rod cannons at John and his team and, with steady aim, discharged their weapons. A split second later the rest of the alien horde opened fire. Author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen. Have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 66 Escape from Reach. Author's note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again, I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 66 Escape from Reach. Location Epsilon Eridani System, Tunnel Complex Below Surface of Reach, Date Time Record Anomaly, Estimated Date September 23, 2552, Estimated Time 0640 Hours, Matt tensed as he watched the thousands of Covenant crowding on the gallery surround him and his team. He didn't dare move, his team was on the wrong end of too much firepower. They couldn't win this fight. On the third gallery off the floor of the Great Room, at the four o'clock position, a hunter pair roared with anger. They raised their fuel rod cannons and then leveled their weapons, and fired. Kelly moved before anyone, she was a blur of motion and stepped in front of Dr. Halsey. Matt and Fred moved to either side of Kelly, while Anton grabbed the Admiral and threw the older men behind them. The blinding white-hot plasma charges struck the Spartans' shields and splashed over their chests. Matt's shield drained completely. The overpressure forced him to take a step backward, and the skin on his forearms blistered. Then the heat was gone, and he blinked away the black dots that swarmed in his vision. Kelly lay at his feet. Her armor smoldered and hydrostatic gel boiled from the emergency release vent along her left side. A thousand more shots rang out from the gallery, and John instinctively crouched to cover his fallen comrade. He braced for the inevitable burning energy impact. Plasma bolts and crystalline needles crisscrossed the gallery's overhead, a spiderweb of energy and projectiles. 
Every shot was directed at the pair of hunters who had fired upon Matt and his team. The hunter pair raised their shields in unison and ducked behind them. The quarter-meter thick slabs of metal could repel almost any single weapon's fire. But not this merciless barrage. These mightiest covenant soldiers burned, their armor and shields ignited as well, and John caught their outlines for only a split second before they were vaporized. The section of the gallery where they had stood blasted into dust and smoke and the debris rained onto the floor. Along with dozens of grunts and jackals who had been unfortunate enough to be standing too near the pair. Three heartbeats pounded in Matt's chest. Neither the humans nor the Covenant hosts in the great room moved. What the hell is this? Sergeant Johnson muttered. Shouldn't we be dead by now? Matt linked to Kelly's biomonitors. She was in shock, and her suit's heat pumps were strained to the failure point. He had to get her to safety. From the uppermost gallery, a Covenant elite in golden armor raised its energy sword high into the air and shouted. Translation software in Matt's helmet whispered half a second later take them, but the next one to fire at the holy light will be skinned alive go. Holy light? Crystal questioned. What the hell is he talking about? Dr. Halsey pressed the arm of her glasses tighter against the back of her ear, listening as the built-in translator whispered. The crystal, she murmured. They're after the crystal. Teams of elites dropped slithering, plasticine ropes, which glowed a ghostly blue. They repelled to the floor. A hundred grunts squealed with excitement and danced from one foot to the other. Jackals followed their elite leaders on the ropes. Pulaski Admiral Wickham shouted into his comm. Get down here ASAP we need immediate extraction. Roger that, Pulaski replied in her cool never flinch navy flyer voice. John, Fred, Grace, and Anton turned and fired three round bursts straight up as a team of elites tried to descend on their position. The elites fell, spattering purple blood across the tiled floor. Dr. Halsey stuffed the alien crystal into her lab coat pocket and knelt next to Kelly. She checked her vitals on the data pad and shook her head. She looked at Matt, her expression grim. She's alive, barely. She needs help. Let's not be rude, Admiral Whitcomb barked. Welcome our guests, Commander. Perimeter fire, Matt ordered. Keep it tight. Dispersion pattern delta. Go. The Spartans simultaneously stepped into a semicircle, assault rifles pointed outward. In unison, they thumbed their weapon safeties and opened fire. Right behind them Locklear, Johnson, Haverson, and the Admiral took up position inside the circle. They primed and threw grenades. Matt paused and turned his attention to Kelly. He hauled her limp body off the floor and draped her over his shoulder. The Covenant forces hit the ground and edged closer, but they didn't return fire. Dozens of elites dropped as armor-piercing rounds peppered their armor and frag grenades detonated with thunderous force. The jackals who followed their masters on the ropes landed in the middle of the carnage, maneuvered in front of the elites, and overlapped energy shields. It was typical elite bravado, they had to be the first into the battle, even if that meant they'd die for that honor. Matt had no problem satisfying their honor. He slapped a fresh clip into his rifle and continued firing. Jackals and elites cautiously advanced on the firing Spartans. The second line of jackals angled their personal energy shields over their heads to prevent any grenades from being tossed into their midst. Pulaski's dropship descended from the hole in the ceiling, spun about, and eased to a stop a meter above the cracked blue-tiled floor. Both side hatches of the craft hissed open. Matt handed Kelly to Fred as he leaped on board. He helped Dr. Halsey and the Admiral inside next. Locklear and the other Spartans jumped into the second hatch. Sergeant Johnson and Matt were last aboard. Just as their feet touched the ramp and they grabbed onto the rungs, Pulaski accelerated off the deck. Matt watched the Covenant as the dropship climbed. There were thousands of them, on the floor, clinging to the walls, overflowing the galleries. They looked like a swarm of angry ants. The hatch sealed and Matt moved forward, toward the cockpit. As he passed through the compartment, he saw Kelly. She was slumped over, thin trails of smoke curled from the holes in her armor. He helped Dr. Halsey strap, Kelly, down. Halsey's eyes locked onto the wounded Spartan's erratic vitals as they squiggled across her data pad. She set the elongated crystal next to Kelly, but it didn't lie flat. It defied gravity, floating, one sharp, slender end pointed at the surface. How very odd, Halsey whispered. Matt had to agree, it was unusual. Almost as odd as being under the guns of a thousand angry Covenant soldiers, yet none of them had fired a shot. Take care of her, he told Dr. Halsey. Then he stood and made his way to the cockpit. Pulaski hunched over the controls. She pushed the Covenant dropship into a hyperbolic ascent and entered the hole in the ceiling of the great room. Matt grabbed hold of the walls and braced himself. 
The dropship, however, slowed and pitched forward so it was once again horizontal. Problem, Pulaski announced and rapidly tapped the controls. Big problem. The purple light of the grav beam in the hole darkened. It seemed to fade from view, but it also began to hurt to look at. They're pushing us back, Admiral Whitcomb said. Lee, crawl topside and launch a couple of jackhammers up this pipe. Yes, sir, Lee replied, eager to return to the fight. He nodded at Matt, grabbed a jackhammer rocket launcher, and moved to the hatch. The admiral frowned and shook his head. No way a rocket will make it up a kilometer of this tunnel. Gotta try anyway. The dropship stopped rising, bobbed in place a moment, and slowly sank back down through the tunnel. Lee opened the side hatch. The intense purple light from the grab beam flooded the interior of the ship. Dr. Halsey inhaled sharply, and Matt turned to see what had startled her. For a moment he thought the crystal she had brought with her had shattered. But it hadn't broken, not exactly. The top half of the slender shard had split along its facets and opened like a flower blossom. The sapphire petals undulated, and as the ultraviolet light of the grav beam fell upon them, the crystal opened wider. The facets twirled and spun in a complex geometric dance. The crystal seemed to reshape itself, and it pulsed a cool green. The light inside the ship cleared, all traces of the purple tint seemed to recede like a tide. The dropship lurched upward. What the hell, Pulaski, caught unawares, grasped the yoke and pulled back. Their dropship hummed with power and shot up through the tunnel. Gravity, Dr. Halsey whispered and stared into the open facets of the crystal. This thing warped space when we first approached. It apparently has an effect on artificial gravity fields as well. I can't wait to get this into a lab. The dropship emerged from the hole, and sunlight flooded the interior. Once out of the grav beam, the slender stone folded back upon itself, closing petal-like fragments, melding back into a single smooth shard. Dr. Halsey plucked up the stone and slipped it back into her lab coat pocket, she returned her attention to Kelly's biosigns. The air over Menachite Mountain was thick with circling flocks of banshee flyers and seraph fighters. The 300-meter-long light cruiser had company, too. Six more Covenant cruisers faced their tiny dropship, plasma turrets tracking them. A series of icons flashed on Pulaski's console. They've got weapons lock, she said, the calm in her voice cracking slightly around the edges. They won't fire, Admiral Whitcomb declared. There was steel resolution in his words, as if this weren't a guess on his part, but rather an order that the Covenant had better follow. He set his hands on his hips and watched the ships, seeming to stare the cruisers down. They want whatever the doctor and her team discovered, and they want it bad enough to let us shoot at them and not so much as spit in our direction. Sir, Matt said. We're to rendezvous with Cortana and the captured flagship at 017 hours. That gives us only 20 minutes, sir. Admiral Whitcomb consulted his watch and then glanced at the Covenant ships gathering around them and edging closer. Pulaski, get us out of here. Plot a course to your rendezvous point, and make this crate fly as fast as you can. Aye, aye, sir. Pulaski angled the ship into the upper atmosphere of reach. The sky darkened from turquoise to slate gray to midnight blue and then inky black, filled with stars. As their dropship left the cruisers behind, it moved painfully slow compared to the agile Seraph fighters. They formed up around her, four to the port and four on the starboard of their craft. A pair of the teardrop-shaped single ships pulled ahead of her, slowed, and blocked their path. They're boxing us in, Pulaski said and decelerated their ship. Warrant officer, the admiral said and set a hand gently on her shoulder. Ram them. Full speed. Pulaski swallowed. Aye, sir. One of her hands cinched her crash harness tight. The other hand passed over the velocity stripe on the control panel and shoved it to full power. The dropship jumped, straight toward the Seraph fighters in their path. The two fighters tumbled aside with a scant three meters to spare, and the dropship raced past them. Locklear peered out of the port display and whistled. Does anyone else, he whispered, think it's a little crowded up here? Matt looked over Locklear's shoulder. There had been a dozen small warships when they had descended only a few hours ago. Now there were three times that number in orbit around reach. There were light cruisers that looked like luminous manta rays, there were four carriers with their bulbous sections, and the space near them was aglow with swarms of seraph single craft, there were a handful of destroyers, sleek and fast, bristling with plasma turrets. There was also wreckage pieces of Covenant ships tumbled in orbit, row ragged chunks of the alloy plating, tangles of plasma conduits still aglow from the heat they carried and clouds of metal that had been vaporized and had cooled into mists of glittering dust. Cortana's been busy in our absence, Lieutenant Haverson remarked. He nodded approvingly at the carnage. 
Matt detected flickers of light and dark from the launch bays of a Covenant carrier. He activated his visor's magnification and saw a legion of elites in thruster packs and a score of the tentacled engineering drones leaving the bay. Single ships, drones, and elite boarding parties on intercept vectors, Pulaski announced. Inbound, she paused and double-checked her scans. Jesus, they're inbound from all directions. Get us to the rendezvous coordinates, Admiral Whitcomb ordered. And don't spare the horses. Sir, Pulaski replied, her voice icy cold. These are the rendezvous coordinates. Matt searched for their captured ship on any display and saw only the enemy. Suddenly another Covenant ship appeared three kilometers off the starboard side. Cortana's voice came over the comm. Commander, your ride is here. Acknowledged, Matt replied. Go, Pulaski, the Admiral said. Head for that open bay. Aye, sir, she replied. The dropship veered toward the open bay, and Cortana dropped shields for a split second, just long enough for the tiny craft to enter, then re-establish the protective field. As soon as the dropship was inside the protective field, Cortana activated the slip space drive and the Ascendant Justice jumped to slip space and left reach behind. Author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen. Have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 67 Slip Space Bubble. Author's note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again. I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 67 Slip Space Bubble Location aboard captured Covenant flagship Ascendant Justice in Slip Space. Date time record anomaly error. Date unknown. Time unknown. Cortana. Matt asked. What's our status? Matt and the rest of his team scrambled out of the Covenant dropship. Fred carried a semi-conscious Kelly out and laid her on the deck of the launch bay. Same as ever, Cortana replied. We're in trouble. Video feed from the ship's external cameras appeared on Matt's heads-up display. Covenant cruisers surrounded them, their plasma turrets aglow. They reminded Matt of pictures he had seen of fish that lived at the bottom of Earth's oceans, swarms of phosphorescing lights and razor-sharp teeth. He marched toward the edge of the launch bay and stood a centimeter from where the ship's energy shield abutted the opening to space beyond. He looked directly into the vast blue fields and the giant warships far too close for his liking. We jumped to slip space, didn't we? Lieutenant Haverson asked uncertainty. Yes, Dr. Halsey replied. And no. She withdrew the crystal from her lab coat pocket and frowned as she discovered that it was no longer a slender shard. The facets had rearranged like the pieces of a jigsaw puzzle, but in a configuration that differed from the one the artifact displayed in the Covenant grab beam. This time it was a starburst of edges and refracted light. We jumped, she said, examining her reflection in the artifact's mirrored planes. But not to the slip space we know. Matt's radiation counter clicked and a shrill alarm screamed through his helmet. Secure that, Anton, he said and nodded toward the glowing stone. Get it into the reactor compartment of the pelican. Anton relieved the crystal from Dr. Halsey, who only reluctantly released it from her grasp. He sprinted toward the wrecked pelican. There was a radiation surge, doctor, Matt explained. And that thing is the source. Matt noticed that the intensity of the radiation did not drop off as Anton moved it into the pelican. Whatever it is, Dr. Halsey said as she scrutinized the blue field outside their ship, it warps space. When we first approached it in the great room, space curled around the crystal. And again in the grab beam, it dispersed that field potential. And now, Admiral Whitcomb asked. This tiling is affecting our passage through slip space. Apparently so, Dr. Halsey said and stepped next to Matt to get a better look outside. The Admiral joined her and watched as the Covenant ship's turrets heated. Can they even fire those things in slip space? If they can, we're sitting ducks. Matt could make out more ships in the distance. The Covenant vessels flickered, faded, disappeared, and then reappeared in the fog. The nearest enemy Covenant ships fired. Amorphous balls of superheated gas belched from their turrets and accelerated toward them, tinging the blue space purple. Matt saw Locklear as he helped Pulaski out of the Covenant dropship. He kept her hand in his, and they watched together as the plasma sped toward them. The balls of plasma streaked on, then curled and spiraled off their trajectories. Several simply winked out of existence, only to reappear somewhere else. The enemy shots raced up, down, sideways, any direction but toward Ascendant Justice. What the hell is this? Sergeant Johnson said and he stepped next to Matt to watch the display. I didn't think their ships could fire in slip space. 
Ours sure as hell can't. Dr. Halsey removed her glasses, and her eyes widened. Normally, they can't. If they can fire, then logically, we're not in slip space. And wherever we are, she murmured, the rules have changed. The admiral frowned. Cortana, he shouted. Whatever you do, do not return. Too late. Cortana returned fire. Columns of fire streaked from ascendant justice, streamers that twisted and helix then vanished and reappeared. The bubble of tangled blue space containing ascendant justice and the covenant warships now contained at least 40 bolts of superheated plasma circling in random directions and accelerated to incalculable velocities. Three spheres of roiling fire appeared in front of the nearest covenant cruiser and splashed across its bow. The first boiled away its shimmering silver shield, the second and third melted the armor and alloy skin beneath. Atmosphere vented and spun the massive ship like a child's pinwheel. Hot damn, Sergeant Johnson crowed. All we have to do is wait for those trigger-happy bastards to take themselves out. Look, they're firing again. The Covenant weapons heated and squeezed out a second salvo of plasma. The guided bolts of fire veered off course, swarmed, disappeared, reappeared, and spun out of control through the localized slipspace bubble. No, Sergeant, Dr. Halsey said, her voice turning cold. We're all in the same mess. Cortana, Matt said, drop the launch bay blast door. Now, the three meter thick door overhead shuddered and slid down. A streamer of plasma on a parallel trajectory flashed through the dark not half a kilometer from Matt's face, so close that the external temperature rose 20 degrees even though. The ship's shields. Red fire illuminated Ascendant Justice's starboard shield as plasma splashed across them. The film separating the launch bay from the external vacuum rippled like a thousand broken mirrors. Static crackled across Matt's armor, and his shields resonated in sympathy. As the blast door lowered, Matt saw another fireball spill across their port side. Energy sprayed across the bow in a blood-red borealis. Ascendant Justice's shields flickered and faded, but they held. Barely. The launch bay door touched the deck and sealed with a subsonic thud. Blast door locked and secured, Cortana announced. Let's get this boat underway, Admiral Whitcomb barked. While we still have a boat. He looked around and frowned. Commander, lead the way to the bridge. Yes, sir. He marched to the passage that led deeper into the alien ship. His Spartans and the rest of the crew followed. Admiral Whitcomb turned to Dr. Halsey. Catherine, explain in layman's terms just what the hell is going on here. If we can see those cruisers and they can see us, why aren't our shots connecting? Ascendant Justice rolled to port and explosions chained overhead. The artificial gravity fluttered, and the deck tilted. The crew stumbled, and Dr. Halsey fell to the deck. Turrets 1 and 7 destroyed, Cortana announced. Whitcomb helped Dr. Halsey up off her knees. She glanced nervously up and down the passage. I'd guess the alien artifact we've brought with us into slipspace has expanded the region. Physicists believe slipstream space is a highly compressed version of normal space, layered over and under itself, like a ball of yarn. Now, imagine that our ball of yarn, she interlaced her ringers, is looped and knotted. These threads are not solid, however, plasma, light, and matter jump from one thread to another given the slightest quantum fluctuation. If that's the case, Dr. Lieutenant Haverson said, then what about our ship? Why aren't we tangled and spread along a trillion alternate spatial pathways? Because of the mass of this ship, she pushed her glasses higher onto her nose. Imagine a rumpled sheet that represents this space. If you set a heavy mass upon that sheet, it draws it taut, smooths it out. Matt came to the heavy bulkhead door and held up his hand, telling the rest of them to halt. He opened the door and stepped onto the bridge, sweeping the space with his rifle. Clear, he told them. Admiral Whitcomb and the others entered the bridge. Lieutenant Haverson stepped onto the raised platform and said, Cortana, project tactical on the displays. Enemy ship positions and plasma tracks appeared on the interior walls. Contacts multiplied and coalesced, making the plasma appear like waves sloshing about in a bowl. Another bolt broke across the prow of Ascendant Justice. Through the deck, Matt felt the successive thumps of explosive decompressions. Hit on sub-engineering decks, Cortana said. Sealing those regions. Fire in the lower levels. Attempting to isolate and pump out the atmosphere. Matt's childhood AI teacher, Deja had taught the Spartans about the great naval battles on Earth's oceans before humans traveled to the stars. They had studied victories in the Punic Wars and at Midway, as well as the disastrous defeat of Xerxes by the Athenian navy. Deja had told them, however, that one thing was greater than any human enemy on the sea nature. 
Tidal waves and typhoons could crush the mightiest of battleships and ignored the tactics of the most brilliant captain. Ascendant justice was in the center of a sea of fire, and it was being battered apart. Thunder ripped through Ascendant Justice's hull, a geyser of flames shot out the passageway to the bridge. The air jumped and hissed as it escaped the pressurized chamber. The bulkhead door slammed shut, and the air stilled. Sergeant Johnson shook his head clear from the sudden drop in pressure. Let's drop out of this mix-it-up slip space and start fighting. Yeah, or just get rid of that crystal, Locklear said. If it's the cause of all this mess. He drew his pistol. One round and boom problem solved. Don't do that Dr. Halsey snapped. A drop back to normal space has us facing a dozen or more cruisers. And if you destroy the crystal, the expanded slip space bubble we're in would instantly collapse. Every separate mass in the bubble will compact into a single mass. We wouldn't survive the transition. Worry creased Admiral Whitcomb's features. That leaves just one option. Cortana, give me flank speed and heat up every weapon we have. We're going to run right over these Covenant ships. Tangled space or not, we're going to blast them right back to normal space from point-blank range. Yes, Admiral, Cortana said. Engines answering flank speed. A dull thump echoed from the aft section. Stand by, Cortana said. There's a problem with the primary engines. A power drop occurred just as I engaged. On the bridge displays, the external cameras turned and focused on the aft hull of Ascendant Justice. A snake-like plasma conduit came into focus. Cortana adjusted the image and a THRE emitter wide hole in the conduit snapped into view. Streamers of blue-white gas vented from the breach. That's our main drive conduit, Cortana said. It's taken a hit. I'm shutting down engines to conserve power. Matt squinted. That was no plasma hit, he muttered. It was too precise and too inconvenient, this had to be sabotage. Admiral Whitcomb scowled. Commander, take your team and prepare for a zero-g repair of the plasma conduit. Yes, sir. Pulaski stepped forward. I'll go too, sir, she said. Locklear grasped her by the arm and tried to pull her back, but she shrugged his hand off. I can pilot the dropship, get the Spartan team in and out faster. The admiral narrowed his eyes, assessing the young woman. Very well, warrant officer. He added so softly that the chief almost missed it too many damned heroes in this war. Pulaski turned to Locklear, handed him back his bandana, and whispered, Hang on to that for me, corporal. I'll pick it up when I get back. Locklear's hand clenched, then relaxed. He took the token, nodded, and looked away. I'll be here, he said and tied it around his arm. Commander, Admiral Whitcomb said. Make sure you come back alive. That's an order, son. Author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen. Have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 68 Slipspace Battle Author's note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment.